Well, good morning to a beautiful sunny day here in Monterey, California for the 2021 Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion. I'm Kev Harris and I'm pleased to say that joining me are a couple of gentlemen for the next four days. And between the three of us, we are going to bring you what is perhaps one of the most glorious events in motorsport racing that you're ever likely to see. There are some near 400 race cars here that if you've watched motor racing in over the last nearly 100 years, there's probably the car here that you're going to absolutely love. In terms of millions of dollars worth of cars, well, I wouldn't like to put a figure on it. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the gentlemen that are going to be joining me and adding the information and adding the colour. And I'll tell you what, if you've followed motorsport in the last few years, you'll know these two guys. So uh, good morning to Johnny Green and Adam Andretti, both motorsport legends in their own right. Even Johnny Green, don't believe what it says online about this guy. If you know motor racing, then you will certainly have heard of him. Johnny, good morning to you. A pleasure to be stood alongside you. And you've been let out into the sunshine as well to kick things off. Let me out of the booth. I'm, I'm excited and I'm loving coming to Laguna. Um, my boyhood dream was to be here. I grew up watching the bikes back in London uh, here at World Superbikes and, of course, MotoGP. Uh, but now in the last 10 years since I've been here in the States, I've been obviously watching the cars and the bikes here. And I love Laguna. It's the, the perfect spot to be for a historic. Yeah, it really is. It's a fantastic venue, an exclusive and top-end venue as well. And Adam Andretti, you know, you need no introduction to a lot of our viewers here. But interestingly, I mean, chatting to you earlier, you've coached here many, many times, but only raced here a couple of times. That's exactly right, you know. And, and honestly, you get so much out of coaching a place like Laguna Seca Raceway in Monterey. And it's uh, the biggest thing you get is there's so much intangible here, uh, all the way down to first gear, really tight hairpin that has our namesake, the Andretti hairpin, to the famous corkscrew, Wayne Rainey corner coming down the hill. There's just so much here to learn as a driver. So as a coach, you just have a blast here teaching, and, and I want more opportunity to race here. But living in the Midwest like I do, the opportunities come few and far between here for Laguna Seca. But I'll be back here. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be back here. And actually, you're fresh off the back of an exciting weekend last weekend in Nashville. Tell us about that one. Yeah, it was uh, the inaugural Music City Grand Prix in Nashville, and it was fantastic for us all the way up to a certain point. Uh, we had just taken the lead, set the fastest lap of the race, and uh, unfortunately suffered a mechanical, a freak mechanical deal where we tossed the serpentine belt, which will cause you to blow the engine, right? The oil pump doesn't work, water pump doesn't work anymore because of that. So uh, that was just a freak deal. Those things just don't happen. Um, you could chalk it up to maybe Andretti luck, but <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, we're we showed them who's boss out there, and we're, we're ready to get to the next round in, in Watkins Glen. Yeah, fantastic. And the fans will be looking forward to that one perhaps as much as you will be. Johnny, you'd have been commentating on that race, wouldn't you, last weekend? Tell us how he did. Uh, it was awesome. It was really awesome. It was a brand new track, no data, no no information. So they hit the ground running. We were the support class to Indy, so not a lot of time on track to get used to it. And Adam hit the front. There was a group of four, and we thought, you know, it's a street circuit. Is there going to be a lot of crashes? No, it was straight through. And for the first 14 laps, it was adrenaline junkies time. It was great. Fantastic stuff. But back to this weekend, then here at the WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca. We are stood in the paddock, surrounded by some of the most beautiful race cars that you're ever likely to see. And there is so much going on. Just across the way from us here, we've got Ford in Trans Am. They're celebrating 55 years of the Mustang. You know, it's just been reinvented with the Mustang Mach-E. But, you know, as far as Trans Am racing is concerned, I mean, Adam, the Mustang needs no introduction. I strap myself into one for every uh, Trans Am weekend very proudly. Uh, the Mustang Cobra that we run is... It's phenomenal, and it's great to see the Mach-E, the next generation of the Mustang. It's a beautiful vehicle. Uh, it's really exciting to see where all this is heading. All right, it is really exciting to see where this is heading. And right now, these gentlemen are going to have to head up to commentary because my ears are starting to go. First one out, then. Here we go. It's 1955 to 1961. Sports car races. The guys are going to run up to the uh, commentary booth. Go join them there. Thank you ever so much for watching wherever you are. Let's get the first one underway. Relapsing polychondritis, known as RP, is an autoimmune disease where the body's immune system attacks its own cartilage and connective tissue. If you think about where in your body you have connective tissue, it's everywhere. It's a fatal disease. People are dying. We need to do more research and we need to do it faster. One in five Americans have an autoimmune disease. That's about 50 million people. Joining our campaign can help them. One in five, just keep that number in mind.
Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are tuning into our live stream. Welcome to the Monterey Union reunion for 2021. I'm Jonathan Green. Sorry, slightly out of breath. <laughs> Ran here with Adam Andretti because we were just downstairs, but we're here up in the booth now as we look high above the Andretti corner. So that's the perfect place for me to introduce Adam Andretti to the booth. Delighted to have you on board for something quite different. Currently uh, driving uh, Trans Am TA2. Uh, but uh, a, a school fellow at this track, and uh, the name says it all. You're part of the Andretti ro royalty of uh, American racing. I'm so delighted to have you and get some insight into what you know about these amazing cars that we're about to see. And it starts off with this Group 1A, 1953 to 66. Really exciting. Well, I should say 1955 to 61. Sports cars under and over 2000 cc. The fog just lifting as it always does here at Laguna, and I think it's going to be a nice day. Yeah, we're looking at a beautiful day, Jonathan, and thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. This is such a privilege to be a part of this Rolex reunion uh, here at Laguna Seca, WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca. The perfect backdrop has been mentioned, and, and this is an annual event, so this is to start it off with the 55 to 61 sports racing under and over 2000 cc i mean this is uh exciting stuff these are cars that literally i only heard stories about uh obviously i wasn't around to watch these things live i've watched as many old races as you possibly can being an enthusiast of the sport and all aspects of it but these are these are definitely important cars that not only did i hear stories of of my uncle my dad you know and their introduction to the sport and getting to watch these cars and what gave them their excitement but also um just you know some of my own you know interests and, and and where they lie so this is exciting well that leads me to my first question that i have to ask and i'm sure i'm not in, not in the uh i'm not in the minority when i ask this if you're an andretti do you have to race i mean do everyone i know races <laughs> yeah are there any that don't yeah of course there are yeah no we're, <laughs> we uh it, it's but Jared, uh, john yourself Marco, Michael, I mean, come on. It, well, it is the family business, it's, I guess so. and, and it's been very good to us. You know, we're very blessed by by what the sport has provided for us. And, you know, the biggest thing is the people that we've met through the sport are just absolutely phenomenal. And, and, and this is, you know, uh, the Rolex reunion, it, that's the title, right? This is, a, this is a motorsports reunion. We all get to come together here. Uh, I see so many of my friends that it's, it's almost like an annual Christmas party for us, but this is in August. And uh, we get to see all our friends, all our racing community here under one roof, and, and the camaraderie comes alive. And, and this is friendly competition. This is historic racing. Uh, no one's going to rub a fender on each other. This is all about just getting these pieces of artwork. And, and, and literally, these, these machines, they're, they're living things, right? They, they breathe oxygen, and they burn fuel. So uh, I love the fact that, that our owners in these groups, they, they appreciate that, and they have these cars out there to show the world. Well, I certainly don't know many sports, and I certainly don't know many historical uh, museums that actually take the museum and put it out where it's supposed to be, which is on the track, because you are talking about literally pieces of art that are priceless. Some of these cars you're going to see this weekend, um, that, well, there is no price tag, quite frankly, and to the owners or to those who have followed it since the early 50s or the early 60s, uh, like I said, no price can be put on them. And you'll see racing, but you won't see rubbing. No, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not. Yeah, I was talking to Torsi Schroeder this morning, and he was he was uh, telling me, you know, they, they had a little they they had a, a deal the week before, um, a little like preamp to the to the reunion, and uh, they only had one incident where cars just bounced into each other on the start, getting down to Andretti hairpin, but no damage was sustained. So. That's another thing you see is a lot more give and take uh, in these historic races because of, of what they're driving. But at the same time, every one of these drivers, they're driving down to the latest braking zone they can go to. They are exercising these cars. Folks at home, these are not parade laps. These are these are hard-nosed laps uh, just like they would be out there competing. They're just not going to go take those chances that you would if there was that big money on the line. And it's always interesting, people don't know the names necessarily of some of the drivers out there, but um, in the historic terms, they're very well known. And in fact, historic drivers are now starting to become some of the most popular drivers uh, worldwide because it doesn't, you know, it's not the same as driving, uh, you know, driving a modern 
car with paddles and all the all, all the gizmos that go with it, ABS, etc. These cars are trouble. Absolutely. If you don't know what you're doing. One hundred percent, Jonathan. Really, really well said, Mike. My brother John, when I was growing up, he said, never turn down something to drive. Because even if it's not a great car, you're going to learn a lot from driving that great car. So when you get into a great car, you'll have that ability. You know, we're seeing more and more young drivers coming into yep. the vintage to get their to get their feet wet. And also, when you don't have any driving aids, right? No analog brakes, no paddle shifting, and nothing... This right here really makes you have to plug all those things together that when you get into a modern race car, it makes things life a lot easier for you, right? Now, all of a sudden, things have kind of stepped back a little bit, and and you got all this grip. you got just pressing buttons to paddle shift, and you can just slam on the brakes whenever you want because you get ABS. So this is a great learning tool as well. So we're seeing a lot more young talent. It looks like the 57 here. Uh, That's a Cooper of uh, William Taylor. Parked up for some reason on the main straight, right in front of our pit uh, box. In front, uh, in fact, off the main pit, so at least his team can see him. He's pulled over to the side, so he's managed to control, stop it. There he is. Uh, we're just to the right of that Rolex sign there, and uh, yeah, not not what he wanted for his practice, but uh, at least he's in a safe place and out of the way. So uh, beautiful, all aluminum. Yeah. Uh, Cooper there. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, well, let's talk about the, the cars we're looking at now because what this is a perfect place to start, I think, early 50s uh, up to the 60s because this is really where road racing and racing began here in California to any real professional level. And it began actually down the street uh, at Pebble Beach. This wasn't built until 1957. So... Um, uh, Laguna Seca, that is. So what we have really is the influence and the invasion, if you will, of European cars. So you've got your Porsches, your Maseratis. Uh, we mentioned the Cooper, the Lotus specials. Um, you know, that's really how it all began. And this was, uh, and it also was true of the drivers, too, that came over. They were hired guns, many of them, to come over and drive these these cars but, of course, then the Americans started buying them and importing them and said, well, if they're gonna, we're going to be beaten by these Porsches or whatever. We want some of those. And then California then became a, a real hub for importing European cars and some fantastic dealerships right up until this day. Now, still importing BMWs, Porsches, Ferraris. Absolutely. I mean, a, a key name that comes to mind is is joining us here this weekend is Parnelli Jones. Of course. Is, is 100% one of those key California names. And obviously that I have an affection towards because of of what a great relationship the Jones family has had with the Andretti family over the years. My Uncle Mario drove for them many years through the 70s and, and Silver Crown cars and into Formula One even. So, uh, but yeah, you, you said it, Jonathan. Absolutely. This was really what spawned that interest that, that said, wow, these European cars. We Over here in America, it was about, right, big horsepower and shooting yeah. down the straightaways. And drag racing was really the big hit in, in the U.S. And, and then we bring these, you know, it was almost, from the stories I heard, almost laughed at these European cars coming with these little engines. How are they going to compete against us? And then they would wipe the floor because they were nimble, right? They handled so much better. And it was more about how we got around the corners than down the straightaway. So uh, then the mixture started to come, right? Then you start to see the European cars start to get more and more horsepower inside of them. And you see that through this, uh, through this, even this group from 1955 to 61, you find the cars that are, that are closer, like the, like the 56 Cooper Bobtail. Uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, let, let, let's say, uh, let's let's throw one out there, uh, like the '63 Lotus Roadster. Yeah, you're getting into uh, just the just the difference because racing, like oh, has always back then was pushing the limits every time. So the development was happening rather rapid, even for back then. And yeah, and and also in this era, uh, people were experimenting, especially here in the states. They were taking bits of the best. And then trying their own thing, so you get these sort of variations on the on the theme, or you'll often see in historic racing special. Yes. You know the word special, and it, and it basically means there's been some sort of change to the original, and they've taken it, and they like you say the bobtail or whatever it might be, but they've done something with it. You've got the the Tippo Birdcage out there right now, the Maserati, a beautiful car. Jeffrey O'Neill um, loves historics, based here in California. He'll be in several cars this weekend, but that. Uh, Tippo Birdcage, um, wonderful car, that Maserati. And, and you know, going back again, you know, it's funny, growing up in Britain, 
we were always enamored by the Italian elegance of the Maseratis and the Ferraris, and we couldn't compete with that because they were so beautiful. They were pieces of art. Right. Uh, and the Italian love of art and, 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 and the beauty of the cars. It had to look good. Enzo believed that it had to look good. It, it couldn't just be a car. And the British cars sort of, he, he insultingly called, you know, the Formula One guys of those days in the early 50s garage easters because we didn't know what we were doing. But then we got, and then we got mad. Yes. And we started building smaller cars, but nimble cars like MGs and Coopers and so on and so forth. And the likes of Colin Chapman really got their act together. And what you're looking at now is what that combination then brought into the States and competed with what you had here. And there was a combination of Americans buying into that European style, but then also saying, well, what can we do with our Chevys and our, and that's where Trans Am came from. Exactly right. Exactly right. And, and, and even going back to what you were mentioning before, I, I, I do believe there was a, an E-type Jaguar that, um, yep. that, that, <laughs> that Enzo pretty much copied. Yeah. Uh, because he, 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 they couldn't compete against it. It was absolutely just so dominant. And what, Oh, it looks like we got a mechanical issue here again. Off pace though, but offline as well. Lotus 1189, I think. Yeah, the red John Hrubil at the wheel, slowing it down a little, but uh, hopefully he can get back to the pits. So we've got four days of action here around the famous Laguna Circuit, circuit and uh, we'll be keeping you up to date. So there's plenty of time on track, and that's another good thing about this event. And in terms of prestige, Adam, I would argue that this is without doubt the most prestigious historic event. This is the Goodwood of the United States. Agreed. Uh, one, one hundred percent agree. I mean, you could just see it right here in that shot. That shot is, is just such a classic shot heading up the hill, uh, towards the course screw. Um, this, a little, a little history, uh, fun little fact about this track was originally when it was built, uh, this was supposed to run the other direction. And the little car, the little under two liter cars, of this era Struggled couldn't, up the couldn't make it up the court screw. <laughs> so they're like, and, and imagine what that hill, downhill th towards oh, turn gosh, five yeah. would be like uh, after the court screw. That would have just been absolutely scary in modern days. So uh, as, as things would have it, it, it turned out to put it in the perfect uh, course direction as it should be, and one that we look at now. So, um, but it's, it's such fascinating, you know, just to, you feel the history, right? You feel the place that we're at here and at whether and then seeing the cars that we're seeing coming around it, it's it's a, it's a beautiful thing as this as the cooper bobtail just drove by me right now yeah and we don't put too much emphasis on timing i was talking to the organizers this morning and we were saying you know the truth of the matter is it's about getting out there and enjoying it um but we'll keep you up to date with who's leading and so on and so forth in terms of the times Right now, the number 60 Cooper Monaco, uh, the white blue, uh, car, uh, of Spencer Trenry is leading the way. And you can see on the bottom there, uh, a little run across as to who is where. And we'll introduce you to some of the drivers over the weekend. Some really interesting drivers too. Uh, kings of industry. A lot of historics are guys that have made it in their own industry or racing. Uh, and this is their this is their hobby. This is their weekend hobby, and they go racing at the weekend. This is how they uh, de-stress, if you will. And you, it's amazing who you might see, whether it be uh, a musician, a high-end musician that's on tour, or a drummer from a very famous band like a, a Mason or somebody like yeah. that. Or you might see, I don't know, a, a Corolla or somebody like that. There's all sorts of cats out there uh, that come and do historic racing. Absolutely. I mean, it's a who's who on the list that we have here this weekend for sure. And we got a black flag. It's going to be issued to the 20 car, uh, right there, which is, which is, a uh, looks like, um, that looked like the Lotus 11. No, oh, no, I'm sorry. That was a Porsche 550 Duralite. That was, uh, Francisco Guzman. Uh, so, but absolutely, this is, uh, fog. We're still early morning here. The fog just started. To, what tends to happen here at Laguna is the fog. Either is either down low when you get here, and then it burns off, or it comes in. It depends on the wind. Uh, we're on the Monterey Peninsula, just to give you a little uh, sort of directional uh, piece where Monterey is. We're about what, an hour and a half from San Francisco, and about two two and a half hours from Los Angeles. So this was the perfect kind of midpoint for California racers and California uh, folk, especially for the car industry, to to kind of you know get their wares out on a Sunday and a Saturday uh, back in the 50s when it all began 
And it all began not here at Laguna, but at Pebble Beach, uh, racing through the forests. And they found that a little bit dangerous eventually. Yeah, they decided <laughs> to make Pebble Beach a golf course and, and turn this into, yeah, yeah, yeah. turn this one into into the racetrack. But yeah, absolutely, it's uh, this is uh, you know when you look geographically where we're at, this is some of the most beautiful uh, you know real estate that you'll find in America. I mean, that, there's a reason why it's the highest, some of the highest priced real estate that you're going to find anywhere. Um, the weather here is phenomenal. Uh, you know, everywhere else, uh, you know, you would go if. I, I always joke all the time. Any, I live in Indianapolis, and any time it's, you know, in the mid 70s or low 80s, I said, "Boy, if it was like this year round, I would be able to afford to live here." Well, that's what happens here in this part of the country. Is it's such a beautiful time here all year long, and there's so much to do here. Um, the scenery is fantastic. That it is really a, 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 an elite place to call home. So um, it's a very special place to be at for a lot of reasons. Looking at the Devon SS, that bright red, uh, Nicholas Cologne at the wheel, and I also saw the 141 of uh, David Swig, a, a long time uh, driver in historic, especially here in California. Uh, David Swig does a lot of historic racing, and he's in that Corvette, that blue and white Corvette uh, from 1959. So, once again, this is our Group 1A action from the first it's both under and over 2000 cc's and primarily european cars and uh, a really good display of great cars from the early 50s and on up until 1961 let's say gregory gregory meyer he's driving that uh, 1959 saddler mark IV. it's white and blue number 84 i mean he's currently p3 here on the timer she time sheet he comes down this front straightaway every time and every time he clicks on his bridge He's been the fastest car, yeah. 130 miles an hour, and something that was from the 19 from 1959, and I, it just blows my mind. The acceleration point from there, you know, from the exit of the last corner to here underneath the bridge to get up to that speed, it just shows you uh, what amazing race cars these were even for that era. Yeah, like I said, we're not going to focus on split times and, and lap times particularly, but if you do see that front shot uh, on the front straight where the WeatherTech uh, bridge is. You'll see the miles per hour board, which basically automatically goes off. So you can see what top speeds they're doing, and it's always an interesting factor to see that these guys aren't putting on a demonstration. Often I get asked if, if this is a demonstration, and I'm like, no, no. But these guys are doing 150 miles an hour down the main straight, and that is no mean feat. Uh, with, in some cases, drum bring, uh, jump brakes and so on. And so oh, forth. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean. And these aren't the oldest cars that are going to be out there this weekend. We've got car, cars that are uh, from the 1920s and 30s. Sure. Yeah, so, we yeah. have pre-war era cars, which is it. And when we talk about names that you might know, uh, Gunnar Jeanette is out here yes. right now. He's, yep. a, he's in a 1961 Porsche RS61L, which is silver out there. That's, uh, that's going to be number 14 so for any aj Foyt fans they've just thrown a checker flag on the session so we have got one session in the books jonathan it seems look at that lotus 11 a silver lotus 11 beautiful uh, what a beautiful car that is i i, I just rock it isn't it i just love you know back then aerodynamics it, up until really the wind tunnels became the norm in the late 80s that arrow was just oh there, there's a speed right there on the, on the bridge Arrow was, was a black science. It yeah, was a yeah. black art. And you just see how they even saw ways to take advantage of it there and knew that the air would get messy behind what the driver was disturbing and try to clean that up. So as we take a look at our first group, 1A, and as uh, we've said, as we said at the top, we'll be uh, around the paddock. Kev will be down there and looking at various different cars and talking to lots of folks. What a fun time he's going to have. Let's head down to the paddock now and join Kev. Uh, what have you got down there at the moment, Kev? Welcome back to the Rolex Monterey Motorsport Reunion. We're already down here in the paddock. The noise and the excitement is building. Maybe you were lucky enough to join us from the off. We're one session down and many more to go. It's split into 14 different race categories then this weekend, covering an era of nearly the last 100 years. There's approximately 400 cars here on display at what is arguably the most prestige event you're ever likely to see in terms of heritage racing. I'm still at the moment behind me. The IndyCar heritage display is just sort of getting up and running. There's some beautiful pieces of machinery and everywhere you look, there's excited owners and mechanics who are fettling away. The smell of 
oil and tyres and everything else that you associate with motorsport is all here. The covers are coming off, we're well underway and we find ourselves stood in front of this beautiful 1972 Indy car and I've already caught up with the owner and the mechanic who are lucky enough to be looking after it. So here's, uh, here's Bob and uh, Michael. Michael, here we are, my first chat of the day, the first one of the weekend. How's your excitement levels right now? Oh, I'm extremely excited. This has been on a, a bucket list of things to do for years, and so I'm thrilled to be here. And you've brought your main man along here, Bob. I interrupted you busily. You were working away on the car moments or two ago. How's she uh, looking for the weekend? Uh, the car itself looks good, but we had a minor problem uh, back in uh, Tri-Cities where we were from. When they mounted the rear tires, they made both right hands. And so we we had to run over to the tire shop. In 45 minutes, we'll have the tire back. But, but uh, yeah, it was a mistake. It was easily caught, and uh, we'll be fine. And I tell you what, I was over there at the tire shop yesterday myself. Those guys are going to be flat out this weekend. They're busy gentlemen. Oh, they're incredibly fast. Yeah. You, you, to watch them work, there is no lo wasted effort, not a second. Those guys are good. And Michael, tell us about the car behind us here. Uh, I'm right in town, I think it's a 1972. You've owned it for 10 years, is it? Yeah, we've had it for 10 years. It took us a few years to even start the restoration. Uh, it's a 1972 Antares Turbo Offy, which is, they only made three of them. And it's the first IndyCar Formula One car designed on a computer. And they must have messed up the, for, the, the programming a little bit because they got it wrong. It didn't work very well. But it was very unique because the first one, um, designed you can see it kind of looks like a boat and so it's kind of like that that uh, the fluid dynamic that they use now they that's what they were trying and it's the first one to use composite material it was designed by um, Bob Gates and Mike Pocabello who were the the guys behind Jim Hall's Chaparral sucker car the famous Can-Am sucker car and so they were hired by Lindsey Hopkins and Pat Patrick to de design a state-of-the-art IndyCar. car and they didn't quite get it, although a lot of what they were messing with is what's used today. It just wasn't quite right on this one. And fantastic. It's a, it's a fun car. It's, it's really fun to work on. Yeah, I bet it is. And, you know, in terms of the computer they were designing on in 1972, your pocket calculator is probably more advanced these days. But, Bob, I mean, it's a, it's a car from the 70s. It's a car from the 70s, but I bet you've got it running as sweet and better than it ever has done, haven't you? Well, Mike is the owner. Uh, the driver and the chief mechanic. I'm his sidekick, but uh, uh, yeah, we we haven't running good. And, and Michael, just tell us about Laguna Seca. You're going to get out on the track here. Is this a circuit that you've taken it on before? No, this is this will be my first time at Laguna. And you know, they always say that TV doesn't do justice to the elevation changes or anything, and they are exactly right. Yeah. When we did the track tour yesterday, I was shocked at how steep the elevation real changes are. So I'm, I'm really excited. Yeah, and excitingly, I managed to jump in on that driver orientation yesterday. So I was sat in one of those cars, getting the parade lap, understanding what it's all about. And even at 20 miles per hour, in the I think in the Lexus we were sat in, the corkscrew, it turned your stomach over. Oh, it, it really did. Dorsey Schrader was driving the, the uh, our car, and, uh, and he took it really easy. But even there, I can't wait to do it in this thing. Yeah, you were lucky. There was a few people when we did the driver orientation. Dorsey Schrader's there. We had, I think it was Mike uh, Mike Mason, is it? <laughs> Mikhail Mason, driver coach here at Laguna Seca. There were people hopping in those cars. I wasn't lucky enough to get in with Dorsey, but uh, you did. I mean, Bob, what's your understanding of this circuit here? Tell us your history in Laguna Seca. Um, none. I've never been here before, wow. and it looks really exciting. It, it, it would, uh, I was shocked. Uh, we've... We've had, uh, Seattle has some elevation changes yeah. and, and dips, but nothing like this. This is an amazing track. And Michael, what did you think when we were learning on that driver orientation yesterday? Dorsey told us that the grip on this circuit is pretty non-existent, apparently. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. Um, fortunately, with this car, we've got a huge wings um, and big tires. So hopefully that'll help a little bit. But, you know, we're all here for fun and to show you know some unique cars so um we'll we'll be smart out there yeah be smart because obviously you're going to be racing but hugely valuable item you're just here to have fun you're just to, here to soak it all up and i mean bob it's the it's the first morning of four just give us a quick heads up on your uh impressions so far blown away totally yeah. um it, it is just just incredible just incredible <laughs> I, I have seen 
I have seen so many cars that I have absolutely no idea what they are. Yeah. And I've seen dozens and dozens of cars I've only seen in magazines. Yeah, yeah and, and we've been to a lot of car shows. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm absolutely blown away. Supposedly there are something like 500 cars here, yeah. and I don't doubt it. Yeah, and, and I mean, Michael, is this one of a collection? Do you have other cars, or are there, are you got other cars here? Yes, I've got uh, four historic Indy cars, and we brought two of them today. The other car is the yellow number 21 over there, and that's a really unique car. It's a 1967 Volstead. It's the last Indy car that Jim Clark drove before he was killed. It's one of the only non-Lotus open-wheel cars, and it's a, it's a very unique. It ushered in the wings. The rear wing on that was the first time they had used one, and so it's a, it's a real unique piece of history. Yeah, and we're looking for, we'll, we'll grab you and talk to you about that one, I'm sure, as the weekend goes on. If you are just joining us, the noise down here in the paddock is quite something because we are well in amongst it here. This is the great thing as well. Guys like yourself, the owners and the mechanics, anyone who's coming to this with a ticket just for the event, they can walk around and uh, they can come and uh, just chat to you guys at any point, as they will be doing over the weekend. So I think we are about to go to the next one. So uh, let's head on back up to the commentary and join Johnny and Adam Chaps. Thanks ever so much. We'll catch you again a little bit later on as the weekend goes on. Great stuff, Kev. Yeah, newbies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> that is not what I expected. Two guys who've never been to Laguna. Well, you can see their, their little their boyish smiles. I love it. I mean, obviously, we just saw them fill up their bucket. I know, exactly. Uh, 100%, and that's what this weekend is all about. Uh, I can't wait to see who Kev finds next because that was a great way to start off our weekend for him out there in the paddock. Because, uh, you know, talking to, you know, when he's talking to Bob there, the mechanic, that is, that people like Bob are what make this stuff just happen and make this stuff possible because they are taking these cars that um, were a mystery to the mechanics back when these came out, you know, uh, whenever you know in that car in that car in 1972 and they know how to fine tune it and they know everything about the car inside and out and how to make it mechanically sound and, and that's what makes this vintage racing uh in these events possible so we're just so grateful for people like bob and their talents i want to pick up on one thing they did say the grid at uh, laguna uh you you drive this uh <laughs> you, you would know uh, having raced it here uh what um why is it not got the grip that perhaps you'd expect from a, ra a racetrack? Well, for one, it's it gets run on a lot. So, yeah. it, it, you know, and, and it's California. So it's not like in the Midwest where you need to pave things all the time because of the climate change. You know, the, the pavement doesn't get uh, have to go through the harshness of weather conditions throughout the year. So the pavement stays, you know, relatively smooth. So as you run on it, run on it, run on it, you polish it. You know, you yeah, start yeah. you start yeah. polishing that rock and or that asphalt, and it becomes uh, basically too smooth for the tire to grab any hold of. So you find yourself a little bit offline uh, to find, oh, wow, what a great sound of that American muscle rolling out of here. Uh, but, you, you know, you've that, that's part of it. And then the other part is if you look at the surroundings of the racetrack, what is right offline? Dirt. Yes. So all it takes is a little bit of a gust of wind, and see outside of the Andretti hairpin yeah. just blows right on the track. You can't see it physically on the track, yeah, but you know it's there when you drive over it because you just don't have the grip. And the drones, the modern iteration of camera work, fantastically done here by our boys. Thank you. Uh, gives you a real indication we've not really had before. I hadn't realized how tight that Andretti uh, corner is. And when you see it above like that, and you see the pit exit and how tricky that is, um, uh, it really is from above. You really see how tight it is. You can make a mistake coming out of the pits here. Oh, absolutely. If, if you've ever driven this track on a simulator, you've crashed out of the pits going into the hairpin, <laughs> I promise you. Because you think you could go much faster. Your tires are cold. It's a lot of a crank on the wheel because that's even a tighter radius than what the actual hairpin is. So right up here, first out, you got a, the number nine there. That's a Cobra Daytona. What a rare car. I, I mean, know. What a beautiful I love that color. Such a beautiful, beautiful color. Beautiful blue. I, it, it's that classic blue. You know, you want to talk about something that was built for that Daytona speed, you know, the big fast back on that. And uh, for those fans of, of um, you know, Ford versus Ferrari, I think this was a car that they missed highlighting during that movie, honestly, because yeah. this was the car that, that um, really made made Enzo nervous. Yes. Uh, th this was this was the one. So uh, so great to see that. It, not, to see it in person sitting still, folks, is one thing. To watch it move around this racetrack, I mean, it's 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 like it's like watching heaven. 
Yeah, and this is interesting because now as we move on, and this group is GT cars over uh, 2,500 cc, uh, 2.5, it's 1963 to 1956. And now we're moving into an era where the American muscle cars made their name. And as you say, yeah, we've got the Jaguars out there, sure. Um, there's still a few um, uh, European iterations, but now we see the Fords, the Shelbys, the Chevrolets, uh, and the big muscle cars uh, coming into their own, the AC Cobras. Um, we saw that uh, Daytona just a moment ago with Rob Watson at the wheel, but here's a Corvette coming over the line, and some of my favorite cars in this, and I know there are people tuning in. To you Americans, this is a regular <laughs> daily sight, right? Yeah. But I know, I'll give a shout out to my buddy Steve Martin, uh, the motorcycle world champion endurance racer from, and, and a former commentator of mine, sat right next to, to me right here, doing world superbikes for many years. He's got uh, a very similar car to this. He's got a Mustang at home in Australia. I know there's Kiwis tuning in now and folks in, in Great Britain who love to see the American muscle cars. We get starry-eyed about these sorts of cars and you guys kind of look at the Jaguars and go, and the, and, and the Ferraris and go, wow. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we, we grew up looking at these kind of a dime a dozen and, and we had to go searching for the European brands. But, I mean, for I don't think anybody gets turned off by that noise of these, <laughs> of these just growling big American V8s. And just the, the beauty, too. I mean, the, these were works of art. Again, it wasn't about how it cut through the air. They didn't know how things cut through the air. It was about how it looked to your eye, maybe the best concept, where to get the weight, and things of that sort. I'm going to have an affection towards that. I run an 86 Ford Mustang myself in Trans exactly. Am. So this is an going up the hill and... Uh, but that was, that was really neat. Well, let see. me ask you a question that, that counts for what you drive today, which is the most modern Ford Mustang yeah. muscle car, and these muscle cars we're looking at now. When, when we say muscle car, we mean big power. But how far can you go with that power before it becomes unwieldy? How do they work out what was the sort of power to torque stroke ratio that, that works? Because you, it's no point in putting it's not a drag strip out here. No, <laughs> if it, it can't wasn't. go around the corners, it's no good. <laughs> yeah, it was you know, one of my favorite reads and I I hope most of our audience has, has has read this book and if you haven't I highly encourage it. But it's called The Unfair Advantage, written by yep. the great Mark Donahue. And one of the things that they did back in this era that was cutting edge of the way that they developed the car was a friction circle, a skid pad. Yep. Was let's let's put the power down. Let's put the wheel into it with a constant radius, and let's see when this thing wants to break traction. And where does it break traction first? Does it break traction in the rear? Does it break traction in the front? Mm -hmm. Are we going to get understeer or oversteer? And then they started to make changes, right, like sway bar changes, spring rate changes, and things of this sort to try and develop the car. But you know, there's two things that a driver will never have enough of. Yeah. They will never have enough horsepower, and then they'll never have enough brakes. So those are, and when we're talking about road And if you're racing, missing one of them, you ain't going to go racing. You ain't going to race. We're not going to go fast anyway, that's for sure. So, um, But one of the things that they do so well with the modern race car is, um, and it's because we have simulation, right? Our, we have computer programs. You, you, you know, we just got done talking to Bob and Mike, and really Mike enlightening us to that 1972 IndyCar be built by computer um, and how they missed the boat back then because it was all, it was really more about the, Algorithms into the computer than what the to get the result. Now the computers do so much for we us. We talk the computers simulation. a lot. Oh my gosh, <laughs> the simulation is so good. I know the engineers. We have a Peterson race. We've got a parked up somebody just before the bridge. Sadly, that is in a little bit of a peculiar position. So I, I, I the good news is again, this is everyone you saw when we went down the Andretti hairpin. They don't go side by side, door to door. They lead themselves five car widths in yeah. between each other. They don't want to take any chances. This is the first sessions, too. So um, that's why we're probably going to see a little bit more mechanicals than we will throughout the weekend is because these early sessions, that's the first time a lot of these cars have been run in maybe a month or so. Yes, and they do run. That's another uh, point to make. It's not like these are cotton wool for the year. The, the, the historic scene in America, I was genuinely shocked about the amount of cars from all over the world here, as well as American cars, but also how often they are used and abused. But yeah. no, but the, how often they are raced. Um, I mean, these guys have a schedule as busy as even your schedule sometimes. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, they're, they are uh, they are beyond weekend warriors. I mean, yes. they, they get out there and, and they're hitting it 
heavy schedules, 10, 12, 14 races a year. Um, that is my dad's favorite car. Really? From, he, he said to me since he was, since I was a nipper that he would have an E-type one day. Sadly, he had two children and that put pay to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we spent that money. <laughs> That's what happened. But, uh, that Jaguar E-type, beautiful, uh, and classic colors. Michael Doyle at the wheel of that. And like I said, the Jaguars were still relevant there, especially with the drivers that they brought over, like the odd Sterling Moss or, uh, you know, uh, Chris Amon or a Bruce McLaren. Uh, they kind of, well, I say in Bruce's case, they, he kind of came for the sort of Can-Am era. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, those cars were still relevant in this mid-50s, early 60s. But now we were starting to see the emergence uh, of the less nimble but more powerful muscle car. Absolutely. And uh, the E-Type was like the, the best of both worlds, right? You know, it had, had great, uh, you know, handling. It was very nimble but also had that great power plan as well with, uh, with, a, with a good amount of horsepower behind it. This looks like a, one of our Shelbys out yep. there. It looks like a two. Is that a 289? Leaf Cobra 289? Yes. Number Cobra 289, the blue, seven. with Steve Park at the wheel. And, you know, you talk about, we, we just talked about Parnelli Jones. Well, Carol Shelby is, is, is right there in the history of American racing. Absolutely. Right at the center of it. Absolutely. 100%. I mean, yeah, you cannot talk about a history of American motorsports without Carol Shelby's name being uh, up in the top three names of, of people we discuss because his impact, his impact even to this day of the Shelby Cobra. I was fortunate enough to be close enough to the man that I called him Uncle Shelby. Ah, uh, Uncle very Carol. nice. Uncle Carol was, was who he was to what me. What was his daily then? He uh, <laughs> he had many a dailies. But, yeah, I'll um, bet. He gets he get to choose one. But one of the kindest people I, I'd ever care to know. Uh, he was always very good to me in, in everything that we did. And uh, when I moved out west to, to, do, to race in the Southwest Tour in NASCAR, um, he was a big catalyst for that and, and certainly helped me out. And on a, a, a fun story with, with Carol Shelby, he had hired my Uncle Mario to run Le Mans. And my Uncle Mario came to him and said, Carol, I just got an offer from Firestone to to have a lifetime contract with Firestone Tires oh. and be a factory driver of Firestone. And Carol released him of his contract because Carol was on Goodyear Tires. That's right. And I Carol released story. him of his contract and said, you need to go after that because a tire deal is so much better than anything I can give you. Interesting. And to this day, my Uncle Mario is still uh, fostering that relationship with Bridgestone Firestone, and it's a fantastic relationship that they have. So, And I, I think about when this vintage stuff goes on, John, Johnny, is these, these cars need tires, and they need period-correct tires. Yes. And I think that is one of the unsung heroes of our vintage racing are the tire manufacturers that give us the tires that these cars can go out there and run on. Yeah, it's something often that I get into a conversation about, they, they, that, that the parts thing comes up, uh, which is how do they get their parts? And I said, well, heh, it's it's a dark art because yeah. you'd be surprised what is available, but you'd also be surprised at how close to era all of these cars both have to be and are because they want them to be. Exactly. And what I mean by that is the guys peddling them, they want them to, to stay, period. But also the rules of historic racing demand that they... You can't just sort of put on a modern pair of tires and go racing. You have to be period. 100%. Absolutely. It, it, it has to be that way. It's the, it's the fairness of it all as well. And uh, and again, like to your point, Jonathan, where does the where does the value of the car go if you just took it took the history yeah, out of it? Exactly. You know, right. yeah. Lap time. And and that's why you made a great point earlier. This weekend isn't about lap time. It's not about what we see in speeds. It's about the just pure enjoyment of watching these cars get exercised around the track and get exercised at speed. I mean, I'm a, you're seeing triple digits consistently here on the front straightaway. You know that nine Cobra we were just looking at, that Rob Walton's pedaling at the moment? Well, that race at the 1965 Le Mans with Dan Gurney and Jerry Grant. They sadly didn't finish. But there's a nice bit of history bringing us into Dan Gurney, another legend, obviously, um, of America. Another California legend. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you can't you can't talk racing out here without the names of Parnelli Jones, as we mentioned before, but also Dan Gurney and, um, you know, the All-American racers who were, were, I mean... I, I, do, I really do think, I mean, obviously, there's racing all over America, but California, it's a bit like surfing, has that sweet spot of weather, the importing of the cars, the, ti- the sort of, the timing of... Well, as well, because yeah. these weren't cheap cars. No, no, no. And there financially. Was a lot of, uh, financially, there were people 
uh, wealthy enough to, to buy them, import them, and run them. Uh, and so California had that combination of weather, tracks, and wealthy enough folk to go racing. And that's why California became such a hotbed. And Florida, too, for American racing. And there really is little 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 pots of American racing that is, you, know, you kind of look at it, you look at Indianapolis, and you think, why? Well, it's all because of the circuit there. Florida, the sunshine again, and several circuits. But California, unique with Sonoma uh, and obviously Laguna, but they were built early and because racing began here earlier than most places. Absolutely, and every every part of the country's got their niche, right? The South has a, in the Midwest has open wheels, sprint car racing, IndyCar, and then the West Coast was known for this right here, what we're looking at, sports cars. Uh, the sports car racing, what a beautiful car, this number 14, Bizzarini, uh, getting to the Italians, the 5300 GT Strada. So I'm guessing that's probably a 5.3 liter engine inside the 5300 maybe to the to the size of the engine. I'm not, I'm, that's just a guess, but John Fudge. We'll go and find out. We'll go find out. I we'll, like that car. We'll send Kev out there, but what a beautiful, beautiful machine, 1966. Again, Bezzarini, I've never even heard of this car. And it, it screams Italian, doesn't it? Of course it's it does. A beautiful red. And and also the guy driving it, John Fudge, uh, another uh, perennial historic driver. He's been around for many a year. As we go back into the pits, there's the 86. That's a really neat car. That is... He's uh, got his Ferrari helmet on. Back then, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and it got a dance at Hulu Girl. Nice work, Tony. And I think back then you had to lead the passenger seat in the cars. Uh, to, to, I believe that was part of the rule package. If I'm not mistaken, um, back then was, was to prove that it was still a passenger car. A Adam, you will attest to this as a Trans Am driver currently. Our cameraman this weekend, we are very privileged to have the one and only Tony Garcia. And you know from having been, had his camera poked into your face, yes, sir. he is going to get as close as he dare. <laughs> it's going to feel like cars. you're there. I mean, <laughs> other than other than smelling the hot tire and and feeling the the heat off the engine, you're going to really uh, the folks at home. We feel we hope you feel like you're here with us at this at this event because it's uh it, it, it truly the the energy here, the interest from the people. This is this is the 1966 Shelby GT350 by Peter Reed. Uh, what a beautiful game car now, that is. I don't want to say too much, but that was the same year that a certain Johnny Green was born. And if you feel <laughs> ever one Christmas that, you know, what could I what could I sort Johnny? We we'll just slip that into your garage, just, right? Just slip the GT350 gold, black stripes into my garage. That'll make me very happy. What a cool car. I mean, it's, it's the 99 that's popped up. That's the Jaguar type of Michael Doyle, sadly. I was trying to see the number on it uh, when it was parked up, and now I've seen it. So uh, it is uh, Michael Doyle's car that's pulled off. He'll be all right. Got plenty of time. Yeah, he's just enjoying up. the session. At this point, He's uh, he's got the front row seat to, as they come out of turn four to five there. So great that's, view of the corpse through that from above as well. What great camera work by our team here, doing a fantastic job for us and give us great views from every stretch. Love these drone shots. I mean, the... This is what a great replacement for when we used to launch a helicopter up there to get these shots. And our pilots do a great job again of, of getting us, you know, from Wayne Rainey down here to, to the last two corners of our of our course here. Come Weather back to Texas Laguna Park. in 50 years. We'll be doing drone race, historic racing. <laughs> and I tell you, you know what? It, it's it, coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's absolutely coming. I train with Pit Fit, Jim Leo at Pit Fit, and, and pretty much any athlete can come in there, but he specializes in motorsports. And we have a drone pilot actually in their world championship drone racing pilot yeah. comes there and trains with us and uh he, he's such an awesome guy and and we have a lot of fun the reaction on those guys is absolutely incredible if we take a look at another 1966 shelby number 40 coming across the line and now we take a look at the 146 of another cobra 289 of chris McAllister, another veteran of racing Historics. What a beautiful blue that is. I know. I love the way that blue comes through here with the sun. The, and we got that Northern California sun hitting it. It's, it's a definitely a, a sight to behold. I'm not sure whether the fog is coming in or going out. It's usually going out by this time in the morning, but you never know. I believe we've got some cloud cover, which I don't think are going to disappoint too many people. They, no. have, they have called for some pretty hot temperatures here this weekend, so... I think getting a little bit of that natural top cover isn't going to hurt anyone's feelings. Well, if you watch the news, you'll be well aware that in Northern California, and we take our hats off to all those fighting the forest fires, uh, there's been a lot of really 
uh, dramatic and tragic stories happening uh, a couple of hours north of here. Luckily, the smoke hasn't poured down here. We've just got the usual Monterey fog, and it's a glorious California morning here. A one of four here at Laguna Seca, so if you can stay with us for the weekend, please do. And we've got a host of over 400-plus cars to show you. In fact, more than that, because there's so many uh, Concours de Elegance here, as well as displays from Ford. Uh, we've got that indie display that you just saw. We haven't actually had a historic indie. Um, they don't really do that much historic racing or has been gathered like they are here. So this is really special. This is really special. And there, there's there's definitely new interest uh, as IndyCar is, is definitely gaining a lot more momentum again. And the, that's cycling through to get more, more momentum and more attention uh, on that series. That vintage Indy stuff is, is definitely becoming more and more popular. And I'm talking from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You're not going to much more innovation in any form of, of, of motorsport than IndyCar and Formula One. You know, those were the, they, they really competed against each other on the global stage for innovation for a very long time. Um, you know, and, and that's what we get to see here. And, and what we honestly have, Kev has already introduced us to that, right, yeah. Jonathan, yeah, in the exactly. last piece that he did there. Well, we say we like our blues. That's an aqua blue. Makes it sense. Aqua blue Corvette that just went through shot. Oh, I, Kelly at the wheel. Uh, a 1966 Corvette, the 996, and I like that uh, aqua blue with the white stripe. And then you'll see too on some of these car on the cars, you'll see tape, like in a star shape over the headlights. And this is so that if a rock were to come up, that the tape is going to hold the headlight together so that we don't have glass shot on the racetrack and have uh, a, a separate issue. So if the people at home are wondering why. When you look at the headlights on these cars, why you're seeing the tape that you see on them, uh, that's why we see that. And they wouldn't have seen that when the cars raced back then because, again, it wasn't a thing. But now as we do vintage racing to keep the cars and keep everyone safe, that is something that they will do. Well, we are watching our Group 2A, the first uh, time we've seen these guys in action. And it's 1963 to 66 GTs over 2,500 CC. 186. Love that car. Yeah, that's Shelby Cobra. The silver, the 289, though, with the, with the fast pack tail, the Daytona tail, if you will. Is, it's not a, technically a Daytona, but it's got that, that beautiful shape to it. Yeah, and it's almost, when you look at the E type and you look at that, you can sort of see some, some, some ideas changing hands. You know, what struck me when I was looking at some of the, the programs last night was. What motor racing is never really credited for, we talk about uh, design, but the creativity yes. of the people back then, and still today, but these guys were the pioneers who, I mean, what must have their brains been like to, to sort of take a piece of metal and turn it into, or take a car that already existed and turn it into something better, faster, more powerful, or more race-worthy, and the creativity is unbelievable amongst the early days, the pioneers, if you will, of American motorsport. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Checker flags out for this session. A good, clean second session through. Absolutely. They had such great innovation and style. I mean, where their minds went and, and how they came up with these designs and the uniqueness of it all was, was just what, what captures our imagination still to this day and, and why we, we show up in droves to see these in 996 there. Chevrolet Corvette, like you said, the aqua blue. Against AC Cobra right there, that went around the corner. That's that's a really that's a really neat car there, dri driven by James Farley. Uh, that is um, James Farley from Ford Motor. Right, by the way, yeah, I talk about uh, talk the walk, walk the walk, and talk the talk. James Farley is uh, literally, I think, the CEO of Ford Motor yeah, Company yeah, currently. Sir. So talk about uh, representing. I've seen him race. He races in a lot of SVRA races. Of course, we're both at those. And he, Jim's a regular. Uh, and I hope to get a, a word with him because this is a special weekend for Ford. Because you could argue 55 years on, this is where it all began for them. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, Ford becoming the powerhouse of racing. So, let's head down once again to Kev. What have you got down there in the paddock, Kev? Yeah, 
Well, thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Adam. Another great session out here on the track at Laguna Sacra. While all that's going on, the atmosphere down here in the paddock is really building. The noise is just something else. But I'm managing to find some great people to talk to. We've had a number five Lotus, an Andretti Lotus behind me at the moment, and I've got the owner and driver alongside me. Chris Locke. Chris, thanks ever so much for taking time out to have a chat to us. Just give us a little heads up on the car that you're going out in shortly. My pleasure. Yeah, this was uh, Lotus from 1976, Type 77. It was Mario Andretti's first full season driving for Team Lotus. And, of course, two years later, later he won the World Championship. Uh, but the story behind this car is that uh, Ronnie Peterson had left the team. Colin Chapman was uh, looking for a driver at Long Beach in 1976. Mario Andretti had been driving for Parnelli Jones, his F1 team, but but that uh, that team ended the season early at Long Beach, and they had a chance meeting over breakfast where Colin Chapman was talking to Andretti, and they worked a deal where Andretti would uh, would start the season, would finish the season with Lotus, and he worked on with uh, Colin Chapman the development of this car, uh, finished in the points and and on the podium several times, and ultimately at the end of the season famously won the Japanese Grand Prix in the rain. That's absolutely phenomenal. Great history. And Chris, you're a very lucky man to own a car like this. Tell us how it, you know you came by it. How did it end up in your hands? Well, I've been racing for some time and particularly uh, interested in Lotus race cars from my childhood. That was the team that uh, I found most uh, interesting and yeah. innovative. So when I heard that the uh, Lotus 76, uh, Lotus 77 uh, had come on the market, I was interested in, in making an offer immediately. I've owned it for about 15 years now, uh, and I believe I'm the fourth owner. Wonderful to drive, fabulous to be driving a car that I never expected to drive when I was watching Mario drive it, one of my heroes as a kid. Yeah, it really is fabulous. And a little story for me here, when I was a kid growing up, I had one of these as a toy car, and this, I, I mean, I was probably about six or seven years old. I had no idea what the car was. I just really liked this black and gold racing car. And it was this car. But um, your, your kind of appreciation of these heritage events, it spreads far and wide because as we were just chatting about, I was at the Monaco Historic two or three years ago. But that's an event that I think you said you've done seven times at Monaco you've been? I've raced this car seven times at Monaco. Uh, wasn't able to do it this year because of the pandemic. Yeah. But uh, hope to go back next year. Uh, obviously, it's just unbelievable to race at a, at a, at a street circuit that has that depth of history and it's it's just such a spectacle. Uh, Goodwood as well. But this event this year uh, at, at uh, Laguna Seca is, I think, equally attractive. It's yeah. just a fabulous circuit. I've been racing here now for over 20 years. Yeah. Just love the event. And it, I think this, uh, this year will take it to an all-time high. Yeah, it really is. I mean, the setting here at Monterey this weekend is second to none. The Rolex kind of hospitality booth at the end of the paddock there. Well, it's a sight to behold. If you can get here over the weekend, come and have a look at that. And as well, I mean, as we walk around the whole paddock, Chris, we've got Ferraris, uh, we've got Paganis, we've got Porsches. I mean, I think we're going to have like 125 Paganis here on Saturday. Have you heard about that? I have heard about that. What an amazing display of cars uh, here and throughout the peninsula this weekend. Yeah, it really... It really is a great weekend. But, Chris, a question for you. I got out on the driver orientation yesterday as we were getting a tour of the circuit, and we had uh, Dorsey Schroeder talking to us about the circuit and how to take the lines. And one thing that he said was, this track really doesn't have any grip. The grip is pretty much non-existent. You've driven it. Tell us what it's like when you're behind the wheel. Uh, actually, I think it has, uh, it has fairly good grip. Of course, I have a lot of mechanical grip on this car, okay. as well as some downforce from the wings. Yeah. But uh, it is a challenging track, and you 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 a lot of blind corners. So uh, certainly uh, it has some benefits to have tra to have raced here before, not for the first time. And, and just give us a heads up as well, because the famous part, obviously, Laguna Seca is the corkscrew. I think it drops down some 59 feet or something. What is it like going down through that corner in a race car? You said this thing could be pulling 3G. Yeah, on the faster corners, it does uh, get up to about three Gs in the Lotus 77. Uh, through the corkscrew, of course, you're you're going somewhat slower, but it is quite a drop. You have to get your points of reference because it is blind and and be online. Yeah, and that bit what you said there about points of reference and be online, you got to trust your judgment because coming into it, you're pretty much blind. There's a moment where you're looking up at the sky. That's exactly right. Yes. <laughs> 
No, but I, I, I love this circuit. It's one of my favorite circuits in North America. Uh, spa, probably internationally. Uh, but this is right up there uh, in North America. It's one of my favorite circuits. And, and have you taken this car to Spa at all? I have. So tell me, Eau Rouge, going up the hill there. There's a hill that you got to blast up. What, what's that like? Yeah, uh, Eau Rouge is, uh, is kind of a leap of faith, isn't it? So uh, I don't go flat. I, I guess some people do, but uh, but I don't go flat. I actually find the, the crest of the hill after Eau Rouge to be more challenging than the bottom of the hill. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be lined up perfectly right if you're close to the limit. Yeah, you, you the hill. Yeah, you really do. And what people don't realize, obviously, about Spa is just how hilly it is. When you walk around the edge of the circuit after Eau Rouge, you are dipping right the way down around. You're up and down the whole way around. But coming back to Laguna Seca here, what sort of top speeds do you think you'll be getting out of your car today? I think we're geared to uh, do about 165 miles an hour. Wow. So uh, I plan to be, be there so as long as everything's all right with the car and... Uh, and I'm on the right line. And, you know, and, and from my point of view, uh, well, we, you know what, Chris, we're going to go to the grid because we've got some more exciting cars coming up, so hold it right there. Next out on track then, we've got 1973 to 1981 cars for you, but don't go anywhere as well because when you next find me in the paddock a little bit later on, we got a Mercedes, which is only one of five in the world. Don't go anywhere, we're bringing that shortly. Johnny and Adam, it's back up to you. Yes, there's only one in the world of the Andretti family and Mario of course leads the family but I don't know I had that car that Kev was talking about he stole my story because I did have that little matchbox number five of Mario's when I was a little boy and I had it I think I've still got it somewhere but I had his championship winning 79 and you can explain it was 1976 he joined Lotus but it's a Lotus 77. Yes, yeah, and you know, Lotuses were always the the name of the Lotus was always the, the, year, the ahead. year after, the number of the year after. So, like, uh, the, he famously won the the champion. Oh, this is the JLP. Yes, this is uh, this is number chassis number zero zero three nine thirty five. This is the winningest nine thirty five in, in in history. Uh, Hang on, just say that again. The because if you think about what Porsche have achieved, right. this is the most successful Porsche ever. Nine thirty five. Nine thirty five. Most, most okay. successful nine thirty five, and has none other than Zach Brown <laughs> uh, behind the wheel, which the is the head of McLaren, CEO of McLaren Racing. So you know, we this is definitely we're in great company here. This Daniel is, Ricciardo, if you're watching, tune in. <laughs> this could be your chance. <laughs> that, that is uh, considered the uh, priciest nine thirty five in existence. He wouldn't let Lando drive that, would he? Probably not. <laughs> well, who knows? I don't know. You know, man, with with with, with Lando, it's. Uh, but John Paul Jr. won the IMSA championship in 1981 with this. Um, was just, uh, you know, John Paul Jr. the legend. Uh, we uh, we lost he, we lost him on on December the 29th. He he, he put in a, a valiant fight with Huntington's disease, which is a, just a wretched, uh, you know, degenerative disease. It's a it's a genetic disease, but. Uh, you know that carries through the family but uh to, to have the history here to see that car i know you're going to hear me say this i i apologize already at home because you're going to hear me say this see this car here yeah making laps and then another have the zach brown behind the wheel of it what a special well and for those tuning in and recognizing that name yes the, he is the man that you see every uh weekend on the pit wall with mclaren and leading mclaren back to their winning days hopefully uh, with the likes of Daniel Ricciardo and Lando Norris, week in, week out. But, to be fair to Zach, he's currently, I think, about to embark on an LMP3 campaign himself, uh, where he's going to race. So, um, not a bad peddler himself. You no, know, Zach has been driving for and a, a long time. a big collector. Yeah, I, I've got, I go way back with Zach. Um, you know, you know, he, he was, he's from Indianapolis. Uh, where where I live and and he had back in the day it was called Zach Brown's track attack <laughs> and you could you could come learn how to how to drive he he would hire uh, professional drivers he had like a parking lot autocross set up they had purpose built cars and um, and he built a business out of that he built JMI marketing yeah in that same area the guy is is really brilliant he he's got a a huge love for our sport he's an amazing collector. Uh, honestly, the, the motorsports are is better because of, of Zach Brown and people like him. And the news, latest news, is that uh, here in Indy, anyway, uh, the Indy program that Zach is running, uh, along with Gilles Ferrat, uh, 
is now got, they've taken a bigger share yes, and now uh, and so there's no question that now both uh, on both sides of the planet McLaren's name will continue for many years to come it seems uh, that way. At both Indy level which is great because not people people don't know the history of McLaren at Indy which goes way way back uh, so they're going to be heavily involved as they were with Alonso a couple of years ago but now they're building a team almost not from scratch but they've taken uh, is it Schmidt Peterson's <laughs> Beginnings and now they're taking it with Arrow and so on and so forth, uh, and so they're they're really committed to Indy, and we know in Formula One they're now starting to knock on the door of the top three. Absolutely, uh, Zach is is achieving everything he was brought into McLaren to achieve, uh, to increase the partnership revenue, to um, to guide that team back to their their glory days. You know, absolutely, and he's done that. And he and Zach because he uh, himself has talent behind the wheel. He's got an eye for talent, yeah. which shows in the stable that they have. I think they, in Formula One, they have one of the more powerful stables in Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo. I think Ricciardo has struggled um, in the car. I think a lot of it's been fit. He hasn't had a comfortable fit in the car, yeah. um, which is funny because he's not a big guy, right? But I don't think his hips, he's right? Tall, it's, but yeah. It's the bone structure of his hips that aren't as quite as narrow as Lando. So I think that's been most of his struggle has been in fit and feel. In that aspect, not necessarily driving prowess, but I think once they get all that sorted, we're going to see McLaren with this new rules package next year do their thing. Yeah, and to be to be fair to Daniel, people have asked me this question: What's happened to to him? Nothing. Um, Lando, it's almost Lando's team. He's been there a long time, longer than you'd think. So it's kind of Lando's team at the moment. Oh, surely is. And Lando's a great kid. I mean, it, it, anytime you have someone of his talent, his personality, a Group Forty Four car going by there, of his talent, his personality. Uh, the team gravitates to that. You know, my dad always said uh, the race. Nobody wants you to succeed on the racetrack more than them because they put their blood, sweat, and tears into it as well. So, you mentioned that Group Forty Four livery, the white with the green stripes, and that was on that Triumph TR Eight that just went by there. Mark Leonard at the wheel. Tell me, what do you know about that? Because I've seen that on, well, I've seen it on so many different cars. The Group Forty Four logo. Bob Tullius, right? That's right. Bob, Bob Tullius made it famous. Um, you know, Bob here, an American racer and a legend, and uh, the Group Forty Four Jaguar That's Jaguars right. were, were probably the most famous that that we had over here. He had IMSA prototypes, uh, GTP prototypes that he won in, and uh, so this is this triumph. This is where he really got his start, if you will, or really turned the heads and, and brought the Group Forty Four uh, name to the forefront. Uh, when you go to Sebring. He does have a museum set up at the airport there at Sebring. Uh, he's got an airplane in there that is painted <laughs> in the Group 44 colors. But uh, Bob Tullius is, is certainly one of our great legends in the sport, and what a what a wonderful man. I've had the honor of, of knowing him quite well, uh, and only here recently. I didn't know him as a youngster or anything like that. His, his career pretty much come to an end, and he had a, made it an escape from the racetrack for the most part. But... Uh, we decided, the race team I was driving for, ECC Motorsports, decided they wanted to do a throwback paint scheme. We ran the number 44, so we decided to do a Group 44 throwback. Now, that was on a Corvette, so he never did Corvettes. And so we got a hold of Bob and said, do you mind if we do your paint job on our Corvette? And he was honored. Oh. And he came and he signed the hood of the car, and we put a piece of helicopter tape over to preserve his signature. Cool. Uh, so that body work still sits at ECC Motorsports in their shop museum. Uh, but it's, it was a very special relationship we were able to foster with Mr. Tullius and his family. And uh, and it's something I will cherish uh, all these days that I roam this earth. Well, if you just joined us, welcome to the Monterey Reunion 2021. I'm Jonathan Green, and you're hearing from Adam Andretti, who will be regaling us with the odd story, as he is right now. <laughs> but talking of where we are, we started off, uh, obviously, in the early 50s. And now we've moved up to IMSA, an IMSA GT, GTX, GTU. Uh, and this is the 70s and the early 80s. And this is when BMW, as we're looking at now, but uh, so the Europeans still had a big influence. But now the Japanese came to the fore with Datsun. Uh, Paul Newman and Datsun ro roaring around Laguna Seca. No question about it. Um, big days for the Japanese, but still the influence of Porsche, Triumph, the Europeans. But now you get the Chevrolet Corvettes coming in, uh, still the Alfa Romeos. But now we start to see different cars and a more worldly look to American racing. I mean, this is, and, and, and it's no, it, it becomes very obvious on what brand was dominating this era, right? When you look at the list, it's almost all Porsches on this list. It was a very Porsche dominant era 
uh, during that time. But as you mentioned, you know, the Japanese came in with a big, big jump with the Datsun. I know, I, I, I love the Datsun, right? I mean, that was, that was such a, oh, I love a it, neat, yeah. it was such a neat car. And part of why I loved it was Paul Newman's relationship with our family and, yep. and, and what a, what a great man Paul Newman was. I mean, I, I and what a great, great racing driver. Oh, no, I, mean, on, I mean, four time SCCA national, national champion. champion. Yeah. People don't think about that. They think of him as the actor that went racing and Steve McQueen similar. But both guys, great racing drivers. I think my uncle Mario said it best. Uh, you know, he didn't say it to me. He he has openly quoted this that had Paul Newman started driving before acting, he would have been Paul Newman. The ra- you'd have known him as Paul Newman, the race car driver. Wow, and nothing else because he, uh, you know, the, the personality that he possessed would have made him a star, no matter what he did. Right? Paul Newman was just born to be a star. <laughs> and, Phil McQueen, to be fair. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, obviously his look. Uh, you know, the 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 women. You know, old blue eyes just fell in love <laughs> with him. So, uh, William Connor, I believe, is getting called into the pits for mechanical here in his 1980-935. Hey, guess who this is? Who we got there? Number Adam 21. Carolla. Adam Carolla driving himself the 911. That is a definitely a famous name, not made famous by, by racing, but definitely a, he's an actor, a TV personality, and and a filmmaker about car racing. A filmmaker <laughs> about car racing, nutty about cars. I I've never met the man. We no, have I so haven't. many common people that know each other that I I feel like I know him, you know. And oh he's, no, <laughs> he's definitely uh, he's definitely you know someone I like to sit down and chat with to find out where his interests come from. So the T Bird Swap Shop up here. Ah, uh, that okay. that is owned that was owned by a man named Preston Hen. Preston Hen, you know, we've lost him over the last couple of years, but uh, again, you want to talk about people that the the reason the sport is as good as it is. Preston Hen is one of those reasons. Uh, Preston owned so many cars, helped so many racers make sure that they had the funding to go do what we love to do and, and to go put on a show. How do these wheels work? That's an interesting design. They call that those. the fan wheel. Yeah. That was a fan wheel, and it would cool the brakes. So those are very expensive. Um, you see those get auctioned which, off. Which? Those get auctioned off at charity auctions because because of vintage racing, you know, oh, these, get, see, yeah. these get timed out. So. Um, that was way ahead of their time, and, and I obviously say they use those in Formula One now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not not those particular designs, but they have coolers, obviously, to yes. get the brakes cool. Yes. They need to. Absolutely, and and it was better aero to do it that way than it was to pull air from the outside of the car. If you look at that 935, it is so far ahead of its time aerodynamically. Uh, the this is you're looking at at the first usage of wind tunnel technology, right? Um, in the design of that car and the bodywork, so. And I'm sure, I, I hazard a guess, that there was an Andretti you probably did a bit of IMSA. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. We, we've got a great history in IMSA. My brother John, yep. uh, specifically, you know, won the 24 Hours of Daytona. He won the Did Porsche. he get the Rolex? Hey, he never got a Rolex because it was the Sunbank oh. 24 that year. Um, so they, never, they didn't award Rolexes, unfortunately. So he never got his winning watch, which I, I, I think, you know... As a trophy, he would have loved to have it. John was not a material man; like he Who didn't did he need drive material for? things. And what did he drive? For? That was a Porsche 962. That was a Busby Porsche. That was the Miller Genuine High Life uh, 962. That was um, he shared the car with Bob Wallach and Derek Bell. Oh wow! <laughs> right? Um, yeah, you, you've got yeah. a good chance if yeah. you've got those two. He was the baby in that car, right? Though, right? I mean, yeah, the, the the two veterans, you know, in there. Wow, and, Bell and Wallach. Wow. Yeah, so it, I really encourage any any motorsport enthusiasts out there, if you haven't read the book by my brother John called Racer, it's a fabulous book. Um, the name says it all. It, it focuses, of course, there's going to be talks about what he battled, you know, with his illness because that was that was part of it. But um, but the, if you're into racing, that is a, a great he is an open book. I've just written it down. I've not got. I've not yeah. had that one, so and, I will. And and uh, part of the proceeds go to charity. You know, yes. none of none of the profits come to the family. All the all that profit goes one hundred percent to charity. And we've done this before, but what is that charity? Let's put it out there. So that is going to go to Race for Riley, which was a charity that John, you know, founded back in nineteen ninety five, and it was really by accident, and it was a charity go kart race. Um, you know, with a radio personality in Indiana that. Uh, was was 
meant to embarrass the man, you know, was, was there was a amount of donation that every time John lapped him on the racetrack, and uh, and John lapped him, I think, like eight or ten times in a short duration <laughs> race. So um, this kicked off, and and I think, I mean, I think it's like I could be wrong, but four and a half million dollars later in that time span that has been donated. So that'll go there. And then we've also, um, since John's passing, have uh, launched the Checker for Andretti Foundation, which is to support early screenings for colon cancer. So good. The number forty nine Porsche. That's 1974, that That's black a beautiful RSR, RSR. Yeah. Beautiful, by Ben McGraw. Very different than the 914 just behind it. Completely different, those two cars, but, uh, yeah. What I love about the Porsche 911 is you could take the rear quarter window of any of the Porsches here from the 1970s that we're seeing, and you could put it in a modern-day Porsche. It's the same, yeah, almost same, same, exact identical same thing in it. Yeah, dimension. It's, it shows that when they nailed that perfect shape with the 911, they didn't need to draw away from it too shy, too far. By the way, Laguna Seca, if you know your Spanish, it does mean dry lake. And originally, Laguna Seca was just that. That was built in the bowl of a dry lake. And those lakes that you see now are actually artificial, sadly. Uh, but they, they, uh, they kind of play to the game and, and put two artificial lakes into the basin of Laguna Seca, and that's what you see now. But if you're wondering where Laguna got its name, try Lake. You know what? I, I, I've been coming here my entire <laughs> you life. You did not know that. I, didn't, I knew Interlagos in Brazil was between the lakes. Yes, exactly. But here in my own country, yep. I didn't know that. Look, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Yep. Thank you for that. Johnny, that was beautiful. Part of trivia there. And, and you'll know this, though, that this particular area... It was a dry lake. It used to be an army base before they built before they built the Laguna Seca. It was a, an army base. I, I did know that. There's, a, there's still the gun range here. Yes, <laughs> yes. The gun range is still here, and that's what allowed no noise. You know, they weren't going to complain about noise ordinances building it. You can't, you can't. You build a racetrack. Yeah, go ahead. You know, as long as you're not setting off mortars. Well, that has actually been, you know, something that Scramp, uh, the, the people that have organized for many years, what goes on here at Laguna. Um, uh, right through, um, you know, the 60s, 70s. Because of Monterey, you know, they, they were worried about the noise. So this circuit actually is in its own perfect bowl, some 10 miles away from Monterey. You would not ever hear. But, of course, there's houses up here in the hills, and they don't necessarily want the noise all the time. So there's, there's rules. They work with the community, and they work with the, uh, you know, the local government to make sure that there are certain ordinances at times when they can run and when they can't run. For sure, you don't want to upset your neighbors at any point in life, and and especially when you're operating a racetrack. But at the same time, you know the neighbors that are moving in here, uh, this track was here long before yeah. uh, they were. So there's got to be that compromise, that give and take, and I think that's what you find here is is a is a great community that understands that a lot of this area, you know, a lot of the businesses in this area. If you own a local business in this area, you want this racetrack to thrive, right? Yeah, because they are bringing uh, they are bringing obviously financial stability to you and your family so uh pits are active during this session yeah, that's you know. the 935 k3 that old yellow portion that we've just seen pull in beautiful car that thing stands out and, and there's tony garcia at speed in his green shirt there he is look nice at him work, go hey, hustling as always getting us the great <laughs> shot getting us the great shot look at that right at the tail of that beautiful look at the arrow work on that car i mean beautiful. you want to talk about everything having its purpose uh, you know the that JLP car that we saw earlier. You, if you if you know me at all, you know that when I open up my computer, that is my wallpaper. Yeah, is is my is my good friend John Paul Jr. driving cool. the JLP three. So it's it's it's. I'm so happy Zach brought that car out here. Just I'm selfish to see it. And then uh, th this one here, another brilliant, beautiful racker, isn't it? Yeah, what a beautiful car here. Nine thirty five K three. I'd like to have more information on the K3. I don't. I, I'm unfamiliar on what the K3 actually means. So. Yeah, we'll have to find out. Yeah, we'll, we'll send Kevin. We'll, we'll send special K. K special K, as I call him. <laughs> Kev, we'll send him down there to, to find out what the K3 is all about. I absolutely. absolutely or love you've it. got the social media hashtags. I'm sure if you go onto the website, you can probably uh, text us and let us know. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Or you've got some social out there. I'm have very you? small on social. I'm in Are LinkedIn. You? Yeah, very You're on small LinkedIn. social. Very small social. Well, it's not easy being an end ready. No, I know. I'm at Speed Green. You can you can give me a hard time there. Yeah. Or if you know what the K3 is, feel free. We'd love to hear. We'd love to hear because uh, I'm sure people have a wonderful take on that. It, it can educate us well. I lo I've always loved this car. This this um. This it's another is, K3. This <laughs> is another K3. That's a Saks Porsche. And 
Uh, just always, that one always caught my eye. And the driver of this car, Charles Nurberg, is a guy who I've seen so, so many historic events. He pretty much is a weekend warrior when it comes to doing historic racing. He's done a heck of a lot. He's a very good peddler, very good driver, and uh, you'll see him from time to time. He'll probably be in about four cars this weekend, if I know uh, Charles. I can tell you just by his driving line through the course crew and the way that he knows what he's past, that guy knows, yeah, that, that's someone who's knows what they're doing behind the wheels, so... And, that, and that's what you love to see here. You love to see the cars get exercised, and when they're exercised... Well, answer the myth. You've driven the circuit. You teach around the circuit. Is it as challenging for a driver as is myth, as it were? Uh, we talk about the famous corkscrew. We talk about the Gouda Seca, uh, both two and four wheels. Is it really the challenge that, that, that in reality, I wouldn't know? Without a doubt. I, you know, I, I'm a person, personally, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but I learn tracks very fast, so... Learning a track isn't is it that big of a, a, a challenge? That's that's Decon a de Monza, Decon yeah. Monza. I've never even again another one. Richard Goldsmith behind the wheel of that. That's a cool looking car. But to to, to uh, really point out what what that would be. But to your point, absolutely, it's a challenge. The biggest challenge here is once you learn where it goes, is finding speed. Finding speed at this track is so difficult. There are people here that know this track so well. In Trans Am, you have Thomas Merrill, who's literally been going yeah. around here since he's been in the womb of his mother. Uh, hey, yeah, he used know. to go around at lunchtime, he said, Absolute, right, in the Porsche. E exactly. So uh, you have people that have so much time around here that finding lap time to compete against those is very, very difficult. It looks almost like a Datsun, doesn't it? A Decon? Yeah, it does. 1982, so we're looking into the time frame of when I was alive, actually. I was three years old then. So it's, it's got, it's, it's holding the number of the age I was when there that car go. came out. It looks like a fun car to drive. Nimble little thing. And if you just joined us, we're on Group 3A at the moment. This is the FIA IMSA GT, GTX, GTU, AA, GT class from 1973 to 1981. That's a mouthful of alphabet soup that you rattled off there, John. I'm impressed. I would have fumbled over that like nobody's business, so well done. It's early. Yeah. <laughs> give, give me time. <laughs> Out of the pits comes the 94 Porsche, another 935K3. And we've got all the corners covered this weekend for sure. Bobby Rahal is here. And, of course, we have the Rahal straight. Wayne Rainey, I believe, is here. He lives in the mountains just uh, by the wayside, Wayne Rainey, the three-time uh, 500cc world champion and now running Moto America. And we have Adam Andretti representing the corner about here you're about to see. Andretti, corner two here at Laguna Seca. And one of the most famous corners both in motorcycle racing and in car racing. There's a couple of lines through there. You can go around the outside, but you can get hung out to dry. You can yeah. stay on the inside and lose a lot of drive. It, it, it falls off, right? You, you absolutely, it goes off camera on the exit there. So there is definitely, um, there is there is a challenge to go into the outside. But numerous lines getting into there. Obviously, a premium passing zone for this racetrack. And we got the checker flags are out for the session. Well, we've got this shot from the drone. You were telling me this morning that the Andretti curve actually didn't exist before in the early stages of Laguna. It went on further, right? Yeah, early Laguna didn't have that. Just that, was a left it hander. Have, yeah. it, you were a left hander that hooked up into five, and you went up the hill. Straight up. Yeah, men were men, you know, and <laughs> you had to really hang on there. And, and we'll we'll get into a story, Johnny. I've got All a good right. story. I want to get a good story. How that became a hairpin. We, yeah, okay, uh, good. I want to hear that story. So we will find out why Andretti Corner became what it was from an Andretti. I love it. And there's Adam Carolla talking of famous names. We've got them all here this weekend. We've got some really big names. And, of course, uh, a plethora of great historic drivers and guys that pedal these cars all year long. But Monterey Reunion always has a sparkle in every one of those drivers' eyes. A chance to come here. We met a couple of newbies earlier on this morning. Uh, and I think we'll meet a couple of oldies who've been here. What well, since it all began, the reunion started, what, 1974 was the first one. And it's been going ever since. And it has been. And, and, and strong. You know it is the it like every Monterey year. Historics, right? Yeah, absolutely. You were saying last night, you can't get that out of your head. Yeah. That's what I know it as, yeah. you know. I mean, it, I always grew up knowing it. And, and as title sponsors, you know, you want to absolutely give them the respect. And Rolex has 
got such a beautiful presence here. They've got a presence everywhere except on the wrist of Jonathan, myself, and Kev. So if, if anyone at Rolex wants to dial, I'm just teasing. But no, they, they have, they have a, a fantastic, they have a beautiful, uh, two story, all glass building here, uh, to, for hospitality, to entertain guests. Um, you, when you're walking in, it, they really transform WeatherTech Raceway at Laguna Seca into this absolute beautiful pre. You can see it. It's actually right there on the track, right on the other side of the corner, that two stage. Number 57 car off there in the kitty litter. It's Ernie Spader parked it up in the uh, gravel in that 911 from 1976, sadly. But like I said, four days, plenty of time to get on track and plenty of time to fettle those cars and get them back up and running. But we've just been watching our first look at Group 3A. Jonathan Green and Adam Andretti uh, enjoying, I hope, what will be a great weekend of historic racing. And if you're local and you're in the Bay Area, feel free to pop down. And like you say, the paddock is full of other cars that won't necessarily be on track. But you can get up close, sniff the cars, take some pictures, get little Johnny in the passenger seat or the driver's seat, uh, take some photos, bring the family down. Oh, there's a Datsun that's parked up as well, being towed away. Bring your calculator and, and do your research as you walk around and give us a figure on how many how much what we have there for value i'm i mean it's absolutely mind-blowing uh you know when you look around what's it and um it's like everywhere you turn is another mona lisa yeah you know what i mean it's another just absolute piece piece of historic art yeah no question about it and if you're unaware this monterey peninsula literally for this two weeks in fact comes alive with concourse elegance carmel by the sea to Monterey itself and of course here at Laguna so there is race cars historic racing all over the peninsula and we are about to get amongst it here over the next four days really enjoying it high above the corkscrew here at Laguna Seca we'll take a short break from the Monterey reunion join us in a moment relapsing polychondritis known as RP is an autoimmune disease where the body's immune system attacks its own cartilage and connective tissue if you think about where in your body you have connective tissue it's everywhere. It's a fatal disease. People are dying. We need to do more research and we need to do it faster. One in five Americans have an autoimmune disease. That's about 50 million people. Joining our campaign can help them. One in five, just keep that number in mind. My name is Nancy. I'm a patient with relapsing polychondritis, or RP. RP is an autoimmune disease that attacks cartilage and if untreated, can be fatal. To drive awareness and accelerate research, we establish the Race for RP. Success on the track has opened doors to world-class healthcare providers, researchers, and autoimmune disease experts, leading to groundbreaking discoveries and new hope. We are driving awareness and accelerating research in the Race for RP. Welcome back to Laguna Seca here for the Monterey Reunion. We're getting ready for our next group action coming up. Welcome back to the paddock here at the Monterey Motorsport Reunion where things really are starting to get exciting. And I said to you there were some fantastic cars here and I wasn't kidding. How about this, that from starting with a 911 GT to a D Tommaso Pantero here, we carry on with a 308 GTS. As I stroll around the front end of this one, I'm only going to end up next to a Ferrari Dino. I mean, where have you seen a parking lot like this before? <laughs> Certainly not on a Thursday morning, but this is what it's all about here at the Rolex Monterey Motorsport Reunion. All of these wonderful cars under this display are owned by uh, one man's company, that's Scott Dernick of Virtuoso Performance. And Scott, I'm going to pull you in here. Right. I mean, sir, sir, firstly, thanks so much for joining us. Sir. Of course. One of our first chats of the weekend. Four great days ahead of us, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. It's always great. And especially after all we've been through, it's really good to be back among friends and racing again. Yeah. And just tell us about, I mean, you've got a fantastic uh, company and business here. These are all owners' cars and you're looking after them, making sure they get out on track and stay safe and have a great time. Correct. Yeah. We provide uh, all the services our clients just arrive and drive. So, they show up and uh, race their cars, and then they can enjoy the rest of the event while uh, we worry about everything else. And just, I've just done a little kind of walk along the front here, just four fabulous cars that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, first question, do you have a particular favorite? Are you allowed to say that? Yeah, well, I have to say this uh, little yellow Dino is yeah. my favorite because it's mine. So uh, <laughs> I, I enjoy it immensely. I've had it a long time. I love the scaling of it. 
Uh, it's back when cars were simpler and smaller and lighter, and it puts a smile on my face every time I drive it. I really enjoy it. Yeah, I'm sure. And actually, a little bit of trivia for you. Our TV director said today, of all the cars here, this is his favorite as well. He flagged that one yesterday when we were walking around. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're pretty, they're fun. Uh, what's not to like? Yeah. yeah, what's not to like? But you've got a whole host of cars here, and just behind us, back across the way over there, mm -hmm. we've got the uh, Mercedes FIA GT car, the CLK. Now, I'm right in understanding that that's one of only five in the world? Correct. Yeah, there's only five CLK GTR race cars. Uh, that car was the Mercedes-Benz factory car. Uh, it was sponsored by their parts department. That's the graphics. It's supposed to look like a parts box that you're ripping open and seeing the engine inside. Uh, that car was quite competitive. Uh, it was one of the cars that helped them win the championship. Um, we did a complete restoration on the car. We got it out, uh, came out of South America for one of our customers, and uh, I've, I've driven it a fair bit. It's uh, it's quite a piece of kit. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And like you said, your Dino's your favorite here because it's yours because it's a simpler, smaller car. But yeah. you know, you're jumping from that into that. What's it like getting behind the wheel of one of those things? Well, uh, that car has, uh, um, it, you know, it's very big, but it's very light. Uh, it makes a lot of downforce. And uh, the engine is just staggering. It's a 6.4 liter V12, staggering torque. You know, we we joke it's like the finest racing locomotive in the world. You know, but it's uh, uh, it, it's really a sure-footed car. Uh, real positive control efforts. It's a sequential shifter. Um, you know, so it's it's a much more involving technological yeah. tour de force than you know one of these older cars. Um, but boy, a lot of grip, a lot of power. You've really got to be on your game to drive yeah. it. At, at the limit. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was saying. Because all of these owner drivers here, you know, that is quite a machine to drive. They're not they're not always the most experienced of racing drivers. So if you're going to take on something like that, you've got to know what you're doing. Correct. Yeah. Or sometimes uh, one of the services our company provides, I drive that car for the owner. So um, it, it just depends what they'd like to do. And as we look at that uh, Mercedes, just going along the line, there's four beautiful cars. Tell us what's lined up next to that one. The next one, uh, the open top there. Yeah, the next one, uh, the green car is a Lotus 23C. Uh, it's the last Lotus 23C built. And uh, they differed from all the other Lotus 23s in that their tires are wider. Uh, a little bit different suspension geometry, but it was mostly marketing by Lotus, that's all. Uh, the one next to it is an Elva 7, which is a contemporary of the Lotus 23. They're in the same race group. The Elva 6 is next to that. That's a 1959. Uh, it's earlier, predates the Elva 7. Simpler car, um, less horsepower. It's got a Coventry Climax instead of a Lotus Twin Cam. Yeah, fantastic rundown. And that's just uh, four of the cars you got here. We haven't even started on the other side yet. And we'll, you know, yeah. keep your powder dry for those. We've got four days and we're going to be back talking to you, I'm sure, as, as the weekend goes on. How many drivers are you looking after this weekend? How many cars? Uh, uh, this weekend we've got uh, 10 cars and uh, five drivers. So uh, usually we have a lot more, but uh, with COVID, folks made plans for other things. The event was a little uncertain, but typically we run about 20 cars here. Yeah. Well, Scott, thanks ever so much for talking to us. Don't run away because, like I say, over the next four days, we're going to come back to you, I'm sure. I'll be chained to this workbench. Over there, there you go, chained to the workbench. Yeah. Uh, and thanks to you for watching us wherever you are right now. Next out on track, it will be our Group 4A cars, 1947 to 1955 is the era. Johnny and Adam, how are you looking forward to that one up there in the commentary? Absolutely magnificent. And, yeah, I'm with our director, that Dino... I don't know if I'd have it in yellow, but I suppose that's Ferrari. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't care. It's, it's I'll take either. Red, right? Those were Enzo's colors uh, for whatever reason. I'm sure he had them. I'm sure somebody knows what those reasons are. But uh, And Dino, of course, the name of his son. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Absolutely. But yeah, this is such a cool era. I mean, this is, uh, this is certainly as the technology is starting to turn a little bit and, and, and turn in the favor of of grabbing more speed, tire technology stepped up a little bit at this era. Um, you know, we're starting to get into some disc brakes, things like that. So th th this is really some cool cars. Yeah, this is Group 4A from 1947 to 1955. And I have to say, <laughs> again, showing my age, but also how you, you get kind of... When I was a kid, we had some placemats for breakfast, and they were all pre-war, post-war, Bugattis, and so cool. And, and, and many of these sort of cars we're seeing here. And so I kind of, we had about eight of these mats, and I always wanted a certain one, and then I changed my mind. And, but I learned my cars when I was about three years old by those mats, and, and now I'm seeing them in real. It's it's, uh, it's quite it's quite a, a wonderful thing to be able to see these cars in action as they are today so. you almost just pitch yourself and, and, yeah. and it's just i mean we'll be here for four days and it's not going to get old i i nope. know none of this is ever going to get mundane or old and 
of so many. I mean, the makes on this list: Allard, Cannon, Curtis, Ziata, Manning, Tatum. I mean, they're not your everyday names, you yeah. know, right, Jonathan? These are some of those that just one-offs. Well, I, I mentioned the specials today. Well, we've got yeah. several. We've got a, a Cleary special and a Baldwin special out there in this. And as you mentioned, the Allards, the Ferrari, a Cannon, a Mark One Cannon. Yeah, a Shannon Crosley and interestingly, special. Interestingly, I don't know if it's connected, but Rick Cannon is driving it. <laughs> now, how does that, do you think that, that squares? It could be. And then I, I, I couldn't help but point out in this. And then car number two, it's a 55 Ferrari 750 Monza. Oh, none other driving is a Tazio. You know, like, I mean, is this is, are we? Is this the rebirth of a Nuvolari? You know, and, <laughs> yeah. and Tazio Otis. So that it's just really, really cool stuff that you can have fun here with. Yeah, once again, some great names as well uh, from the historic world driving these cars. And you need to be, you need to know what you're doing. As I said earlier, uh, you know, uh, Adam as a modern day driver. Uh, I think you'd be a little bit nervous taking out one of these, wouldn't you? Absolutely. I mean, we, we say it all the time. I I think that a driver from this era would have adjusted to our era of driving no problem. <laughs> right, but, but not the other way. But not the other way around. No, it, 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 it is such a such a challenge to drive these cars. I mean, they, they all have their own uniqueness. Like I said, there was so much of it worth learning uh, at that point um, and just developing you know, something that was actually relatively new. Uh, we're 50, 60 years on from this era that we're looking at now, and uh, I mean, even 70 years on in some cases. So uh, when you look at it that way, it's uh, we've come a long way, but in so many ways, we're still just the absolute same that we were back then. That's what makes the sport so great. Well, and also when you look at the, the, the times that we're talking about here, you're talking post-war, and you're talking about, you know, a World War II which affected the whole planet. And out of that became this love of, uh, you know, Spitfire pilots and fighter pilots. I remember talking to Damon Hill about this. You forget that the era was of daredevil kind of heroes. That was what the comic heroes and the, and the books were about, the boys' own stuff. Uh, and that's where racing drivers kind of came from in many ways. That's what they took over from was was these sort of elegant sort of mystical figures, uh, even going back to World War One and the Red Baron and so on. You know, so motor racing in the 50s were, I mean, Sterling Moss said it. Yeah, yeah, of course, when I was 18, I wanted to do something dangerous. And so don't don't mix. Don't don't think that these guys didn't take the risk because they didn't want to. They took it because they wanted to. Yeah. Uh, and also the fans of motor racing. That was the glamour of it. That was the, the the sort of pull of motor racing for women and men was to see these guys doing something on something that no one else dared to do. And these cars were very much that. No, I I think it's an excellent point. I I, I couldn't agree more. That's uh, such a unique perspective. Honestly, I've never even thought about that but ab true absolutely yeah, yeah the, these you know whether they were fighter pilots or in the trenches during that war when you come back to the real world what are you gonna do what are you gonna do <laughs> i mean it, what nothing's exciting so why not strap your you know strap yourself to something that wants to catch wants to catch fire and 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 not stop or turn and just go fast and oh i i think that's what an astute point uh and what's a huge what makes them the greatest generation is is all that is that they had the bravery uh, and the not only that the knowledge and know how to to go out there and and to do what we find so absolutely heroic and then for these owners to continue on this tradition and to keep these cars alive and to keep these cars running and and racing shape and tip top shape you know it's each one of us that has a passion for this owes them all a debt of gratitude. And we're on that Jaguar XK120, the suede green it's described, William Rookridge uh, at the wheel. And interestingly enough, we talked about the Pebble Beach races back in 1950. Well, it was one of these that won the first ever Pebble oh, Beach wow. race. Yes. So, And there's another XK120 uh, 120 out there that we've been talking about the cars, but I want to talk about one of my favorite drivers in historics here in the United States, and that's James Alder, uh, who is uh, in the white, the, it's called the New Old English White, number 33. It's a 1952 Jaguar, and James is a character and a half. He drives this car from Reno, Nevada, <laughs> to either Sonoma, 
He also does Seattle, uh, but he'll drive it down, goggles on, uh, suitcase on the back, and if he breaks down, he breaks down. But it's just a great story. And, of course, as you can imagine, every truck, every modern car, every RV pips their horn and says hi. And he says the thrill of getting that coming all the way here, over the mountains, in the rain, whatever it might be, just to get here. Uh, and uh, he does it year in, year out. I love it. I, I saw him here in May. I just absolutely <laughs> love that. There, you know, you have that have the the 53 foot feather light trailers here you have those that want to be historic and they have you know all the way down to the period correct uh, haulers to take them and then we have this gentleman james who wants to just drive the car yeah. there just like some of the racers did back in the i said what if you break down he said well, we'll fix it yeah, fix it <laughs> yeah i mean there's car 60 the 1954 porsche now that's a 356 Gregor Magnuson at the wheel. I think we're at a black flag all, so I think this session has been called. Uh, they're awfully frantic around the, the course of the black flags. So ah. be at a black flag all. It means that somebody stopped where they shouldn't, or something is going on out on the we circuit. We certainly have a car that, sh yeah, that does it. That, that so all the cars will now come in. Yes. And this could effectively possibly end the session for them as far as timing wise one thing i do know about these events they want to make sure everything stays very punctual how what beautiful a, is that number 60 that is <laughs> i i mean that, the porsche 356 but you know it's just so not I that i mean i don't i cannot believe how porsche managed to keep this shape i mean you have no question what that is no uh -huh. and it doesn't matter if the, if the if the 2021 version came up behind it you'd know yeah. that they are from the same ilk what I love that's is... That's what's going on? Yep. Outside the corkscrew. It looks like we have, uh, we have a car, and that's a very peculiar yeah. area. Precarious so. place, yeah. yeah well, that's number place, 60 so. just parked in front of us. Oh, I'm loving it. But what I, I love, too, is you know now we have hood pins, right? That's what keeps the hood on. I love seeing this era of leather straps. Yeah. It's is, is very neat to me as well. That, this, car, this car 60 here, uh, Gregory Magnuson... They've been around a little bit. Look at all the stickers in the quarter window of that car. Very James Dean. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Just behind is the 51, the Baldwin Special Road, sir, the Alum Alloy. Stuart Hansen at the wheel. So all these cars parked up, as you can see, just below the bridge. Uh, and uh, they'll be going back out again. They just line up there because, obviously, they hope that their session won't be to cur curtail too much. And they can get back out. This is their first practice. And as you heard earlier from Adam Andretti, uh, the uh, the tape on the headlights is to basically make sure that they don't smash them from stones and rocks coming up. I'd always be worried with a dusty circuit like this that you would get grit and stones on the bodywork or on the paintwork. Um, uh, you know, that's all part of it. You know, those are part of the battle scars. The biggest thing is the safety, right? You don't want glass on the track. Someone cut a tire sure. and then have, have that issue. Um, you know, back to your back to the uh, Baldwin Special over here, this Roadster. I am so glad I am not the detailer on that car. <laughs> that polished aluminum, though, is beautiful. You, you could seriously, br Kev could brush his hair in that. Oh, my goodness. That is beautiful. I'll bring the shave kit tomorrow and I'll just yeah, get my yeah. shave done in front of it. But that is... Uh, the polished aluminum like that, I, I, that is so special to me. And to keep that in that way, to keep that pretty like that, that is quite a challenge. Adam, i got a question for you. Uh, I've seen Casey Stoner. I've seen Rossi. I've seen Andretti. I've seen so many people come down 59 feet that is the corkscrew. Is it as exciting as it looks, without a doubt. Yeah, no, you, you and unless you've experienced it, you really can't put. Uh, you know, you, everyone is, busy, as we call them. You know, where you get the undulations in a car, and at 50, 60 miles an hour, it can really get your get your belly tickling. This is this is. It's that what you call it, a belly tickle. Yeah, 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 a little belly tickle. This is like one of those amusement park rides where they take you up on that big cylinder and just drop, drop you. Drop you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really what that corner feels like every time you come to it. And it never, you never lose your excitement on the approach to the court screw. I can honestly say that there's, there's those corners at racetracks around the world that I'm sure I've never been to Eau Rouge and Spa, but I'm sure Eau Rouge is the same way. As you approach it, you're just excited to get there. You just, you're, it is such a fun, part of a racetrack to, to tackle that you, you just almost can't wait to get there 
Look at that. It's got the, about the only modern thing there are those belts, but I think that's a necessity. Helmet, yeah. <laughs> that's a necessity. Yeah. That's the Mercury Special, that blue and red with Robert uh, Manson at the wheel. And uh, what a wonderful car that is. As we go through, here's the 25C. That's a Tatum. Hey, that's Robert team. Manson. So we've got the whole, we've got uh, a couple of the Mansons yeah. out there enjoying their day. Uh, and that's what we'll notice too on this whole week. Look at that license it's plated All the way from the Empire State. Yeah, but we'll see a lot of that, you know, throughout this weekend. This is a family affair racing motorsports giving us a big thumbs up. We love that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, giving us, a, giving us some muscles there. That's Robert Manson. Uh, again, this is a family affair. Motorsports is a family sport. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a testament to that. You know. The, well, I was going to ask you about that as the weekend. I mean, you know, we got Bobby Unser coming. The Unzers. Uh, sorry, not Bobby Unser. Excuse me. Uh, we've got Bobby Rahal coming. Yeah. Uh, may Bobby rest in peace. Bless his yes, cottons. Uh, sadly passed away recently. And my hat goes off to what a wonderful man that was. But the Unzers, the Andrettis, the Rahal. Uh, what is it about American racing that really does make it a family affair? Is it because it takes the whole family to, to pull it all together? It does. Uh, you you got to, first of all, you have to have very cool and understanding parents. You know, <laughs> yes. You have to have a, a mother that is that is all about. You That's know, an MGTD we just saw there. That's very neat. And this 14 car go here ahead. is the Seattle. But yeah, you have um, you have to have good, cool parents. But at the same time, it's it's uh, the competition. The competition is so intense, and until you are really experiencing it behind the scenes, you don't realize that. And it's that kind of fierce competition that you realize that your only friends you have at a racetrack are those that you brought with you, and, <laughs> and your family are, are them. And, yep. and, and it, it honestly makes that it, it brings that that tightness together because your your big support is is from the family. Also, I mean. Um, you know, we can't shy away from the fact that this is a sport that there, it's an inherent dangerous sport. So whenever you have uh, danger around, you know, it, it makes you appreciate each other more. And I think that's, that's what we find. There's that polished aluminum. If our cameraman gets too close, and, and you'll be able to see the mirror of that. But there's uh, the 356 Porsche. I love this car. This is one of my favorites. The old Stuttgart emblem. Yep. What a cool car. And you see the stickers there. I know that historic uh, fans will know exactly what it is. But that's all the events they go to. It's sort of a tradition that you put the sticker of what events you've uh, taken part in and kind of leave them on. It's a badge of honor in many ways that uh, you've, you've been part of the historic scene. And you'll see a lot of these a lot of these drivers, they get suits made to the time period of the driving suit as well to make it look as close to authentic as possible. Obviously, they don't want to be out in these things with the leather helmets and the goggles of the of the, the drivers of yore that drove them originally. You know, they want to be in the modern equipment as much as possible. And even the replica suits that they get made are, are of modern Nomex materials and things like that. So if you see someone out there with a retro suit on out here, don't think that they're wearing, you know, a cotton wick from 1950. Uh, they're wearing something Nomex, but it is there to it fit the era, and, and that's what we love about this is that uh, that shows that completion Those wheels. of passion. Yeah, the wire wheels, right? That's beautiful. That Jaguar Parkinson Special. I said I mentioned that word special. Well, there's one, and that's uh, John Budenbaum at the wheel of that beautiful Jaguar Parkinson Special, 1949. Before Grand Prix racing even began. Yeah, that was before the first world championship. The yep. year before, right? 1950 was our first world championship. So this, is, yeah. this is pre-world championship era. It looks like we're getting ready to fire things back up and go green again. Let's just have a listen to this as it, as it fires up. Oh, let's hope he gets it going. Oh, he's got it going. Tony Garcia doing a great job here. Winding his way across the, footage. the, the paddock Fantastic. as they head out again. And we're watching 4A, four, four our Group 4A, as they roar into action. Uh, cool shots there, Tony. Thank you for those. That's great. And away we go. Just five minutes left in this session. And this is the Monterey reunion. We welcome you aboard what should be a very interesting weekend. Like some of these, you see some of these cats driving out of pit road. They got the arms hanging over the outside the door. It's, yep. it's quite a sight. So that's the streets special uh, Manning at the moment. The 1952 car of Robert Manson leading the way in that number 15. 
and haven't had much time on track as we look high above the Laguna Circuit. The Laguna Seca Circuit. I'm very happy though that this, uh, the car dead in the water that we had back there by the course crew did put an end to the session. We have a little less than five minutes left. That should get all these competitors another, you know, two or three laps of, of time out there on the track to make sure that everything's going well mechanically. You know, like we said, they're out here having fun. It's not like they're going back and debriefing and find out what, sh what spring settings to change. No, no, not doing any of that. They're just making sure that these cars are staying sound and, and can continue to circulate this beautiful, facility here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca for the duration of our four-day weekend. I'm going to steal a line from my good friend Bob Varsha, who's here this weekend. Uh, Bob, of course, for those of you who know motorsport, uh, the voice of Formula One in the United States for so many years and still very much involved. Uh, but he made a comment about this is one of those relaxed weekends, the Monterey reunion, where nobody gets stressed out. The only people who are stressed out are the people who haul the cars here and the insurance. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a well great played. line. Yeah. And, and it, this shows why Bob has had the success he's had yes. in, in our sport and covering it for so If I hear years. a good line, I will give credit to it. So there you go, Bob. That's yours. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I had those... I echo those sentiments on Bob Varsha, wonderful man and, and phenomenal for our sport. He'll, I think, be years. doing the Pebble Beach Concourse de Elegance probably again this, this week. That would make sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It would make sense to see We'll him try and drag there. him up here. Mike Joy's here. He's going to be doing... Saw Mike down there. Talking to broadcasters. Uh, he's going to be racing. Uh, he's been a long-time Trans Am historic racer. Loves it. That's great. No, we love that. We love that. Mike is Mike's another one. You know, uh, there's so many wonderful people that, that, that are good to our sport and... and you know, carry our sport to the next level and bring it to you, to you at home. Uh, we lost one of those just a few days ago. Yes, Bob we did. Jenkins. So yeah, we did. Condolences out there to to all those around Bob. Uh, Terry Lingner, I know. Yeah. Good friend of mine and and uh, you know, a good friend. Long time of broadcaster. Period, yeah. Uh, but he was he was very tight with Bob. So our thoughts out to everyone there and um, another voice that will be missed around our sport. But we will carry on and we will do this. Prideful in the memory of those that have left us too soon. Yes, and another shout out to Ralph Shaheen. I saw him last week in Nashville. He was doing PA. I was doing TV watching you race. Yes. And Ralph obviously also has a long history uh, with this event particularly. So shout out to, to Bob and to Mike and to Ralph Shaheen and to Lost Friends, as you mentioned there. Another uh, man who just loves the sport, Ralph Shaheen. Oh, I mean, he, he took... Both, a, both, he's like me, cars and bikes. Yes, <laughs> and he, and he, I, 100% because he, he took Chris Economaki's pre, you know, pride and joy, the National Speed Sport News, and he's carried on that tradition yeah. Ralph Shaheen has. So we all, to, that's a great debt of gratitude to him to keep that wonderful brand alive in our sport because National Speed Sport News was how we knew what's going on yeah. yeah and in england it was motorsport uh yes. news and yes. of course autosport uh, very much very much uh, that was what you, you looked for wednesday and thursdays to get your magazines yes, one was sir. a paper uh, and one was the magazine the autosport on a thursday it still continues it was going to be stopped at one point was autosport uh, as a magazine because modern day you can do it all online but they said no we want the paper version and they continue it so i love that I, I, I do national speed sport news i Same mean the, uh, my uncle mario my dad would tell you that they were a lot of the the reason they got the attention they got was because of what chris economaki and the way he put them out there so into the final minute of our session here this has been a been a good session session group 4a yeah i didn't get a lot of time on track no, unfortunately, unfortunately but we'll see them all, all again i'm sure you know the older the cars the tougher it is mechanically right as far as the that's what we were working towards you know racing started off as really that the endurance racing was to get these cars so that it could outlast a horse you know so that people when they were <laughs> a very good they, point. they wanted to go more miles than you could go on a horse and uh we didn't want the cars breaking down and being stuck on the side of the road and things like that so this is where a lot of the the endurance racing was there to prove manufacturers could prove the point say hey we won the 24 hours of Le Mans we won uh, you know this duration race a thousand kilometers at the Nürburgring we won these races your car can get you where you need to go and you've met the cynics as I have which is they'll say over a dinner over a glass of wine and you get introduced and you say you're in motor racing and they say well what's the point right. adrenaline junkies little boys racing that should grow up and do a real job and become a doctor or whatever and I say cynics yeah. but what people don't realize is the industry of motor racing is the reason why your SUV is safe. Yeah. 
Yes. From disc brakes to airbags to aerodynamics to fuel efficiency to everything you can think of. Motor racing is responsible. This is our research and development. I, it's, it's people forget that. I often say it. The, the only sport that if it disappeared tomorrow, your lives would drastically be di different. Different, yeah. Because the, the, like you said it best, the technology that we learned and the safety and everything like that has been brought directly to the consumer. And there's no other sport that does that for a direct consumer. It gives us entertainment, which we all love and we need. Yeah. But motorsports gives us the entertainment and it also gives us that daily, you know, makes our daily driver that much better. Check your flags out on the session and, Big thumbs up from the, our, our flag, our flag lady here, and giving the checker flag to the group. Beautiful day here in California. Slightly misty early on, but it's starting to clear, and you can see that gray haze of fog over the uh, Monterey Peninsula just starting to blow off. It generally blows off by lunchtime, latest, and we usually have some pretty nice sunsets here at the WeatherTech Raceway that is Laguna Seca. It's been through some changes over the last couple of years. But uh, the track itself has not changed. You were about to tell me the story about how this was, well, bef no, not, the, not the hairpin itself, but it, it did used to go straight on from here and yeah. then straight up the hill, right? Basically, yeah, it was like almost a square. It was like 1.9 mile circuit before they came into this insection and i always think of this as ducati island inside that that's where in the motorcycle grand prix or the world superbike grand prix ducati kind of create their own little island uh for for their uh, fans and their you know ducatisti now you may have heard the name dorsey schrader if you're an american motorsport fan well he is here as he always is ever present kev harris has found him Kev, down to you with the mighty Dorsey. So welcome back to the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion where I'm down here in the paddock with a legend from the world of motorsport, 1989 Trans Am champion, all-round gentleman racer, Dorsey Schroeder. Dorsey, here we are then, my friend. We're underway. It's day one of the 2021 event, and we've got off to a flyer. What a scene here. This is a remarkable accomplishment for all the people that put the time in to do it. You won't believe it when it gets to be Saturday. They, this place will be so absolutely packed full of people. You literally can't walk around. And the energy level is so fun. You know, it's a really good place. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And obviously, California sunshine bathing on a source. Fantastic. Uh, we were just chatting before. One of your race cars from days of old is here. But also this weekend for you, you're here in a working capacity. Tell us what you're getting up to. Yeah, I'm actually the competition director for the entire event for HSR on all their events. And um, I kind of oversee... I'm the principal, if you will. Yeah. You know, when boys behave badly, then they got to come see me, and I've got to do something with them. So, uh, and, and it's good because it's like taking the uh, taking the outlaw and making him the sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy. Now, listen, Dorsey, we just stood across the way uh, to our right here. Ford have got a fantastic display. 55 years uh, they're celebrating in Trans Am. We've got the original Mustang there, bookended. That you know all about. Yeah, I mean, it, it made my career, it made my life, really. I mean, when you think about it, when I got involved with Ford Motor Company back in 88 and started running uh, the Mustang, I became part of the Mustang family, which is a huge family indeed. Um, and it's it shaped my career. I spent a long, long time, and in, it fashioned uh, where I went in life. Yeah. And uh, if we just stand along here just to wait to our right, I think we've got a procession of GT cars there. Uh, and... Uh, with the latest uh, iteration, the GT Mark II race car. There, what do you make of that one? That's that's one. Some that should be in my driveway. Is what that should be. <laughs> it really should. That's the top end, obviously, of Ford Performance at the moment. But this is a historic event, and there's some wonderful cars here this weekend. And the great thing about this is there's owners and drivers who get to bring them around some iconic race circuits. Yeah, they do, and they get you bring cars that you will never ever see before. You know, there's uh, cars here that worth in the tens of millions of dollars, you know, and they're racing, they're running around Laguna Seca, and uh, and everybody could come and see and smell and experience it, that's that's what it's all about. Yeah, it's a really fantastic event for that, and uh, just name-checking where we are here at Laguna Seca, an iconic race circuit, you say that anywhere well, people know what it's all about, you've driven it, gives a sense of what a lap around here is like. Well, this is a really challenging racetrack from the aspect that we're down here in the bottom in a sandy area. You know, when the wind blows or when the car goes off, it's, it's sand that comes up on the track, which makes this infield the most slippery thing you've ever driven. 
So that's fun for a race car driver, you know, sliding around. That's what we do. And uh, But then you've got the elevation change. I think probably the corkscrew is what everybody thinks about when they think about Laguna Seca, where you go up the top of this mountain and literally fall off of it through a corkscrew, through a little S, and you're dropping at an incredible rate. You know, it's really fun. Yeah, it really is. And I was lucky enough to jump in the driver orientation with you yesterday. So we got a parade down through the corkscrew. And what people may not realize is that when you're heading up into it, you've got to trust your judgment because you can't really set up for it. Well, you have to set up for it before you get there. Well, you know, you're looking at the sky. You're looking at blue sky. You're headed straight up that big old mountain. And you can't see what's over the ridge. What's over the ridge, of course, is a really hard brake zone in the entrance to the bend that drops you down the hill. Car placement is really important, but you can't see. You know, so you have to know in your mind that I'm going to go right this way, and when I get up to the top, I'll be around right at the apex. And uh, But it's, it, it takes a few laps to get it right. Oh, I'm sure it does. As we stand here, Dorsey, as well, we're pretty early on day one of four here at Monterey. There's a lot going on. I mean, what in particular are you looking forward to seeing, or what part of the weekend are you going to really start getting yourself fired up and excited for? It always really peaks more or less on Saturday because a lot of people are going to go to Pebble Beach on Sunday for the Concours. That yeah. takes a lot of people away from here. So Saturday it'll be a full-on zoo. I mean, there's going to be so many people, and cars will be trying to move in and out through it all. Um, if we can get it all done safely with no drama, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, exactly. And there are some really iconic names from the world of motorsport here as well, from you know Ponelli Jones, George Fulmer, and many, many more. It's a great event where the fans can get up close and come and chat to you guys. I mean, I don't know how many times you're going to have your photo taken this weekend. People will see you and they'll be jumping in selfies these days on the old iPhone. Yeah, it's really neat, though, because you get to see people you haven't seen in quite a while. You know, there, people will come here from a spectator standpoint and uh, they'll come and see me. And that's a really neat deal. And you'll see fellow racers that we haven't been together in a while. And that always causes trouble. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, race car drivers, I'm sure. But the great thing is, as well, with an event like this, just giving a shout out to the whole organization of the thing. You know, you know all of these cars, you know all of the people, but there'll be spectators and people coming along who don't know the history of these cars, but they're going to be just treated to a real spectacle. It's a beautiful scene, even if you don't know the history of the cars. Yeah, I mean, it's a car show that's alive, you know. I mean, every one of these cars is going to fire up at some point and be out there on the racetrack. They're not just sitting here for the beauty of them. You know, they're going to go out and perform. And, uh, and the people that drove them back in the day will be here standing by, you know. So that's a very, very neat deal. It is a really big deal. What is quite incredible as well, like, you know, the owners, you, we're going up to these guys and chatting to them, and they're just reeling off the names of the, you know, the iconic people who drove them. And now it's privateers just getting to jump in these things. Yeah, there's some very, very powerful machinery here. I mean, there's no question. There's a, a whole slew of Formula One cars over there that a normal guy, you know, you can't just jump in a Formula One car and go drive them. You know, these guys had to go through some training, and they've had to work at it to get to be just enough to drive the car. Well, excitingly, thanks uh, there, Dorsey. Excitingly, next out on track is some Formula One cars. Should be 1966 to 1985, so if that's your era, uh, that's what Johnny and Adam will be talking to next. Lots to come down here from Monterey at the Rolex Motorsports reunion. Like I say, 14 different classes. We're just getting underway across what will be four great days. Dorsey, I'm sure you've got lots to be doing this morning, so we don't take up too much more of your time. I think we're going to, we can probably head back to the grid and have a little look and see what's going on out there. Some of those cars hopefully are going to be lining up right now. So I would hope that Johnny and Adam have been listening into this intently and uh, just getting excited about this next session as we are. So Adam and Johnny, are you there? What do you make of uh, Dorsey and the scene down here in the paddock? Well, it's always good to see that outlaw that has turned sheriff, because that's a great expression, because he is exactly that. In his heyday, he was absolutely the outlaw, a fantastic driver, but now he's in charge of, 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 of herding those cats. It's funny, you know, it's, uh, NASCAR always had the philosophy of you, you hire the biggest cheater to, to, run, to yeah. run your tech. So, you know, I guess HSR Can't is Can't get like, one by know, Dorsey, yeah, no way. Yeah, you're going to, it's, it's not, the, not, not on the cheating side, but he's definitely was one of the one of the toughest racers to be around and um so he knows when someone's driving dirty yep on purpose and when someone's just because he's mistake. done it <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I, I, hey i'll let you say that but yeah he's definitely been there well you can't that. kid a kid it <laughs> you can't you can't and this i oh. mean I mean, are you kidding me? We're going to watch Formula One cars roll out here. Well, Kev said, if this is your era, and I'm afraid yeah. I was born in 66, Kevin, yes, this is absolutely my era. 
because this is how I grew up as a little kid, earning and learning about motor racing. I was taken to Brands Hatch to see one very well-known Brian Redmond race against the likes of Rez, Red, Redmond and Hulm and many others. And uh, yes, uh, this was how I started following Formula One. And yes, your Uncle Mario in that JPS, I've still got the car at home on the mantelpiece in my little dinky toy. Love it. And yeah, this is my introduction very much. And if you grew up in Europe, um, you know, you, you recognize each and every one of these cars for different reasons. Um, oh, that Nicky Lauda car, absolutely. And of course, um, the first car that Mario drove for Lotus, I used to live near the Lotus factory uh, in um, Norfolk and in England. And so I know that very well. And of course, uh, you know, you start talking in the pub about Mario and uh, you could be there all day. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, I mean, you guys can't see us in the booth, but we, Johnny and I just had to stand up and watch every one of those cars pull out of the lane. Oh, yeah. It was such a, such a unique opportunity to, to be able to do that. Now, nothing sounds like this era of a Formula One car. The smell of the fuel that's coming into the into the commentary booth right now. And, and then, I mean, even then, I think it's the first time all day long we've seen cars actually roll out on sticker tires. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing some serious action out here. Uh, the first car that we saw out there was actually the 1980 Williams FW07, uh, Zach Brown. Uh, that was an Alan Jones World Championship Yeah, and uh, if, you were, if you had any question marks about whether Zach, Zach Brown could drive, you don't get in one of these cars, especially that belongs to Williams or whoever owns it. Absolutely. Um, but a 1980 Williams F07, FW7, excuse me. So you can see how far that goes back. That was an Alan Jones car, and of course he became world champion for Williams. And for those following, you know, Drive to Survive and have just come to Formula One and, and look at Williams as this pauper team at the back of the field, not so back in the heyday. Uh, that was a that was a Patrick Head, you oh, know, yeah. design car and yeah, it was definitely ahead of its time. They were taking advantage, you know, uh, just a couple of years before that, Colin Chapman introduced that with the Lotus 79 that my Uncle Mario won the world championship in, had just introduced uh, ground effects, you know, uh, based, an underwing to the car to suck the car to the ground. And uh, talk, about, talk about great designers and great uh, players. Ken Tyrrell, Tyrrell of Ken course. Tyrrell. Sadly, no longer with us in terms of the name and, of course, Ken himself. But uh, the Tyrrell name will go on and is synonymous. That blue color. Cal Mika driving this one, a 1979 Tyrrell. And those colors and that uh, logo and name synonymous with the early days. Ken Tyrrell definitely one of Bernie Eccleston's. Uh, well, well, Bernie Eccleston, before he became Bernie Eccleston, if you like, before he became the impresario of Formula One, he ran Brabham Formula One. And he and Ken Tyrrell and uh, McLaren, Ron Dennis, uh, would take over there. And, of course, before that, Bruce McLaren. But, of course, uh, yeah, the early Formula One cars. And for many years, Williams, McLaren, Tyrrell, Ferrari, of course, Williams. And those many of those names, obviously, still around. And even if, for example, Red Bull, you could take the names back all the way to Jaguar and so on and so forth. Each of these cars, well, this is where it all began. And we've got some Ferraris out there, which very much were the, um, you know, in the day in the 70s were the mark that to everybody looked to and were so famous in the hands of someone like Nicky Lauda uh, and many others. But uh, Nicky was obviously the most famous proponent. Yeah, I would say so. And uh, absolutely. We love the fact that the new owners of Williams have kept one of it's all about keeping the namesake of Williams uh, because of their history, right, throughout the sport. And like you just said, most of them, if you're new to Formula One, you don't realize that Red Bull was <laughs> yes. Jaguar. Well, back to Jaguar and, and, even and then Stewart and then, you know, yeah, further and, back. So, I mean, and, it's, when they, and, and when you look at uh, what Aston Martin is now, you can take you can take his heritage back to Jordan. Yes, yes, so, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, so I, I love the fact that, and that just shows the mark that Williams put on the sport that even when they went, you know, and they're now no longer under family ownership. This is our good friend, right? We spoke we Chris spoke Locke, with yeah. Chris Locke earlier and, and Kev did and he's and he was right. He's gonna get every inch of that mile an hour that he wants out of that car. And if I'm not mistaken, he's got a Mario helmet, right? He does. I, both of the guy both of the drivers that are driving 
cars that Mario drove. Because it's, uh, he also had the uh, 1975 Parnelli VPJ4, and that's being driven by John McKenna. That is also, he also has a period correct helmet with Mario's helmet on there. Let me riddle you this. I think much of what Mario's success was, was that he understood how Europeans ticked. So he came over as an American, but an American Italian. Oh, absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know he's driving for Colin Chapman here, but the, the mentality of racing in Europe, and many Americans have struggled with that over the years. Yeah. It's a different world, and I would say, I, I have to be careful here, but I I'm, I'm, I'm certainly know I'm right. Americans were, they were dubious yeah, about I mean, Americans. Yeah. Mario, though, they knew his heritage, and he seemed to fit like a glove immediately when he got to Europe. Absolutely, and, and it's, there's, over there, you know, they're, in Europe, the, the racing is, is, is much more aggressive. There's not as yeah. much give or take as you have over here. And in the U.S., it's much, there was much more give and take. Now, that has gone away. Like, I feel like everything is European-style racing, if you want to call that a style. But, uh, you know, everyone has that same kind of bitter, you know, that grip between their teeth aggression. You have to uh, to succeed in the sport. But absolutely, Mario had a hold of that. Mount Mario had a hold of that, I believe. Uh, I believe he, you're making a very good observation there. And, and also, you know, it was it was a pack. He had such... That was his goal. You know, yeah, his he, childhood yeah. goal was to be a Formula One world champion. And there's not too many Americans that grow up with the childhood goal because we have great racing over here. You know, we don't look at the global scale so much as Formula One. We have to get to Formula One because if you, if IndyCar is where you, is where you make your mark, you've had a pretty good, you've had a very good career. I mean, Scott Dixon, who I'm sure would have had great success in Formula One, He's not upset that he's a six-time oh, IndyCar champion. Oh, no, he's not. You know, no. He's not disappointed with where his life took him. So uh, I think that's why we don't see also, and I, that's an observation I've watched my Uncle Mario make, is I think that's why we don't see also Americans striving to get to Europe is because we have such good motorsport here in America. I think, you know, I've studied this a lot. I think it's got a lot to do with the, uh, the economics. And what I mean by that is life is good here. Yes. Uh, do you want to go to Europe and struggle and not, under, not understand the food and the language? And also, kind of the snobbery, to be honest, yeah, towards yeah. foreigners. And I don't mean that, but I'm, as an Englishman, I can say that because <laughs> I've seen it and I've lived here most of my life. Uh, but I get it. Yeah. Um, and I understand it. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with both American and European drivers around the world, both cars and bikes, and uh, it's true of both sports. You know, just made me think when we talked about... Um, That's the cool arrows to, there. Yeah, as well, I was about to say... Four. Arrows is another name that's gone. Ensign is a name that's gone. Shadow is a name that's no longer part of Formula One, as is Wolf. Lotus barely hangs on because, obviously, what now is the Renault team, again, looks back to its early days as the Lotus team, but no longer the name, sadly, involved in Formula One. And likewise, March. So these names, um, it's amazing to see McLaren, Williams, Ferrari, all still surviving when... The names I've just rattled off sadly don't yeah. exist anymore. Absolutely. And, and that's the cycle of our sport. That, that's that's motorsports at work, right? The strong survive. The strong are going to survive. And I, I'm not sitting there calling these other names you said weak. I'm just saying that as the sport evolved, it left without them. Yeah. And uh, and that just happens. And that's what the sport does. You know, it. it Look at that that's scheme. a really wild paint scheme, isn't it, on this car? Lovely. I love that. That tiger. The eye of the tiger. No question about it. And that's definitely long before flames were a thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're listening to the beautiful sights and sounds of Formula One here at the Monterey reunion. Uh, a really fantastic and eclectic group of cars and drivers, I may add, uh, from we heard earlier... Zach Brown in that Williams, and we also heard from Chris Locke, who is driving that 1976 Lotus 77 driven, of course, by Mario Andretti. Alan Jones drove that Williams we just mentioned. We're looking at, too, this is an era of Formula One where they sent people home. Yeah. You had to qualify for the races. That's yeah. right. You had to be fast enough. And, and this is not like if you're used to watching Formula One now... It, it, you know, it's 20 cars, and those 20 cars are going to be there every week. Where 
you would have a 50 car entry list and they were not gonna they weren't starting all 50 cars and I'll tell you what, the, the likes of the, the car we just saw there coming down, ooh, but a smoke a little rear lock-up, yeah, yeah, a little rear brake lock-up. But uh, Alan Jones, I was very...
Well, how about that? Those vintage F1 cars there out on the track looking and sounding as good as they absolutely are. But from some of the newer cars here this weekend to some of the oldest ones here now, how about this one? A 1924 Bugatti sitting behind me and the man that gets to look after it, David Wallace of the Phil Riley Company here. David, thanks for taking the time to talk oh, to us. Pleasure. As I just said, one of the oldest cars that we're going to be looking at or have done so far this morning. Give us the heads up on this. Oh, I got a 1924 Bugatti here. Uh, and it's original patina, trying yeah. to keep it uh, looking like an old car. The, the owner likes it to be dirty. We, we joke that we uh, use the used rags on it to keep it clean. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah straight eight, non-supercharged, carbureted, runs on methanol. So it's a pretty good racing car. Yeah, pretty good racing car, I'm sure it is, that you've been looking after for, did you say 20 years? Yeah, it's about 20, yeah. And it's, it's one of our, uh, we have a few that we take care of. Yeah. And uh, this one's been around about yeah, about 20 years. Yeah. You must know every inch of it. What does it take? I mean, 1924, so almost 100 years old, this car. And it's going to be run here at Laguna Sacra in 2021. What does it take to keep a car like this running just over and over and over? Uh, it's a lot of fussing, a lot of uh, detail work. Thing, it rattles loose all the time. You have to chase after all the bits and pieces and make sure it's not rattling itself apart, check the fluids. But uh, it's a very simple car in some ways. So it tells you when there's a problem. So that way it's a little rewarding, yes. And we've got cars from all different eras here, some F1 cars that have just been out. I think that was 66 to 85 roaring passes, deafening us down here in the paddock, I have to say. Uh, but is it these, you know, real vintage cars that is your passion oh yes absolutely they just they match up with my skill set and my interest i love the old stuff i, I love the mechanical uh, complexity of them and the, the old style of them it's, it's i really enjoy working on them yeah i'm sure they're a lot of fun and interesting as well folks you take a look at this car and when you're up close and personal to it it will blow your mind that you said to me uh david that the man that's going to be driving this he'll still be doing 100 miles an hour in it oh yeah yeah and, and he's uh trying his best it's uh little skinny tires and try you know sliding through the turns it's uh it's an exciting ride I'm sure it is, especially down the corkscrew. And I said to you, have you driven it? And you know what it's like to take it down the corkscrew here. G give us a sensation of what that's like. Oh, it's kind of like dropping off a cliff in some ways. I mean, it's a little car and it's open. So you kind of you take a look down there and just, it just catches and brings you around, though. It's actually, it's actually quite comfortable in a car that's meant to do it. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I'm sure it is a pleasure. And also, just as we look across along the way here, we'll just take a quick heads up uh, at the other cars that are down there. you got three or four cars here. We'll talk about those, then we'll talk about, you know, maybe getting started out as a mechanic or something. But tell us what you got uh, here. Oh, well, we got a 1934 ERA, uh, R6B to be specific, the dark blue. And then we got another ERA, uh, R2B uh, in the green. And they are supercharged straight six one and a half liter methanol burning cars with pre-selector gearboxes and they're quite quick they're uh yes <laughs> they're, they're the about the fastest cars here in the old car world yeah and there's and, and that's quite saying something there's quite a lot here david you've been uh, on the wrenches and the spanners for this for did you tell me 30 years 30, is that right yes. what about somebody starting out is there a way to get an apprenticeship you know doing the work that you do if you want to start getting involved in these cars well i mean it takes a combination of being really interested and uh, wanting to pursue a mechanical uh, passion so I started out as an apprentice and, yeah. and took a machine shop program. Yeah. And so it, that matched up with these cars really well. So uh, I would encourage anyone who can find a vocational school yeah. if you wanted to get started in this. If you have that, if you have the basis of that, the passion will drive you the rest of the way. It's uh, that simple. Yeah. And I think you said to me you've now effectively ended up working, at, working for your mentor. Yeah, yes, that's right. My instructor, uh, when, I was, when I left college... I worked in a few shops, but he hired me back. He okay. remembered me, yeah. and uh, I've been there for you know 30, 33 years at the shop, uh, working for my mentor. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And the great thing is, when you get involved in heritage motorsport like this, you get to come to beautiful settings like we are here in Monterey. And uh, it's a working weekend for you, but surely this must be a really enjoyable weekend. Oh, no. well, ha half of it is a social engagement. There's people here I've seen for years. And uh, it's like, hey, how are you doing? What are you working on? It's a real family here as well.
Great stuff. It certainly is a real family here, and my family are up in the commentary booth at the moment. That's Adam and Johnny, and we'll go back to them in a moment or two because, I mean, Adam, you're going to enjoy this next one. 1966 to 1972 Trans Am cars. The noise down here is deafening. Adam, I'm sure you got a favourite in amongst this next lot.
Well, thanks, guys. Another great session out there on the track, and the excitement down here in the paddock continues. Things are hotting up almost as much as the California sunshine, but I'm pleased to say, walking around, I've found a fellow Brit, and when it comes to the motorsport, well, the Brits came over the USA and perhaps invaded in the same way that the Beatles did, and you can't mention British motorsport racing without mentioning Lotus, and uh, I'm here with Chris Dinich, classic team Lotus manager, and Chris, we find ourselves at another heritage event, and it's, it's all going swimmingly. It's brilliant so far, isn't it? Living the dream. <laughs> and that seemed to have been doing that for nearly 40 years so uh, it's great to be here in California again we missed out last year because of the Covid restrictions but uh, yeah, we're back in town again with some with some lovely cars and uh, enjoying the sun yeah we really are and like you said you've been doing it for nearly 40 years we were just chatting you started out you know bottom rung on the ladder with this just as a, a mechanic now the team manager so you know every inch of these cars that are behind us here and I mean they're quite something the history kind of it needs no explaining but let's just start at the far end because we've got a car way back down there that's uh, quite something yeah, it's a uh, load of 78, so the 78 was the first ground effect car, yep. this is the second one we built, um, it was run, it was driven by Mario as well, um, and then Ronnie and uh, Gunnar Nielsen drove it, both, both winning races with it, uh, I think Ronnie won in South Africa, uh, and uh, Gunnar Nielsen won in the Belgian Grand Prix, and so it has a great history, it went into private hands for a couple of races with Hector Rebac, and then Imperial uh, had it mounted on the wall in the Bewley Museum where it sat for years and I think around four years ago it came off the wall and then Clive Chapman um, who's the CEO of Classic Team Loaders bought the car back from uh, Imperial Tobacco and we've uh, just restored it and got it working for Lee Mould to drive over here uh, uh, for this year's American races. The fantastic thing is, well, I used to do a lot of events at the Bewley National Motor Museum, so I've likely seen that car up on the wall, and here it is now back at a racetrack. What do you have to do to get a car like that back race ready so you can start putting it around a circuit again? Well, the whole thing came apart, down to the bare chassis. There were some repairs that we did to the, to the, to the modern cock as well, um, but then um, we, we overhauled everything. Um, the first race was in Watkins Glen, uh, where the car raced before in period as well, which was awesome. Uh, and we had a problem with a brake caliper leaking. You know, magnesium uh, has a habit of deteriorating over the years, okay. so that was the Achilles heel for the first day of practice. We were struggling to, to keep brake fluid in it. Yeah. Um, but once we've done that, she's, uh, she's behaved, behaved well, and we ran a Road America, and then uh, the pre-reunion, then the Rolex reunion this weekend. So we're, yeah, we're pleased to see it going around. Yeah, as I'm sure all the fans down here at Monterey will be this weekend as well. That's the first one you got, and then the next one just coming along here. A car that you know really well, because I believe it's the car that ran in the Grand Prix and you started working for Lotus the very next day. did indeed. It was Elio's first Grand Prix win in Austria, 82, and Colin Chapman's last victory as well that he witnessed. So it's a really significant car in the collection. Again, it belongs to Clive. Uh, Dan Collins is driving it. Dan's been a customer of ours for the last 19 years. Um, so, uh, yes, it's a, another really good history in, with the car and a Grand Prix winner. Yeah, and as, we, and as we stand here looking at the cars as well, it's effectively the second one in from the end, isn't it? So the, you know, the penthouse sponsorship, the number 11 is what we're talking about there. The number 11, yeah. And you'll see on the side there's two portholes, which the car became a turbo car the following year and had a Renault engine in it. Um, so we ran with Elio uh, with, with, uh, with that engine in the later half, or the second half of 1983. Yeah. And then, because of the significance of the car, we transferred it back into its 81, uh, sorry, its 1982 spec yeah. when Elio won the Grand Prix. That's brilliant. So, I mean, the, the history of these cars is just incredible. They're kind of here, there, and everywhere. And, and the great thing is they're now back on the racetrack, and you're putting them back in the in the kind of uh, condition they're in when they started out. And that's another thing as well. You know, you've got mechanics now working on these. These are some of the newer cars here. But the mechanics are putting these in tip-top condition, aren't they? Because you've now got dynos and equipment and monitoring. In many, many cases, the, the cars are, are represented better than they were in period. In period, they were racing cars. They had a purpose. The outside had to be shiny and for, the, for the sponsorship. But, you know, we, we were modifying them almost every day at the racetrack. So um, now, now the things are standardised and we've, we've got them to a condition where we're not forever adjusting, modifying or improving. We're not allowed to do that. Um, they, are, you know, they are presented in, in better condition, yeah. And just uh, talking about where we are here at the event, we were just chatting, you know, you're usually at the Monaco Historic and uh, I've been there, I think, three years ago. Uh, a lot of your guys chose not to go this year because obviously the issues with the coronavirus pandemic yeah. must be a real treat for them then at this event here in Monterey. Rolex Motorsports reunion is up and running and, and it just, you know, we're, we're, we're back in the game, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. and America's been really good. 
with their racing programs, probably a little better than Europe. Yeah. So we were able to come over for Watkins Glen and Road America, as I said, and, and to here. In the UK and in Europe, we've, we've had a lot of races planned, and then they've been postponed or either cancelled. Um, October's pretty busy because the ones who got postponed earlier in the year, so we have five weekends on a trot in Europe in October. It's going to be hectic. You'll be, you'll be disappointed to leave the California sunshine, won't it? I will. <laughs> I will. Just give, us, just give us your sense of the event here as well. We're on day one. It's the first morning. We've got four days of this. I mean, we're, we're lucky men being involved in something like this. But, you know, the guys at Rolex and, the, you know, the Historic Association have put this on. They've done a great job, haven't they? They have, again. You know, and I, I believe there's been some changes at the track as well. Um, so it's really good that Rolex have continued to support that because I think the, the whole management structure has changed here. The event hasn't, uh, fortunately. The same people, the same cars, the same atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere they create is really special because they don't give you lap times because they don't want people to race each other to, to the last tenth of a second. So that, that's a really good philosophy. And then at the end of the weekend, you get your lap times at the, uh, at the, for the last race. But it's a really good way to, 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 to take the competitive edge yeah. off the racing. Yeah. And, you know, these, these cars, a lot of the cars in this paddock yeah. um, are the real deal. Yeah. So their, their heritage, their values, everything is really important to preserve and not damage that. And the way the, the Rolex reunion works is, to, is really helps, helps that. Yeah, it really does. And I mean, what, what's really interesting as well, we're stood here by these cars, the names that you're really off, the Andretti's of this world. And, you know, uh, these are the guys, you know, they, they were tuned and they were trained and they've been doing it all their lives. So they can handle these machines. But now they're in private ownership. So some of the guys, guys jumping in uh, the hot seat and getting their hands on the steering wheel, they haven't had the background that those original drivers have had. No, they definitely haven't. But that doesn't stop them driving. The cars are there to be enjoyed. And in the main, um, people, uh, people behave and they drive accordingly to their ability and, yeah. uh, and everybody goes home with a smile. And that's the mission at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. You know, we're all lucky to be here, yeah. to be involved with these cars um, and the guys who drive them are you know, in a fortunate position where they can afford to do it. Yeah. And the main mission is that they go home having spent their money yeah. and enjoyed their weekends racing. Yeah, brilliant. Enjoy their ra weekends racing, they will. So, Chris, thank you ever so much. Don't run away. But... Uh, Thanks to you for watching us as well, wherever you are. Don't forget, 14 different classes uh, each and every day across the four days. We've got a couple more to go before lunch here. 1963 to 1978 Indy cars going out on the track next. And uh, I imagine Johnny will be quite looking forward to this one. Uh, he knows all things motorsport. So, Johnny, have you got a favourite up there in the commentary box?
some of the cars that we have. We'll try and get more information for you, but one car I'm familiar with is number 53 by Richard Morris. And that's the 1964 Huffaker NG liquid suspension special. That car was built by Joe Huffaker here in the Bay Area. Joe Huffaker is here. Uh, he had a shot at the PMC Motors on close to that S upstairs in the liquid suspension was copied off the little MG1100 sedan designed by Alec Isaganis. They used the principles of that liquid suspension and the front suspension of the car. That's number 53. Okay, here's the liquid suspension.
We need the cars for race group 8A, 1981 to 1991, IMSA, GTP, GTO, Trans Am, and Group C cars to the pre-grid. Cars in group 8A to the pre-grid now, please. Well, evidently the car at turn six has been retrieved. Uh, it's being pulled to it out of the way, so we need to clear the car at turn seven, and we can go back to practice. And turn seven will require a flatbed tow flatbed truck. Tow truck. So turn six is clear, turn seven they're working on. Another great day out here, Armando. It heats up, we got to remind people to stay hydrated. Drink plenty of water and Gatorade because that sun beats down on you before you're aware of it. Uh, you could have some serious health problems. So. Make sure and drink plenty of liquids, preferably water or Gatorade. Yeah, absolutely. And if you do have any medical needs, we invite medical needs, feel free to ask any of our volunteers and some of our ambassadors throughout the racetrack area and in the paddock, and they can direct you to where you need to go for any kind of medical attention. And uh, don't forget, while you're uh, cruising around the paddock, we really want to welcome you back. We're glad that you're here, and we want to remind you to... Um, Go ahead and check out the Raceway Store. It's the official place to get your weekend souvenir program, which is actually a gorgeous keepsake. And you can get a poster for the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion. The store will have many event raceway items for you and your friends. Uh, this is the official Raceway Store located in the paddock near Tire Bridge. You can also shop year-round online for that special tip at WeatherTechRaceway.com. And if you have any minor issues that require first aid, first aid is located in the three-story building right by square Bay. Thank you. 
spend a day at Indy 500 with him and his wife. One of the most glorious days I'll ever remember. I got Alan's as signature that day, and I and I spent the day with Bobby. Very cool. <laughs> and, and, and reunited with his brother Jerry after so many years, no doubt. Yes. So uh, there's uh, there's a lot of beauty in that, too. And Bobby led a but, you know, beautifully full life. And I mentioned that that sort of aggression stroke gentleman. He has all. He had all of that. Oh, as yeah. did Al. Oh, absolutely. And you, and like I said, it's something you learn. These guys are the most pleasant you can hang out with. You see it when they turn. When they turn to the racing side, they suddenly just have this look. The, the about red mist. The red. It's not so much, not so much a red mist. Yeah. It's, it's a sort of a side of them that, that not a lot of people get to see unless you're up there. Agreed. Agreed. You know, you, we, we see the media side. <laughs> My dad always used to call it the eye. The eye, yeah. yeah. He said he could see the racer's eye. Ah, look out. He's having a quick word with his mate. What do you reckon? Well, that must be the owner of the car. Oh, yeah, yeah. he's saying cut it out. It's yeah, getting hot. Yeah. yeah, that's what he's worried about. He's hopped out of his car to say, hey, listen, this doesn't run well in the heat. So he's cut it. Yeah, he's cut the engine. And now he's going back to his car. I mean, the other thing is preservation. You know, right. we talk about how we race the museums and all the rest of it, but preservation is also part of it. You do not want to blow one of these oh, engines or, for sure. or hurt the car in any way. For sure. And I, it's, it, and I apologize. I really thought with the with where we had the cars that this was going to be an easy tow-off and we would get back. So there must be something certainly, um, you know, something else that had actually happened there so they might they might one of those uh one of those incidents may well have dropped something as that's well. that's what i'm thinking too so i apologize to, to our audience at home 
be setting your expectations. But it looks like we're two minutes. We're two minutes away from rolling again and getting this session back underway. Good. Yeah, that's exactly what he's saying. He's just talking. There you go. Just to confirm, we haven't got a microphone on, but I can hear what he was saying. You hear it all the time. Uh, the if there's no air going into that radiator, they can't cool the engine. There's so no it fans. Just gets hotter. Yeah, there's no fans. Not like in your street car where you have a fan that'll cook on, kick on, and uh, and you know the once it, once the engine reaches a certain temperature to try and cool that water down that's getting through there. But these Indy cars, they, they rely on airflow. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because you know. You can attest to this. At Nashville last week, it was very hot there, and both the Indy cars and the Trans Am cars were, were, were of fear because you're not, re- you're not, you know, it's not 100% flat out all the way. And there you go. There's a overheater. Yeah, exactly what can happen. And I think he's going to pull out. Oh, yeah, I think he wants to get rolling so that they can. Yeah, either one get... or the other. Either, either get it out there. Yeah. Or take it home. <laughs> so where we go? Last couple of minutes for this session. This our Group Seven A. Classic indie cars in action today, including a man who is synonymous with racing here. Three-time winner here, Bobby Rahal. Son Graham now racing in IndyCar at this circuit later in the year. Yeah, they come here shortly. They do a little West Coast swing coming up. That's right. Good season, too. Very really good. good season. A real, a real good balance in IndyCar, modern, modern IndyCar today of the youngsters coming up and fighting the likes of Graham. And Joseph Newgarten uh, and many others uh, giving him a run for their money, and of course Scott Dixon still going. <laughs> oh, Scotty Dixon, man, he can't you can't slow that guy down. Leg end, uh, age won't even do it. He's uh, he's a fitness machine for one, and, and he's, his dedication to his craft is. I put it down enough. to his a, put. I put it down to his wife. When, yeah. when you marry an Olympic hurdler, you know you're you, you know you're going to be pushed. <laughs> yeah, it, it ain't no lie. Yeah, you're going to marry any <laughs> Olympic athlete, you know you're going to be taken to your limit. We're back on track with the Indy cars and get some action done here you're starting to hear the revs come up it's another great looking piece there that's, that's the, the mclaren that is the mclaren the, M- the m24 james skyers find the wheel of that up the hill approaching the cord screw i wonder if zach's going to add that to his collection i'd like i don't know if you know but zach brown's got a, a quite a collection of cars too he's done yeah he's he's he started uh, i believe when he when he sold jmi which um that may, you know, that increased him into a different tax break bracket, let's just say. And, uh, that's when I believe his car collection really started to take fire. And have you heard Have you heard about the bet? I don't know if I've heard about the bet. Well, when Daniel Ricciardo joined the team, Zach said, you get a podium, I'll let you drive Petty's, no, Petty's car in America. Oh, neat. And he said, you're kidding. And he goes, nope. So that is on. Oh, that's awesome. So. And Daniel Ricciardo is one of the biggest NASCAR fans. Oh, he, that's, the that's why, why he he's the number three. Oh. Well, that's why he's the number three, Dale yep. Earnhardt. Yep. So, so he, I mean, he it, wants to drive that car. <laughs> there's that no one else in Formula One that's running a number because yep. of a NASCAR driver. <laughs> yeah, that does make sense. <laughs> I can actually, I kid you not, I can see him having the chutzpah to go and do NASCAR. He would. I, I could see Daniel Ricciardo at some point in his career will drive a NASCAR. I, can I love that. I can 100% guarantee that because, first of all, he's made enough of a name for himself. If he wants the opportunity, he can. Before I before I would take that on, I would call a Mr. Uh, Juan Pablo and say, "How hard is it?" <laughs> super he'll hard. give you a good lesson. It's on super that. hard. <laughs> but at the same time, Johnny, the new next generation cars coming out. It's going to be paddle yeah, shift. It's going to be eighteen inch wheels. Yep. It's going to be center lock hubs. It's not going to be your NASCAR no, Cup car point. that it used to be. It's going to be more of a road racing car that someone like a Daniel Ricciardo. What all he has to do at that point is to learn the craft of oval racing. Which is a totally different craft and a totally different driving style to road racing. I could see Lewis, Sebastian Vettel, and maybe Ricardo. That would be interesting. A little bit of and Raikkonen's already done it. Yeah, Raikkonen's been here and gone back. Yep. Yeah. A bit of shake and bake for our international friends uh, on Formula One. I hope they come over. They're welcome to it. I remember talking to Boris, said, uh, who's raced everything pretty much, and he said, that, you know, there is nothing like being in the middle of a NASCAR field on an oval. When you're three wide, he said the skill, he said television belies the skill being involved. It's like you were talking about the hands earlier. You know, NASCAR, people, they don't get the credit for just how darn good they are. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, that's one of the most challenging sports, you know, in motorsport. It's, yeah. and, and it's like that for a reason. I mean, any top level needs to be that way. Uh, IndyCar is that way. Formula One 
you know, every one of those drivers in Formula One, that's why it comes down to the car, because every one of those drivers is a champion. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's why, you know, it's Romain, Gro- Romain Grosjean, an Indy car. It's been 10 years since he's won a, kinda, won a race, but he's a he's a great race driver. It's not that he, it, he's just been... Well, Marcus Ericsson, who's got two yeah. now on the, on the bands. Exactly. It's not because they, didn't, they, they forgot how to win races. Not on the bands, but yeah. It's just uh, in Formula One, it's so... so de- Equipment. So we got the checker flag. Slightly curtailed in the sixth session. For this session, session. Yep. Yeah, uh, not too many cars really took any any time there at the end. It was only like four cars, I think, out on track. But it gave us a little bit of action, and it gave us some. Again, this liquid suspension car here. This number. This number fifty three. Yeah, I want to go and have a have a look at that. I do want to get, get a closer look and ask a, ask a couple questions. We're gonna be here late. <laughs> yes. Wonderful shot. We're certainly enjoying this uh, this coverage here. Hopefully, all you folks at home are as well. We are having a blast uh, being here in person, calling it for you. And the they're getting ready to bring some IMSA cars out right now. Our next group is going to be IMSA, GTO, GTU, and Trans Am from the eight years of 1980 to 1991. So this is when we have a chance to see uh, some Lynn St. James vehicles, possibly mm-hmm. some uh, you know maybe some Dorsey Schrader. Uh, examples out there. Ernie Becker taking the checkered flag inside of the A.J. Watson Roadster. Well, as we take a pause and as we say, look forward to those that you just mentioned coming up. Let's head down once again to Kev Harris, who's down in the thick of it in the paddock. Well, thanks, chaps. I find myself down here in the paddock currently in Porsche heaven right now. Surely this is the best collection of Porsches that we've seen yet today, and maybe we'll see this whole weekend. And I'm pleased to say the two chaps that are looking after them from Club Sport down here, Phil Bagley and Bruce Ellsworth, uh, the gentleman who owned the company, have stood alongside me. Phil, I have to say this is the best collection of Porsches we've seen today. You guys do a great job. Thank you very much. They're all special, and uh, we have a lot of fun doing them, and we make a little money at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, and Bruce, you guys have been having fun and doing what you love for quite a few years now. I think you said you you got together with this business, was it 30 years ago? I think the uh, business officially started 30 years ago, but we've been doing this much longer. And humble beginnings as well, because uh, wrenches and spanners and tools, it was was how you met in a bike shop. Bicycles, folks. They went from bicycles to heritage race cars. Yeah, it was a a very unusual bike shop in that... Schwinn, the Chicago-based company, had opened this shop. It was a total concept Schwinn store. And Bruce and I both lived in the neighborhood. We both went to work there. We both became friends there. And uh, it went from there. We've been together 40-plus years. And you're doing a great job at it. As we uh, look here now, we're talking about Porsches then, all early Porsches, 356s and 911s, but you only focus on the early stuff. Yes. um, We... We don't really do a lot of street work. If you have a race car, we'll take care of your street car as well. But most of most of all of we do is race car prep yeah. and building, buying and selling as well. And Bruce, as far as the partnership is concerned, uh, Phil said you're the guy on the wrenches. You're the one that kind of does all the, the heavy lifting, as it were. So tell us what's going on with car 55 in front of us here and just what have you done to this? Because I have to say it is immaculate. Well, thank you very much, but uh, Frank bought this car and shipped it over from Europe, sent it to us, and uh, we kind of went through everything, made sure that the car was going to do what it's supposed to do, and this is the first outing with us. Um, He lives here in California and brought the car down to us, and it seems to be performing really well so far, so we're very happy with it. Yeah, and Phil, this is quite unique, this car, talking about all the aluminum that's here, and from the seats to the doors to the hood to everything. This, this car was a special order car, or a special wishes car, if you will, uh, from Porsche in 1962. A wealthy French sportsman ordered the car, and he was going to rally the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, the car, he ordered the car with aluminum panels, which it still has today. It has aluminum, what Porsche guys refer to as the GT seats. They're a speedster seat, but they're, they're made out of aluminum instead of steel. Okay. Uh, bumpers. Centers of the wheels are aluminum. It's a, it was a, a literally a purpose-built car for the Frenchman. It has a Super 90 motor, which was the largest displacement, more most horsepower pushrod motor yeah. of the era, and uh, it survived. I yeah. mean, we we did a lot to it, 
but it still had very good bones when we started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you what, guys, it's a credit to you because it's one of the best looking cars I've seen this morning. But the amazing thing is the guy that owns this one also owns the one that stood behind us, yes, the does. white one, the 88 car with the orange stripe down the roof. Tell us about this, a different proposition. Uh, this is a two liter 911. It's uh, a 1967 911S. Yeah. Frank this bought this car uh, with our help probably 30 years ago. Yeah. And uh, he uses it on a fairly regular basis. And you can see Frank takes very good care of his yeah. stuff. Um, but it's a two liter car and a vintage racer. Doesn't have a ton of past history like the ones behind it does, but um, it's, it's quite acceptable to a weekend like this. Yeah, really acceptable to a weekend like this. And just throwing back to the cars behind us, the 177, Bruce. I mean, that's, again, another different car there. Just uh, give us the heads up. Come in close here, Bruce. Just give us the heads up on the 177, the yellow one there. A lot more sponsorship going on that one. What's the story with that? All kinds of stuff on that car. Uh, so that was a Michael Kaiser car. That was the first car, I believe, that he really started racing with. A lot of people have been in that car over the years. And... Uh, the car was in a really major accident at Watkins Glen back in the day, and we got this car back a number of years ago and restored it and sold it to one of our clients, and he just he just loves this car. So, Well, guys, listen, I'm sure all your clients love their cars because you're clearly doing a great job on them, and one thing that I'm pleased to see, uh, your chef's getting the lunch on the go over there as well, so it's probably not far off that, and uh, just as we give you the heads up here, one more session out on the track before lunch here in Monterey, so let's go straight back to Johnny and Adam with uh, 1981 to 91 IMSA cars, GTP, GTO, Trans Am and Group C. Johnny, back to you. Thank you, Kev. Yeah, we're looking forward to this. We both just stood up bolt upright <laughs> because they roared past our commentary mission and shook the windows. And here we go. It is Group 8A out on track here at the Monterey Reunion 2021. Adam Andretti and Jonathan Green bringing you the action from a beautiful day here on the California coastline. It doesn't get any better than this, Adam, does it? Uh, I, I would beg to find out uh, if it does where, because <laughs> um, this is as good as it gets for me as we see uh, you know, the 63 car just go by, and that's a Mercury Capri by Keith Fraser. And, uh, it, what a great mix here. This is almost like, for me, this is back to my childhood. You yeah, got, you, and, you and Kevin been able to talk about your, you know, yeah, your yeah. guys' childhood. This was, my brother John was an IMSA. This was the era he was an IMSA. So this GTO cars and the GTP cars that I'm seeing here. And were you racing at the time or were you following him? I was what not. No, I was, I was too young. You know, this is, I was five, six, seven, so eight years old. You, oh, okay. So what, what would you do? you just go and spectate? We, and We went to the races, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so when John won the 24 Hours of Daytona in 1989, I was 10 years old. And back then, well, they still do where everyone loads on top of the cars. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to sit in the car. So I was sitting and John was shifting in between my legs. Ha, I love it. Looking at the Chevrolet Camaro for green and white. George Crass at the wheel. And just behind him is the number eight. And that's the Proto Fab Z28. Ah, Proto Fab. Well, you know the builders of that car. That would have been our Jimmy Frazier. Uh, Jimmy Frazier, which uh, recent Trans Am history with Gar Robinson and, yeah. and Mike Skeen. As, as, Good old Texan. Yep, yep. Oh, no, he's Michi He's a Michigan boy. Oh, Gar. Yeah, he's a Michigan boy. Gar, well, Gar's, Gar's a Texas oh, boy. Right, but, sorry, but, yeah. uh, but Jimmy Frazier, who oh, would have right, been yeah. one of the builders on that Proto Fab car, is, uh, is actually out of Michigan. So what strikes your eye? We've got a real hodgepodge of different cars. Well, it's Mercury, Chevrolet, Nissan, Buick. I haven't seen, I didn't see Crash a drive Ford. by us to hit the track, but, uh, you know, the Repsol 962 I did see. That, that's, that's a very yes. interesting car, um, for my, you know, for my childhood. Just pulling out right now in that Lancia Martini, the LC2. Yeah, he's, and I mean, he's busy in a lot of great cars. Look yeah, at that yeah, one. That is a cracker. I do remember that car in its heyday. So I was I was only five years old when that car was making its laps. But the 962s I remember so so well. Such a rich part of my childhood, and and these uh, these AAR Toyotas, the Amer All American Racer Toyotas. 
uh, which I have not seen either of those go by me yet on pit road, but I remember those cars uh, definitely coming in and just absolutely turning the sport upside down and dominating. The number 63, Mercury Capri there, Keith Frazier again, making his laps, coming here back onto the front straightaway. There's that 962 Repsol I was talking about. Right yeah, behind, behind yeah. yeah, right behind that other Mercury Capri. Yeah, some of these, uh, the sports car IMSA versions, I remember a lot of these same colors and so on. I started going to Le Mans in the, in the mid 80s. Yeah. And these were the sorts of cars you'd see and, yeah, strong memories. Oh. Tom Dooley there making laps in that. I mean, I, again, it's like taking a time machine. I remember watching that thing, flames shooting out of the side of it at Watkins Glen in the six hour. Really good memories. Very, very good memories. Bill Ockland in the 33, currently in fifth, another uh, long time veteran driver. I, I tell you what, there's a lot of cars here already and it's only Thursday and I'm talking about in the car park just up on the hill there. There's another distinctive car, the 101. That's another Porsche 962, the purple and white going up the hill. Oh yeah, the Cannon car. Yeah, that's a, that's a classic car. Boy, he's just cutting through the traffic. There's certain cars that, you, that look fast, mm -hmm. and that, the, the, this, the sports cars of this era from Porsche look fast, don't they? Oh yeah, those, that 962. We have a, a poster in the garage at our house. It's, uh, it's zero, it's all about their victories, right? It was, I yeah. think, zero to 60 in 3.2 years <laughs> is what they had it, and it was all the wins of the 962, or 4.6 years, I forget what it was. But now, it's, for some reason, Zach Brown is going rather slow in that Lancia Martini LC2. Yeah, they have they have the uh, the slow car flag, that white flag that they put out there. Stationary white flag means that there is either an emergency vehicle out on course or a slow moving uh, competitor out on course. Yeah, I mentioned Bill Offlin. Well, there he is in the all orange 33, just diving into the Andretti hairpin. Of that pack. Yeah, Jay Brook in that blue and white. And like I said, this is their first chance to sort of brush the dust off the previous event. And like I said earlier, these cars will race uh, probably 10 to 15 different historic races per year. Some of them. It's, it's like, a, you know, this this is a full deal for for these people. It's a full schedule. It's a real job for for these mechanics. And the number 61 there, that's a Buick uh, Somerset. That's Mike McNamee in it. A Buick Somerset. Yeah, that would have been, I believe, a GTU car back then yeah. in that class. This last black car going up the uh -huh, hill there yeah. just had a shot. The Olivetti livery car. Up the Ray Hall straight and down the corkscrew. That's a great endurance racing shot too at night when you get that. Oh, yeah. But the headlights and the glowing headlights brakes through, coming yeah. down, absolutely just for sure one of the treats that our sport gives us. Pontiac Fiber there, the teal blue. Ken Epson behind the wheel of that, putting it through its paces, no doubt. You got, I tell you, when you're a GT car driving around a, a GTP car, you got to feel like a hero, don't you? <laughs> yeah, kind of. The Lancia seems to be up to speed now, clicking off definitely triple digits here across the start finish line with Zach behind the wheel. Yeah, he's up to speed now. That might have been just getting temperature in it, yeah, the yeah, way that they rolled point. out. Yep, yep. I saw a nice Twitter of them preparing all the cars for Zach this weekend. Getting ready and excited. There's a GT, another GTU car, the two by uh, Philip Mendelovitz. So you're watching Group 8A at the moment. This is from 81 to 91. 
interesting era, certainly uh, Ipsa at the height of its powers. GTO, GTP and Trans Am all involved in this group. Big group and quite a, a lot of history here to, to look at. Rash Ford and it's a Mustang. Steven Schuler behind the wheel there. Been here, I think, but it's turn five, going up the hill towards the court screw up the Ray Hall straight. The most famous piece of real estate in all the motorsports right there. Yeah, pretty right much. up that hill. Yeah, but you don't become as famous if you go straight on there. No, You no. become e e infamous. They may rename it. Yeah. They may, re may rename that straight after you at that one. Uh-huh. And I've seen many a, get it, many a car get it wrong, including Trans Am. Yeah, it's it, it's a really easy one to to click wrong, and you know we saw it this year. And yeah, in, we had a good battle, and it went all horribly wrong, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, the Trans Am race it went really badly wrong up there. That was actually what ended up putting the end of the TA race itself was that was the collision that happened up on top of the hill. Well, Zach Brown is in. Yeah, they're all kind of... Yeah, they're all kind of trickling in here. Trickling in. I'm not sure whether they're curtailing the session, but there's still nine minutes on the board. But uh, well, we'll find out. But something's awry because they've all come in, not just a couple. Well, the marshal's checking us yeah, out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes in these uh, vintage deals, if you run off track at all, if you drop a wheel anywhere... They're going to pull you in just to make sure everything's okay. So the, I, I do believe that Keith was brought in in that Mercury Capri. He might have dropped just a wheel somewhere. Marshall's called it in. So that looked like just one of those checkovers just to make sure that everything was okay. You know, sometimes they, they'll take a look in your eyes and make sure you're not dehydrated because the eyes will tell you the story. And if yeah, they yeah. see that you're not looking right, you know, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll give you a little bit of a litmus test there at that point. If, you fail that, they'll just pull you out of the car and let you take a break and take a drink of water. But everything seemed to be fine there, and he's back out on track. And we continue to look at the number eight, that uh, Proto Fab we mentioned, that Z28. Such a... And then we get into another Mercury there in the 61. Oh, that's a Buick, excuse me. That's that that uh, Buick Somerset. So that's a car I've, I'm un completely unfamiliar with. I know absolutely nothing about. Well, all will be revealed as the weekend goes on. It is something I'm definitely going to have to go educate myself on at some point. I love the look of it. It's got a great look. I was always a big fan of the Buick brand. Why so? Huh? Why? You know, it was um, when I was growing up. You know, they they had a pretty good uh, they had a pretty good presence in motorsports. Yeah. You know, um, you know, between Buick and Oldsmobile, honestly. And uh, so as when it came down to GM products, I, I kind of gravitated more towards those. Because everyone was like the Chevy person or the yeah, Corvette yeah, yeah. person. Sure. But uh, towards the other, if it was, you know, like if it was a, on the Ford side, I liked, a, you know, I liked the Mercury's better than I liked the, the Ford product. So I don't know if it was just my, my own little weirdness that I had. but um, But I know for... When it when it came down to the Buicks, for whatever reason, you know the the it always fascinated me with the Buick IndyCar engine too. You know they had the V6 when everyone else was V8s, and they did a pushrod design when everyone else was overhead cam, right. and, and they made more power, but they were unreliable. And uh, so I was just always fascinated with their philosophies on how they did things, and I still think they make great vehicles to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I only asked the question because, as you say, they're not known as the cool cars, no, they're not. are they? No, no, they're, and, and I'm sure people are people are probably shaking their head at me. <laughs> you know, like, what is he talking about, boy? But uh, it's just, you know, one hey, of those crazy little personal car preference lovers Car lovers are car lovers. Yeah. You know, it, it takes all sorts. I'm not saying I'm some fanatic, crazy person about a Buick, but I'm saying that uh, they hold a special place for me, for sure. So just over six minutes left in the session, a little bit of a gaggle here coming down the court screw. That can happen. That's where things tend to want to bottle up on you. High and wide down, rainy curve. Down into turn 10. 140 miles an hour here at the bridge. Yeah. And then into the famous last corner here, turn 11. A very tight left-hander. Almost eggs you into taking it faster than you should 
But if you do that, you'll exit back onto the dirt, won't you? <laughs> yeah, there's a good chance of it. There's a really good chance of it. That's a yellow and black Camaro. It's a 91 Chevrolet Camaro. That's Bill Arkelin in that. Yep. Bill, another one of those uh, long-time drivers in historics, does SVRA, does a lot, lot of the big events. So this is what's amazing to me is when cars were fire-breathing engines, we had batteries as, as our sponsor. Yeah. And now we have battery technology in Formula E, and I don't see batteries anywhere near sponsorship. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> There's going to be a day here at these at these you know historic reunion events that it's there's going to be electric cars in the history you sure. know electric or you know with Formula E and and uh, you know some of that other stuff that we see coming along and that's going to be interesting to see and you know we're not too long from where some of the hybrid technology that we've seen not too long ago is going to be considered historic race cars yeah and it won't be long before one of Elon Musk's earlier iterations is a classic car exactly exactly right crazy to think that, it's isn't it? It's wild, isn't it? But I have to say, the days of combustion, everybody says I'm numbered, you see the headlines, oh, the days of combustion, and Ford are doing this, and they've got the new Mustang-y, and all that sort of stuff. Fine. I, I, I get it. But that doesn't to change racing. No. No. I, I really don't think so. No, it, I really don't think It's going to be here so. for a long time, and I think of an event like this weekend proves it. And, yeah, I agree. And I think that we're going to find, you know, alternative fuels. I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg, you know. And, you know, anyone who's a fan of the technology and thinks that, you know, that EV technology is our be-all, end-all, I mean, that that's that's really kind of narrow in your view. I think there's so much potential with alternative fuel sources. And, uh, yeah, I was going to say electric's been the buzz, so to speak. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Could be a pun, but uh, you know, there's, there's <laughs> other fuel types. Uh, you know, whether it be hydrogen, whether it be yet, there's all sorts of. We don't know where we're going yet. No, we don't. And, and there's brilliant minds that yeah. walk this planet every day. That and that's what's well, that's what I love about my fellow human beings is no one settles for what we have. We well, always want something. Uh, like better. I said, yeah, what I said at the beginning of the day, how creative these guys were, these pioneers back in the 50s and 60s. Well, that hasn't changed, and it's still as strong today as it ever has been. Absolutely. And so these guys will work to find out a lighter fuel, uh, a way of doing things that uh, don't require a heavy lithium battery, for example, or you know, uh, or a combination, a hybrid, um, that will work. And you only have to go to Le Mans once to realize how many different bits of technology are being experimented. Well, um, and, and I can't, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and speak to it like I'm sitting in a dark room and know the secrets, all the dirty, dark secrets of a manufacturer. But if I were to speculate, I would go ahead and tell you that the manufacturers are telling us one thing and definitely doing another. Yeah. And what I'm saying by that is, yeah, we're 100% dedicated to EV. But I promise you there's a skunk works of each one of these manufacturers that they haven't given up on sure. on internal combustion technology. They haven't given up on alternative fuel sources. But they have to step up to the game of EV technology because, like you said, and no pun intended, that's where the buzz is. That's where um, there's a whole generation that's looking to that as a solution. There's a whole group of people that are excited about it. And there's a lot to be excited about on the electric Somebody side. Somebody tried to argue with me that my love of motor racing and my love of the car would die when autonomous vehicles came in, right? And I said, no, <laughs> absolutely not. I said, yeah, I'll take the autonomous Uber to yeah. work and read the paper. I said, but in the afternoon when I'm done with work, I'll take my Porsche 911 and play Dodgems yeah. around them because I'll be enjoying the fact that they're going at a constant speed. They're not going to hit me because they're programmed that way. Then I'm going to have a lovely time. That's like that's like saying <laughs> taking auto, that's like saying inventing autopilot took the excitement out of flying a plane. Correct. You know, I mean, I, there's still a lot of people that want to go fly an airplane, and it's that's not a because good to learn an autopilot. Like it. It's um, it's the joy of it, of course. Is there going to be benefits to the autonomous world? Yes, absolutely there is. Like you said, being able to read the paper on the way to work, for sure. Okay. You know, taking a nap on a long road trip instead of losing time or, or sure. taking risk on the side of the road. Yeah, for sure. I bet you'd like your RV to be autonomous. Wouldn't that be, be, wouldn't that be a thing? You just, I, would, I would never wake up. But, um, you know, we got the 14 car here in the pit. Yeah. 962. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a Bruce Canepa car. Yep. Checking the pressures. Yep, yeah, and sure enough, Bruce on the side there. Good looking car. I think he's getting out. I believe you're right. Those were hot cars back in the day, I tell you. 
you roasted in those cars. Yeah, I'll bet. It was not about airflow. It was not about what we can do for you as a driver. And also, you, you're in that cockpit. I mean, the noise must be sensational. It is loud in there. You know, I mean, good thing is it's a rear engine car, so the noise moves away from you. Sure, but, but even still. so. Wow, it is getting slippery onto this straightaway. Did you see that, yeah, Jonathan? Yeah. yeah. It's warming up. Absolutely. That Proto Fabs E28 with Rick Jeffrey behind the wheel was making it happen there for sure. So the clock ticks down on what has been a scintillating morning of Group A cars. We'll have Group B cars out later here at Laguna Seca. It's part of the Monterey reunion. And we are looking forward to a big weekend of historic racing. Expecting good crowds here as always. And there's a lot to see too. We're celebrating Ford, we're celebrating Indy, we're celebrating Trans Am, and all American racing. And our guests of honor, Parnelli Jones and George Former, who can pretty much put their names of being the pioneers of California racing, without a doubt. Oh, we got checker flag out for our final session of the morning here. This uh, this final group A here. This is group 8A. This is it for there. Getting there. I'm sure their chefs have their lunches ready back at the trucks. Well, I heard Kev make mention of that in his previous <laughs> interview, so I think he was eyeing up a, a place to go and get some lunch. Great and hospitality it, here. Uh, it, it, so as you can see, check flag is out, and the roar of those beautiful IMSA and GTO, GTPs, and Trans Am will now head back into the paddock, and that's where we're going because that's where Kev is. Kev, what's going on down in the paddock? Well, I tell you what, Johnny, down here in the paddock, things have really taken a turn for something special because behind me as well, one of the largest collection of Lamborghinis that I've ever seen, that probably you've ever seen anywhere in the world, and the two gentlemen responsible for it have stood to my right. And I'll come straight away to John Tamerian, founder, founder of Curated. You have quite literally curated this selection of Lamborghinis. Well, firstly, congratulations and tell us what's going on. Thank you very much, sir. It's the 50th anniversary of the Lamborghini Countach. And two years ago, we decided to reach out to all of our collectors, guys that we've sold cars to are just passionate owners, and try to put together the largest organization of Countaches and a few Diablos rallying through California and joining you guys here. Does it get any better than that? Lamborghinis rallying through California. I want to be involved in this. It does take a lot of organization, though. One man who's responsible for that is uh, Trevor Johnson. Trevor, you described yourself as like the wedding planner for all of this, but what an event. Yeah, thank you very much. We, uh, we were fortunate enough to be here in 2019 with the 100 Years of Bentley Rally. John and I were so gratefully to meet John, and uh, what happened was is we got together, and he says, you know what, we should do the 50 Years of Lamborghini Countach Rally, and to get from there to here is just uh, an incredible journey, and I couldn't be more grateful for the guy, so oh, it's awesome. Yeah, it certainly is awesome, but I mean, you've got history with these cars. You said to me just a moment or two ago, I said, how long have you been involved with Lamborghini? So my dad was a mechanic. I was polishing these things when I was a kid. He was putting <laughs> me to work on them. I mean, that's a, that's a great Saturday job, if you don't mind me saying, sir. So it was Saturdays and summers, <laughs> any day after school. <laughs> Uh, my father was the authorized service for Lamborghini in the 80s and early 90s. So I grew up around many of these cars, Countaches and Diablo. It's been in my blood from day one. And, and what an icon of the 80s these cars are. I mean, there's, there's nothing more 80s than one of those. It's Miami Vice all over, isn't it? I think these cars have become so important to the future of supercars. They were bold. They were outrageous. And I think they've inspired a generation today. And I think they're that much cooler as we look back in time than they were even then. Yeah, I would say they are. And I tell you what, it's starting to feel old on this one now that these cars actually fit in perfectly at a heritage event. Th this is old machinery now, but it still looks great. Yes, and it's timeless. I, I think that it's one of the most important designs, one of the most important cars, and it's an honor to hear to be here today to be celebrating with, with so many. Yeah, it certainly is. And Trevor, lots going on. We've managed to sort of like move the crowds away from you, but all the guys that own these have been, you know, wanting your attention for the last sort of five or six minutes since you showed up. Firstly, what's going on today? Because I understand they're going to get out on the track. Is that right? 
Yeah, we're gonna do. Uh, we'll be on the track for about 15 minutes, and uh, we're gonna do you know, a parade lap. I asked John if we can go a little bit faster. He said no. It's probably best if we just kind of do a nice parade lap. But uh, I can't thank uh, WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca for having us here. This is the second time we've been invited back. Obviously, with the 100 years of Bentley, and now with Lamborghini. Uh, I just I'm really excited about it and can't thank them enough. Oh yeah, and they've done a fantastic job. I mean, the setting here. I mean, we're stood in front of the Rolex uh, hospitality booth, uh, Johnny. I hope for you going to get yourself in there and get some lunch as well at some point? I, I, I hope I can at some point, but there's a lot of attention when you're managing almost 30 vintage Lamborghinis. If I was to throw this to you, and you might know it because of the value of these things, if you could put if you could put a price tag on what's parked up behind us, care to guess? So I would say about 15 to $20 million. 15 to $20 million stood behind us. I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up right there as we uh, have a little... Well, whatever that is, a hybrid car just driving by, a completely different thing. But, chaps, listen, thank you ever so much. You've got to organize all these guys, get them out on the track for their parade laps. Stay safe, have fun, be careful. Thank you. And for you guys watching us wherever you are in the world right now, well, we've earned a lunch and maybe you have too. So don't go anywhere because we'll be coming back from the Rolex Monterey Motorsports reunion at about 1.30, and we do hope you can join us then. See ya. My name is Nancy. I'm a patient with relapsing polychondritis, or RP. RP is an autoimmune disease that attacks cartilage and, if untreated, can be fatal. To drive awareness and accelerate research, we established the race for RP. Success on the track has opened doors to world-class healthcare providers, researchers, and autoimmune disease experts, leading to groundbreaking discoveries and new hope. We are driving awareness and accelerating research in the race for RP.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion. I'm Jonathan Green, and alongside me, it's Double A, Adam Andretti. And uh, we are, well, we've enjoyed a great morning, and we're looking forward to a great afternoon of completely different cars than we've seen. So if you were with us this morning, uh, you're in for a completely new set of cars for your delegation, and we are looking forward to what's above. Uh, next group is 1B, Adam, 1955 to 64 GTs. Yeah, it was such an exciting morning with the Group A's runs. Uh, it's fun to get back into it this afternoon with some more action here with the Group B runners here. What a better way to start off with this, like you said, the 1955-1964 GT cars. You know, we got a few Austin Healy's in there, some names, you know, like... Uh, it just don't get to see a lot of these, right? They're obviously the Porsches and the Triumphs, but we've got a Volvo P1800 in there from yeah. from 1961. Uh, you know, a couple of MGs in there, a couple of Alfa Romeos. So this ought to be a pretty eclectic group to go out and watch and, and again, just see some artwork in motion. Yeah, two cars I spotted in this group, the Morgan Plus 4 from 58, and as you say, that Volvo, I have not seen a Volvo that old. 61, that is, as we look at that Porsche up Bath, the number 50 of that's the roadster actually 1960 well, there's an austin about. healy there ah uh, uh, 3000 i fell PM in seven. love with this car and you'll know that the you'll know the song it's tears for fears you remember everybody wants to rule the world and he had that 1953 oh, yeah. silver metal blue austin healy and he went off into the sunset and i was like that's the one here's what's coming up uh, we start with Group 1B. We're going through all the B sections, but we start with GT cars, as I mentioned, from 55 to 64. And then we go with GT cars under 2,500 cc, uh, and that's 61 to 66. We then go to a really early and interesting group, which is 1920 to 1951. And yes, we do have some early 1920s cars. We were just looking at them. And that'll be followed by the ragtime races, and that's similar fair, yes. if you will, uh, and they are a popular uh, add to any historic events, the Ragtime Races. We'll tell you more about them when they come up, and then we move to the FIA Manufacturers Championship 5B, and finally, a Masters Endurance Legends. You were looking at this, you kind of like, quite interested in seeing what that might be. Yeah, it's going to be more of our, you know, more recent cars, our more late model cars, um, you know, probably since 90. Well, for, they say from 1983 till up to the modern era, or pretty close to the modern era. So um, it, it certainly is about everything from my lifetime. I think we'll see a couple of examples of our uh, of some of the things that my family has driven in the past. My sure. Uncle Mario, my cousin Michael, some more of those out there. So, again, it's uh, for me in the booth here, it's a wonderful trip down memory lane in so many ways and, and really certainly enjoying everything that uh, WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca has to offer in these Monterey Rolex reunion historic it's this fantastic event yeah and I feel in some ways with COVID with the change of management here and just you know just a, 
HSR now involved in this. I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a, not a restart, but a, a new era for both this event and for the world of historic racing. Uh, because we, like everybody else, have been locked down. Historics didn't run last year, nor did this event. And so, um, you know, it's nice to sort of put a new fresh coat of paint on an event, um, so to speak. Uh, it's our first time at doing this event. I've done a few with SVRA as well. Uh, but delighted to be here and delighted to be part of it and learning, learning. It's all about a sponge, about the um, the history of American racing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, we went down and, and you know, yeah. there at lunchtime when we learned so much. I mean... You know, there was just, uh, and you don't even have to, that's the beauty of it. If you can't get a hold of someone who owns the car or been working on the car, they have banners up. They have information on all these cars all around the paddock to let you know uh, what it is exactly you're looking at. What makes it special? What makes it historic? You know, what what drivers drove it? What kind of success did it have or did it not have success? Was it one of those cars that got famous because it, it didn't live up to its expectations? So that's what's so fascinating about just walking around that paddock it's just seeing everything different yeah i suppose it's a very good point you know it, it you don't have to be every car doesn't have to be a winning car there is a lot of failures and i say failures but there's a lot of cars that didn't get designed that worked to their perfect you know fruition of winning every championship and that's part of what this is all about i mentioned the creativity of the designers back in the day and that's a big part of what this is all about is to see what people tried they weren't afraid to try stuff no, absolutely not. No, you're absolutely right. They weren't afraid to try stuff. It was uh, it was all about innovation back then. They didn't have any simulation programs. They didn't have anything that could, you know, sit there and say, yeah, this this should work or it should get you close. It was all theories. You know, it was all, you know, a group of friends sitting around, sometimes maybe over or whatever, and, <laughs> and deciding what, you know, or, or coming up with a, a great concept, number 49. Who there. wouldn't want to drive that? The what a Carrera. pretty little car. That is the Arbath Carrera, the silver and orange nose cone, as you can see, from 1961. Before my time, but beautiful. I believe only 10 of those were ever made, and three of them are here. That's wild. Yeah, only 10 of those were ever made, and three of them are here. I believe I heard something about that the other day with Rancid Webster at the wheel of that, and like you said, who wouldn't want that opportunity? Between the first two, that Austin Healy, yeah. Oh, I'd, I'd happily have a hot Austin Healy. <laughs> yeah, the inner James Bond in you. Yeah. will come right out. Yep. Well, talking of unique, it uh, doesn't get any better than the corkscrew. And I know people are tuning in around the world on our live stream. We welcome you. Uh, whatever time of the day it is in Japan, from Auckland, New Zealand, and to Australia, uh, we welcome you to uh, Monterey and to this motorsports reunion brought to you by Rolex. And very excited to be here as they come out of the last turn, the famous last turn here at Laguna and onto that main straight and roar past our commentary position rattling our plastic windows but we <laughs> love it and you can see the little miles per hour just under 100 miles an hour and they're only just warming up and that is a nice little shot of the number 17 that's uh, the Alfa Romeo Giulietta now that if you know your Alfa Romeo you'll know there is a Giulietta currently but that was the original a 1300 spin Veloce Beautiful little thing, isn't that it lovely? It is such a great little car, isn't it? I bet that's a fun car just to, just to throw around this track here. You know, I mean, I can only imagine. I used to come here with World Superbikes, and Alfa Romeo had the pace car or safety car contract. I think they still do. And uh, we got to see all the latest Alfa Romeos. And I bet they would love to have got this old number 19 out there. As their pace car. No kidding. That would have been such a... That would have been totally <laughs> special for them to have something like that pace them. So that was a, a little Porsche Speedster there, too. The 356 Speedster with Steve Schmidt behind the wheel. I would have got a little bit of... Oh, the exhaust looked like it was hanging out, but I think that might have just been the angle that we got the camera shot yeah, on Yeah, maybe, there. yeah. Yeah. Got a couple of drones in the air as well to give you the nice aerial shots. I love to see tracks like this now. I mean, you, you know, you and I have been watching motor racing forever, uh, or at least for 25 years now. And 
the drones are giving us a completely different perspective, both on racing and of how to look at tracks. And you, as somebody that coaches, I would have thought it's interesting to see it from these angles. Absolutely. There's even been times in private coaching where we've launched, uh, we've sent drones up to yeah. get us a get us a different view of what we're looking at there. And um, you know, it does it does give you an idea of if they're offline or where you can help them out or breaking too early or something along those lines as well. Number 50, Porsche Roadster. That silver Porsche Roadster there with Tyler Hagen behind the wheel. It's fun to watch these two go at it. And then number 19 as well. It's another Porsche 356 Speedster there. What amazes me about this historic racing is the depth of the field. I mean, we've got, what, plus 20 cars in this group alone. And every group is, I mean, bar the Indy Classics, which, you know, is rare, rare, rare stuff because they're so... Uh, sought after and not often run because there's not a pl lot of places to run them but I'm always amazed at the depth of the field we've got over 400 cars racing this weekend think I, about that yeah <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable no it, it truly is and and I think a lot of the reason why you see like the Formula 1 stuff survive better or gets used out here more than like a, an Indy car is Indy cars are so much privateers yeah and, and so, you know Lotus for example Kev was down there they have I mean, they have their historic division that takes care of the historic cars that, that Lotus put out there racing. And that's just something that, that IndyCar never had. You had to have someone that really took a special interest in those cars when they were retired and said, I want to keep this car alive. And uh, most of the time, those were museums. And, and, you know, as we know here, if you're not a privateer owner, if you're a museum owner and those are your pieces, you're probably not wanting to take them out on a racetrack and get them out here like these privateers do. So that's why we are so grateful and so gracious to the people that bring these vehicles out and run them because it's not, there's a lot of cars parked in museums uh, all around this great world, but uh, very few um, actually decide that they want to bring them out here and show them off and, and keep them alive out on a racetrack. And it's a big risk to an owner. I mean, you can lose value of, of a priceless car smashing it up, especially if you can't, uh, you know, if you can't unbend the chassis or whatever, whatever happens to it. You don't want to, you got to be careful, haven't you? No, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely, I mean, these are, these were one off pieces when they were brand new, a lot of them. So, right. um, <clears throat> to, you know, as we were, you know, throughout our break there at lunch, you had a lot of exhaust out there. No, I'm just looking at this car, particularly the 36. This is the uh, 356A 1500 GS GT Carrera, but the back of it, quite, quite, quite interesting. Let's see it come on past our position. Yeah, the the exhaust seems like really off the off the back of the car, hangs off it quite long. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, it looks it looks odd at first, doesn't it? It does. It, it almost looks like uh, they were setting someone up for a rear end. You know, it was like <laughs> a, a rear impact to pop the radiator on. Pretty car though. No, it's a beautiful car. Beautiful, beautiful car. Does a nice job around the Andretti hairpin. Gets a good double apex, a nice drive off. Exactly what you want with a car like that that needs to carry the momentum. And uh, So come on, i got to know. The Andretti hairpin. How it's so named. <laughs> I know it's named after Mario, but yeah. why? Well, you know, I think part of the reason why, not, not only is it because they, you know, they picked some, some drivers that oh, had sure, great success sure. here, but... Uh, they were testing here in 1987 prior to the racing season, and uh, that was the year that my Uncle Mario had Adrian Newey as the engineer. <laughs> on the not car. a bad guy yeah, to not, have. Not a bad guy to have at all. Still and going. What's funny is Adrian, that was the year before, was with Ray Hall, uh -huh. you know, so he came to came to Newman Haas. and uh, they, he start his career in, in, in America, really, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so he... Um, he was there, you know, he w showed up in Newman Haas with a winner, they got the new Lola to come test with. Well, all the parts came in late, so they had a hard time scrambling to get it finished in time. By the time they got here for the test, they had no radio box for the car, which meant they couldn't put a two-way radio in there to be able to communicate to Malcolm Mario. So they sent him out for the first run, and he comes down. And, and this is old Laguna, so he had turn one here at the front, and then turn two was flat out at you know 180 miles an hour at the bottom of the hill. And as he came across the pit straightaway, Adrian said he could, the rear wing was broken. The mounts were broken. And he goes over for the radio. And this is a story coming from Adrian Newey's perspective. When mm -hmm. I saw him at the HSR event, um, oh, we got a tow truck out there. So we had, saw him at the HSR event at Daytona a few years back. He was driving the March 82C. And uh, so he was telling me this story. And car was just 
destroyed. There's a cloud of dust down in turn one. And nothing but a monocoque and an upright and a wheel spinning on the upright. And when that happened, uh, you know, obviously they were concerned for his well-being. Well, he's peeling himself out of there, and he was upset that it broke his watch. And then Adrian proceeds to tell me that my uncle was one of the toughest people he'd ever had the pleasure to work with. Uh, but nonetheless, that really, that that moment, that accident, the fact that Mario got to walk away from it, uh, I, that's when they restructured the race course gotcha, here yeah. at Laguna Seca. And uh, and we have the modern layout that we have now. And, and they turned that hairpin, made it into a hairpin, slowed it down to this, probably the slowest part of the track um, next to turn 11. And now, we've got some issues here at 3 and 4, so or between 3 and 4, excuse me. We see this. Got a couple of track. I've got a couple of uh, trucks on or uh, recovery trucks on track at the moment. It's not serious enough to take it a black flag all. You know, we're staying. Yep. We're staying green with the session, so they're feeling confident with where they're positioned that it's not in a dangerous spot for this group to be, continue to keep running. Uh, how about that uh, number nine? That's, uh coming through that's well actually that's no it's the 98 i think it's the mg mga I think. is that the mg mga yeah sean de luna at the wheel that's cool. i was also looking at a spitfire i'll tell you a story about that in a minute i love to hear a spitfire story <laughs> well my mum used to own a spitfire i went to school in a little spitfire probably from the 70s not as old as these guys uh but uh yeah triumph spitfire uh, this, the one we've got out there is a 62. I think my mum had a, a 70s plus. They're tiny little cars. And I would go to school as a, as a four year old with two Afghan hands in the back of this, uh, in the back of this, uh, <laughs> my sister in the front and me with the back with two Afghan hands, but I was smaller. <laughs> and you imagine their ears flapping in the background, you know, top yeah. down. My mum driving like she was a race right, driver. Right, right. Gotta love that. Yep. Good stuff. That is a good story. That's a good <laughs> Spitfire story. Yeah. Whoa. A little wide out of 11 there. coming towards us this is the morgan plus four i said i was looking forward to the morgan and here it is that beautiful blue morgan and that's from 1958 so we've got from 55 to 1964 gt class and really this is where the sports cars became sort of revered didn't they the, these particular marks became so established worldwide uh, when the uh, Europeans started bringing them over to race in America. They were so successful. And it, I think it, uh, it kind of miffed the Americans because they were so nimble. They didn't have a lot of power, but they had enough to be quick in the corners and just about enough power to keep up uh, on the straightaways. And a lot of circuits like this don't have a lot of long straightaways, do they? So you don't really need out-and-out -out power. It, well, exactly right. And, and honestly, you know, if you've ever been on a racetrack for any club racers or anyone out there, if you've ever been on a racetrack with somebody that's out handling in and in the corner and you can't do anything you know and, and they're you're not allowed, you're not able to do anything with them on the straightaway because you just don't have enough power that can be one of the most frustrating things so um so yeah i, I you know that these cars came over in their day and it was just frustrating the big block you know chevy corvettes and things of that sort just coming here and, and sh you know because the lap time so much of your lap time is obviously in the straightaways but so much of it's in the corners and it made everyone go to work. And once they got those big V8s working, like these little nimble cars, mm -hmm. that's when you saw these little nimble cars get big engines, right? Like yeah. a, like a 427 Cobra and, and and things of like that sort as we got into the 60s. You know, as we get later into the 60s, we start seeing that, okay, we, we, we got better with our shock technology. We got better with our tire technology in, the, in that era. We were able to put bigger, heavier engines in it and, uh, and still have the same corner speed. That's the convertible D, that red car at the back of that group. And that's a nice little group, Matt. That is a fun little group. They're having a blast out there. I guarantee you those are smiles that you will not be able to wipe off those faces for the rest of the day. No, absolutely not. Yeah, there it is, the number 34. And at the wheel, that's Charles Christensen. He's passing the 69. And that's the Alfa Romeo Giulietta Spider. You can see the distinctive Alfa Romeo front. Well, you can't miss that grill, and I mean, no, even, no. even to this day, that's what the that's what the Julietas have in them as well. Yeah, the yeah. same the same grill. So it's um, again an iconic style. Like these brands are still carrying, yeah, from the success that they had back in. 
back well, in these days. And it's interesting, you know, it's interesting. You're starting to see now, and, and, and you can see it, I mean, all right, give the obvious one, Aston Martin. But we're now starting to see the development now, and I guess McLaren are responsible in some ways, of going back to race teams creating sports cars and production cars. Now, obviously, people like Mercedes and so on will, will have been doing that for years. But when you see an Aston Martin now, you know, going to Formula One level, there's got to be a reason to spend those millions and millions. And, and we're now starting to see the products of those kind of coming over. We see it with McLaren. We're seeing it with Aston Martin uh, as they go GT racing. And, and we're seeing it. We've seen it with BMW, of course. They're not involved in Formula One, but they've always been involved in racing. And we're, we're kind of going back to that, how this all started, which is uh, effectively potentially a prototype or a high-end sports car that is unattainable but then the road car version puts you in with the brand and you may not be able to afford the race car but you might be able to be part of the family exactly and and we're seeing that right there we're, we're getting a new format in, in sports car racing where they're yep. gonna have a hypercar uh division so we're gonna see again what what the manufacturers can bring at the top is, at the highest level and, you know, with the new um, international LMDH, yeah. you know, the Le Mans Daytona hybrid, you know, prototypes that are going to be out. So that's going to be that's going to be very interesting to see, you know, and, and fascinating to watch the development of that, because this is all it's all starts with the history that we're experiencing here this weekend. And it's all based off of that history. And that's uh, we learned from the history that's already been provided for us. And and that's how we keep in the sport and moving the sport forward is is. By looking back at what worked and what didn't work in, in the past, and um, right. I mean, you know, good example. Toyota, you know, said they would never build another Supra, and all the fans was like, "Oh, that Supra, that Supra," and now it's back. Now and, it's back, and big demand, and they did it well too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's uh, there's there's definitely examples of that all over, and uh, we're 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 at a very exciting time, and and not only the the transition of the sport and where it's heading, and and what kind of power plants we're going to be dealing with, and you know, strictly gas engine, hybrid platforms, strictly electric platforms. So, uh, you know, this is this is only going to get more and more fascinating as we move from from year to year. I, I that's what I love about our sport. One of the many things I absolutely love about our sport is 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 just the mystery of it all. Is what it's going to bring. That Arbarth Porsche. What a what a sight that is again. That, that uh, the Arbarth Carrera there. Yeah, that's very nice. Such a rare piece. But, you know, when you look at these cars and you think about the California roads down the 101 and, you know, on the Monterey Palincia, these are perfect cars both for a Sunday outing and also obviously to race. But uh, those who don't get the chance to race, you'd love to get a convertible version of any of these or, or even just the hard top and, and head down, you know, Route 66, whatever, whatever, any iconic road in America, but certainly here in California, oh, the, the winding can- hilly roads. Oh, the canyon roads that yeah, you yeah. have here are just... They're breathtaking, and uh, and you're right. The, the what you could do wrestling these cars around and uh, throwing around the canyon roads, you know, for sure. You know, these days out here in Northern California, you must watch out for the cyclists. Be careful yes. of these cyclists because uh, they we need to respect and share the road as best we can. There's an, uh, you know, that that also is a challenge. So the road's not all yours doing the canyon road, so I'm not encouraging that, but. Uh, certainly these cars would, would be right at home at all those, and you would certainly have a smile on your face. You know, that would be, again, hard to wipe off. That was that MGA, that uh, 1957 MGA, that all blue That's 41. A, That's a beauty. Wow, right? Michael Silverman driving that. There it is. And quite a quite a movement away, the MGA, from, from any MGs. Uh, you know, and, and Michael just looks like he fits in that car like just an absolute glove. <laughs> Doesn't he just have a great fit in that thing? Yep. It's like it was built for him. Really looks... I was saying in a previous race, when we get to see the inside of these cars, uh, i.e. when they're open top like this, open wheel like this, um, I want them all to wear white gloves because when, when they're wearing the white gloves, you really can see how much adjustment tiny little adjustments they're making i agree yeah i I think that's a great idea white or orange you know give us something something that pops you know that we can we can really see the hands work because it's something that 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 isn't given a lot of credit for uh, and it's only when you see it on board or you actually get a close-up you actually really sense how the little adjustments are are the the ways to make these cars go fast and that 
you know, you don't see it as much in modern racing because you don't need it as much. But Yeah, and, and that's the thing, too. In modern racing, where you really get the, the level of intensity in a modern racing is when you see, like, the in-car footage when it's raining out or, yeah. you know, or exactly. when it's nighttime. And they have the clear visors. And you can see the intensity in the eyes of the drivers. And then you see, then the gravity starts to hit you that, okay, this is real, that if the focus were to just let loose a second, that things would start to get extremely real here. Well, we're looking at the 57 Porsche, 117, the old burgundy color. Same year as the track was built. It's another 356, and again, just screams James Dean, like you said earlier. Yeah, yeah. And I'm from Indiana, so, you know, that, that, that's the home of James Dean of Fairfield, Indiana. You can't blame him for hooning around the street, around the, around the hillsides of California, can you, in a Porsche? I mean, to live fast and die young, it's, uh, you know, uh, that's, and be handsome along the way. I don't think there's, there's horrible things there, but, uh, and I know you can, you can tell he enjoyed life to the fullest, you know, especially in something like that, a speech or like that. Yep, absolutely. Well, like I said, this is historic racing. We don't pay too much attention as to who's ahead of who, and this is just practice anyway. We'll get a little closer to it when we get to the race action over the weekend. But uh, for now, we're just enjoying it and getting to know the cars. Uh, we'll take you through them bit by bit. If you stay with us for the weekend, this is our Group Bs. We've had all the A's out this morning. I'm sure they'll swap it around and change it around a little bit. And uh, we'll see every car at least two or three times. And hopefully they can stay going. But uh, miraculously, uh, what the historic events that I've uh, been part of, uh, the cars just seem to go along forever. They don't. They don't hold back. They're, they're the ones still surviving. In the end, it's the, it's the drivers that might might fall away by the end of the weekend. This Piranha Plus Four, which is this 31 car, it's uh, it's this blue car that just got passed by. Shock. Sure. Yeah, that that is the most unique of all. And that's a car I had my eye on when I looked at the list because I never. Never seen a Piranha. Don't even know what that is. So Greg Powell is, is behind the wheel of that of that thing. It's, it's a nasty a, fish, is what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a mean, man, yeah, flesh pe- eating fish. Yeah. If but somebody says feed my Piranha, don't the, do it. As far as the car, <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea that one even existed. It's a really nifty looking car, and they got a fun little battle here. Like, oh yeah, they've got they did side by side. Way. Yeah. This is a. Exciting little battle between these two. Yeah, look at that. Now look what's on the back of that. And I can imagine they get out and they're just going to be laughing about the time that they had. The little, what is that behind? Is that a? Is that, is that the MG? MGA? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, actually the numbers. It's the 98 MGA, I think. Oh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. You I can't see, see the eight. You can't see the eight. It's a very small. Whoa, he took a line there and almost got him in trouble. <laughs> and he just about saves it. Man. But the corkscrew, you've raced down there. That ain't, you can't come back from there very easily. He missed the tree. <laughs> he did miss There's, the tree. you got to aim for the tree. But you look how he recovered the lap time on, on the little piranha there up ahead of him. <laughs> he has got his hands full. Isn't he? He's got his hands full of old Sean. Sean DeLuna. Wrestle on that. There's something in the fi- yeah, There's something in the fi- in the in the surname that might give you a clue. Yeah, right. <laughs> so across the strip they come. Beautiful car number thirty-one. And that's that piranha we've been talking about. Frank Zuki at the wheel. Look at that. Yeah, the piranha sports the racer. Yeah, it's such a. I'm fascinating trying to, I'm car. trying to see what it's like a, it's like a little fan on the back there oh it looked like a little propeller like yeah. I think um, like a little joker jokester there you go there it is nice shot thank you cameraman sir yeah that's yeah, it yeah it's the boat there you go <laughs> <laughs> I love it he's it motor power it says piranha kit car on the back of it I like it that's cool love the spirit there Steve I love the spirit oh excuse me that's Frank sorry that's Frank Frank Zucci. Zucci, yeah. Yeah. So I love the spirit there, Frank, and your piranha. <laughs> yeah, there it is. I love it. Nice work. Coming up on the, that's the Volvo there, the 51 that he just passed. That's a that, pretty isn't job. That a beautiful, that P1800. Never seen anything like it. Never seen a Volvo from that era? No, me neither. It's, it, I tell you, yeah, you don't think of Volvos in historic racing, but there they are. And, of yeah, course, they've been around for that long. And they'll probably be along for there ever. They've built, they've built like 
Yeah. Yeah. Like, Whoa, a little bit of side by side coming out of the. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that's the one. Corkscrew. Yeah, that's the Volvo. Okay. The uh, 51. P1800. Oh, no, it's red, the P1800. Yeah, yeah, so we got that my, wrong. Yeah, things aren't really matching up on my. So I apologize for any confusion out there. That's. Oh, we've, we've obviously got our list. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not. A hundred percent, but hey. <laughs> Everyone, we're do our, always do our best. We'll do our darndest. I love the yellow wheels, though. The yellow do. and the green go I well. I, I, I really have an affection for this car. It's a beautiful car. Just resting up as he comes on the straight. you got to rest the hands up now and again. Yeah. Well, maybe it's the 151. That's what's confusing us because there is a, a sort of a one before it. There's a couple of cars. There's a 138 out there as well. So I think some late entries, but we'll get to that. It's the day. It's day one. I believe that could be the, the, the Triumph TR4. I'm looking at the. Uh, I'm trying to find it by color. That's the only one I'm finding on here. That's British Racing Green. Yeah, because so. that's definitely a British Racing Green yeah. car for sure. So where have you got that? Ah, the Triumph. Triumph. Yeah. So then that would look like a Triumph. Got a triumphy look to it. Mm-hmm. What I can tell you, this is Group 1B, 55 to 64 GT cars here at Laguna Seca. As we reignite the beautiful Monterey reunion. It's been going on now for almost a week. Uh, the Concourse Elegance and a pre-reunion event last weekend. So these cars and the participants have been here almost uh, a week already. As we come into the second week. So this is a big event. A lot of uh, work goes on as the organization of this. That's an MG. That's an, that MGA of Michael Silverman. That's a beautiful blue. Rolling around here, getting around that British, that British racing green. I still believe that could be that Triumph. I, I could be, we could be wrong, but I believe it could be that Triumph TR4. It's another thing worth mentioning. Um, back in the day, uh, back when motor racing began, each country had its color. A British racing green was the British co co uh, color. Red for Ferrari in Italy. Uh, French took blue, le bleu. Yeah. But uh, we almost used to race in national colors in Europe back in the day. So uh, that's why you get the, the distinctive British, what they call the British racing green. And I always think of the 33 Bentleys, uh, which were beasts sure. back then, yeah. but they carried those famous colors. And uh, it's great to, you know, and Aston Martin, of course, um, and Jaguar uh, as well. Speaking of which, there's the Lotus. Yep. Lotus Elite, the green and yellow. Henry Moore behind the wheel there. It's a great example of that. Uh, that Lotus, I think, is one of the few Lotuses, or maybe the only Lotus in this group it is. It's the only Lotus we have in the group here. Yes. Every every time I meet a young kid named Colin, I said, well, did your dad name uh, me after Colin Chapman? <laughs> they don't know what you're talking about. They don't about. know who Colin Chapman is. So then it's a perfect opportunity to educate him on Colin Chapman, because almost all of them know Lotus cars. And uh, so it's a great opportunity. And then they and then they have a, a they get a newfound... Um, Love for the Lotus brand because they have an attachment to being Colin. That's being exactly Colin. Colin. Yeah. See, well, you see, if you go to Conroe, Texas, and they say you're called Colin, it's after Colin Edwards. Yeah, right. See, depends where you where you hail from. Not a bad point. One to be named after either uh -uh. Colin Edwards. Not bad. It's coming up on two minutes left. He's here. got a lovely Shelby in his garage. Yeah. Oh, I bet he does. Me. Oh, I bet he does. Yeah, motorcycle racers love their cars. Car guys love their bikes. It's not often you see a Lotus, though, all yellow with the green stripes. It's usually the other way around, of it course. Usually it usually is. It, it, it uses both the Lotus colors, but in a sort of swap seat. It is quite unique. Yeah, I, I like it. You know, I think uh, I'm sure that was maybe a way to tell the difference between cars back in the day on a team car or factory car. Or maybe a customer car would be my guess, but uh, who knows? Mario, ever talk to you about working with Colin? You know, oh, yeah. I mean, he, he must have been such an innovator and such a, a an interesting guy because he was always looking for some new way of going faster or making an innovation. And his cars show you that. You know? Absolutely. A, fa a fascinating individual. And, and, you know, obviously they shared a lot of success together. And, uh, well, well, championship. Yeah, I mean, that rapport started back in India in the mid-60s. So, you know, and when they when they spoke back then, 
uh, Mario said to him, I'll, I'll, I'll want to drive your Formula One car one day. And, and that all came to fruition. But I think anyone that got to work with Colin Chapman obviously got to work with someone very special in, in the sport. You know, like anyone who gets to work with Adrian Newey yeah. is, is working with someone who's absolutely at the very best of their sport at the time. And, and Colin was no different and, uh, in his innovations. And, and, you know, then Patrick Head came along and Patrick Head was incredible throughout the eighties and, uh, you had Adrian Newey and you had, um, I'm drawing a blank on a couple of Gordon Murray. Yes. So it's just some fantastic examples out there. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, I know Mario really enjoyed, you know, the, the time that he got with, with Colin and, and really enjoyed, uh, the success that they shared together. One of my favorite stories when he won the U.S. Grand Prix at Long Beach, um, I forget who he made the pass on into, into the first turn, but uh, made a real late breaking pass, and you know Colin Chapman used to go throw his hat out. That's right, yeah. And I forget who Mario beat, but he swerved to run over Colin's hat. <laughs> <laughs> he was that upset that he lost the U.S. Grand Prix right there. At the end. There you go. Check your flags out on uh, Group One B. So the first group of the afternoon gets Col- through. Colin's thrown his hat. Then he's thrown his hat. <laughs> Colin's thrown the hat. And uh, Group One B the. Started off with wonderful success. That's the car I can't put my fingers on at the moment. 138. It's not on my list, uh, but I'm going to find it before the night is over. That white and red stripe. It's an Alfa Romeo, I know that. Just don't have a name on it. Could be... No, I, no. I'm, I'm going to... All down, the co op screw coming together now, the checkered flag out. It's not there, is it? No. It's interesting. No, no, it's, not, it's, it's a late entry, it's but not, it's an Alfa Romeo. We'll find out. I put a note, 138. So, as you see, going down, just... Turn 10 here, and turn 10 is the last one here before we get into the pit road. So, if they've already received their checkered flag, which this group had not... <laughs> Boy, some of these, they come through turn 11 with such momentum, these little cars, that you wonder if they're going to make it in the exit. And they do. These things rotate right at the last second, come shoot themselves right up the straightaway here. Beautiful sound as they change up. Yeah, it's a, right, we're right, right where we are, point. yeah. <laughs> we're right at the shift point, so we get just the abs, we just get the really, uh, the genuine, you know, raw sound as they come by. It's, a treat. Now I know you like your breakfast, and I know you like your cereal. So how about some special K? He's down in the pits. K, our very him. own special K. <laughs> Kev Harris is down there in the paddock. Over to you, Kev. Thanks, Johnny. Here we are then in the Californian sunshine. It's great, looking great. But I tell you what, you'd be forgiven for thinking that you might be in the Mexico sunshine because right here, right now, I'm surrounded by some of the cars of La Carrera Pan America, a phenomenal road race that can see you spanning the Pan American highway for some 3,000 miles. And if you're up for it, you can do it in seven days. And the man that knows all about it is right here. That's Eduardo Leon. Eduardo, great to see you here uh, in Monterey this weekend. First up, how are you enjoying the day so far? Well, fine and uh, we're I mean happy to be here happy to be in a racetrack the cars that uh, we brought are I mean to race and we're racing this weekend <laughs> you are racing this weekend but where these where these cars normally race it's a very different proposition started in 1950 I think you just told me and it's all to do with the Pan American Hyrie going from Guatemala to what was it all the way up to the US yes well that was the beginning and you know it was promoted by our president Miguel Aleman from 1950 to 54 and uh, we took it over um, 34 years later and now it's been successful because I mean nostalgia sells and everybody loves those cars. Yeah they do and what an eclectic mix of cars behind us we're looking at Oldsmobiles, Buicks, there's a a Ford GT40 over there and a little Alfa (laughs) There's some really interesting cars that enter this rally. People choose to do it in all kinds of vehicles. Well, yeah, we we just love to race in uh, people coming from everywhere, from Europe, now from Asia, and now a lot of Mexicans. And, you know, the, the cars that made history in our race were American because they had a lot of power. 
and the European because they handled better back in the 50s. So they became famous like a Porsche. The name Carrera came from the Porsche and, and, and associated to, to Carrera Panamericana. And it's been a great time to, now it's our 33, yeah, 34th year doing it and we're still running on. Yeah, fantastic. A great trivia there, like you said, about Porsche. In the early days when the rally started, like you were just telling me, European manufacturers invested a lot of money in sport cars and very good drivers because they wanted to come over and win the race. They saw what you were doing and they wanted to come and beat you at it. Of course, when they won, I mean, they start selling a lot of cars in America. Yeah. Brands like Porsche, Ferrari, Pegaso in that time, you know, Jaguar, all those cars sold in America very quick. Even the, the, the modest Volkswagen, the, the, the bug, started selling. They, they, they didn't go fast, but they last a lot. And then they start selling and they didn't sell speed. They, what they sold was reliability. Yeah, reliability is what you can eat. As you just said, 3,000 miles, and obviously the rally very much still alive and well today. 3,000 miles, and people that enter it, you know, currently, if you're going to do it this year or next, or when the next one runs, you've got to be covering that in seven days, is it? Yeah, more or less. And as I told you, this is the only road race in the world that we get the same spirit as in the 50s, yeah. going flat out on time stages, and seven days of racing, yeah. a lot of fun, a lot of people. I mean, great. The, the atmosphere is amazing. Oh, I can imagine it must be superb. And just over your shoulder, the one with the flames on it, the Oldsmobile there. What a vehicle that is there with the, uh, the yellow and red flames on it. Really big, really heavy car, but that's a proper racing car inside there, isn't it? Exactly. Though, I mean, the, the Studebakers, when they were born, the sport the engines of a hundred horsepower, the the new cars, the new Studebakers, mm. and the, the Buick and all use Chevy engines that go up to 640 horsepower. Fantastic stuff. Great stories, and uh, the rally is alive and well. And uh, if you'd like to get involved, just search La Carrera Pan America and, uh, or have a look at the details on the uh, Monterey Motorsport Reunion website. I'm sure you'll find out all about it. Eduardo, thank you ever so much. Don't run away because I'm sure we'll speak to you as the weekend goes on. Right, next out on track, though, we have 1961 to 1966 GT cars. And if you remember, we spoke to Phil and uh, Bruce from Club Sport with those beautiful Porsches this morning. Well, you're going to see some of those running in this next one. Let's go back to Johnny and Adam. Thank you, Kev. Yeah, I tell you, that race is, I've looked at that uh, over the years and thought, how on earth can you race a Studebaker 3,000 miles <laughs> in the hot sun? That's incredible. He said 640 brake horsepower? Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah, and I mean, like you I said, mean, the it, hot sun, I mean. And, uh, big it's, steering yeah. wheel. And, <laughs> then you're right close to the equator, you know, almost during that whole race. But what so. happens when you break down in the middle of nowhere? Uh, yeah, I imagine, I imagine that is a big part of the challenge. I ain't no balloon. I ain't but no balloon foot. <laughs> I like that. Okay. No, no light foot. No light foot, yeah. yeah. He's a lead foot. So this is a fun class, uh, as they all are, you know, under 2,500 cc. So, again, nimble car. Better than they go down the straightaway, arguably. Yeah, the number nine car is the green 1964. Yes. A lot of 1. 1.6 liter cars here, I would imagine. Yeah, mostly European, but a few Japanese in yeah. there now. Uh, a couple of Datsuns in there. And we've got an Elva as well, an Elva Courier, an old English white Elva Courier. Looking forward to seeing that. But this is what we call Group 2B. 61 to 66. Under two and a half. And yeah, small ball, but uh, nimble, as you say. My dad used to say, small but mighty. Yep. You know, the engines, they may be small, but they're mighty. Well, I want to talk about Aldo for a second because, I mean, you know, Mario stole, stole the limelight, of course, as he should. But Aldo raced, was a racing was a racing guy, twin brother, of course, to yep. Mario. And, but people don't know so much about Aldo. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it depends on, on, on the involvement. You know, in the Midwest, he's, it's quite well known what, what his career involved. Good guy. Yeah, you know, so it was, you know, they started together and with the Hudson Hornet. And Naz with Pennsylvania, and, and that's well documented. The number seven Hudson Hornet, and 
uh, that started in 1959, and at the end of that season, my dad, it was a national championship event, and you know, they were not, the, the, the car was underpowered for what they were up against, you know, the, they were running in a super modified class, and they were stock class car, I believe, was, was the way it went, and, uh, and my dad was transferred into the feature, and, uh, you know, was, was really having to push it to the limit to get it to that point, and uh, one of the towards the end of the of the heat race, he to the guardrail with the rear bumper right. that caused him to barrel roll uh, numerous amount of times down the back straightaway. And a big heavy car like that kind of crumbled in around him. It, it broke the helmet off his head, and and he was put into the hospital and and was in a coma for a couple of days. And I believe he went in on it was a coma went underneath went under on a Saturday and came out on a Tuesday. Um, but you know that was a big injury. He had to recover from that and, and spend good time recovering. He did. He made a full recovery. Went back to racing. Uh, you know, by 1961, and was uh, and held a career. 1969 was was running a sprint car at Des Moines, Iowa, and and uh, I watched. I just actually saw the sequence of photos of that accident, and, and there was a car that was. Uh, Looked like had a problem right around the middle of the track. My dad climbed the right rear, right. And back then, no no roll cage, you know, open face helmets. And yeah, yeah. As he was barrel rolling along the catch fence, the the fence poles were striking him in the face, and, oh. it, and it caused a traumatic, you know, facial injuries. And um, this is in 1969, so he had to have complete reconstruction surgery. But you know, if you knew anything about my dad, you're around my dad and around Mario, you see pictures of him. They were still pretty identical as twins. I mean, we could tell them apart because of the little nuances, but for the most part, we'd be at the race. Tell you how many times just me and my dad at the track, you know, in a golf cart or something, and they yell Mario, Mario, yeah, yeah, because because you know it was uh, they always were they were identical, and uh, so but uh, right right then was was you know my three older siblings were born, so the family was started and and. You know, I'm pretty sure that they sat down and had a serious talk, and yeah, but, and that you know it was time to, to you know move forward in life and, and to turn back on racing, and that was really hard for my dad because my dad loved the sport, he was passionate about it, he put everything into it like Mario did, but my dad was the best at being the support, and, and my uncle will tell you that, and, and my dad never once said why me or or complain or anything like that. It was always about um, about us racing, what we were doing racing, and, and how he could be a part of it. We miss him and uh, and love him and and he was a, an extremely special human being and uh, and the outpouring of support from the fans and we can, we can't thank you enough uh, all the prayers and the support are always felt and uh, but yeah it was uh, it was definitely very special and he had a and, and Chris Economac he was the one that said it that uh, that Mario was the more polished driver but my dad was the faster of the two <laughs> lovely. Nice, a nice uh, footnote. Yeah, a nice epitaph. So we're looking at a lot of Porsches out there. I didn't realize how many, just how many. We've been looking at uh, the number 98, the 911P, that blue one. Now we're looking at the 38. Is that or the 28? That's the 28. That's the 28. That's the MG, MGB, of course. It's not. It's rare you see an MGB in that dark colors. I hadn't recognized it. Right, exactly. That Edward Lamancia. Yeah. The behind the wheel of that, giving it through the paces here. We're in the Andretti hairpin. There's a good, nice promo shot for you. Love that. Love and the footage we're getting here today. Just fantastic footage all around. That's a 177. Now, I don't have him on my list either. Or do I? I've got two 77s. Maybe, well, they're both Porsches, so <laughs> I'm going to make a note. The yellow one. So I believe that was the 67. Like Kevin Buckley. Kevin dude. Buckley's out there, yeah. Really name. Yep, that was him. So that would have been the... Yeah, that would be... Yeah, six, that, makes, that, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Got it. And behind him, the number 96. Chased down by Edward Matsuishi. Yes, he's been around for a while too, uh -huh. in terms of historics. Got a little toe going up the hill there. <laughs> yeah. The court screw. Is that the gun range in the background far enough? It looks like it possibly could be. That really is. Well, a, somebody's is a braked heavily. 
I certainly hope somebody didn't miss turn six and ended up out there. That's for sure. Yeah, no. That would, yeah, that's that, a big drop off, yeah, off the yeah, back oh of that. Yeah, no. You're not, you're not going to be found for a while if that's the case. And I have to say, if you're one of those guys tuning in and you've often said to yourself, oh, I'd love to go to Laguna, there's ample opportunity. There's so many events here throughout the year. The weather is kind of like this pretty much most of the year round. Uh, and you can't really go wrong, cars or bikes here. It's Monterey Peninsula. Have a game of golf at Pebble Beach. Uh, go to stay at Carmel on the Sea or whatever you choose. I mean, it really is just absolutely idyllic, isn't it? Oh, there's no dispute to that. There is absolutely no dispute to that. If, if I've driven for car on a black flag all, we're in a black flag all situation. I've driven for car owners that, that didn't want to, that's why I've only raced here twice. They, oh, I don't want to go all the way out to California. I'm like, <laughs> you don't, you're missing the point. This is Laguna Seca. Yeah, you're yeah, not, yeah, yeah. it's not, this is a, such a destination. So yeah, if you're even thinking about making it out here, you should just go ahead and I'd say stop thinking about it. You know, pull the trigger, get out here. There's so much uh, to do out here. There's the Monterey Bay Aquarium. You can, you know, I've done, I've, I've hopped in a kayak and gone out there with the, with the sea lions and then you got the sea otters out there. And, uh, obviously they want you to keep your distance, but you could still get into a part of the nature there that you just can't experience really anywhere else. So I, I can't encourage you enough to come on out here and, and check this out. So they've got the cars coming off track now. Yeah, black flags out. So they're coming up and lining up in front of our commentary position now. The AK8 is coming past me. That's the 911S. Got the rally lights on up front, ready to do some endurance racing with that one. Yeah, it's a I just love every example, everywhere we turn, it's just eye candy. It is, isn't it? it? It's, it's, we had uh, a wander during lunchtime, and we were both yeah. both kind of like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I, I almost didn't need to eat lunch after that. I was full. Like, I was just so full of, of uh, all the feelings, all the good feelings, yep. you know, that you get when you're around the things that you love uh, and this mechanical symphony that we have here. So that's why we're black flag all the problems at the top of the corkscrew and any time yeah. that we're going to have any time we have anybody that is that is at a standstill in the corkscrew you can pretty much bet your bottom dollar that we're going to go ahead and probably be a black flag all situation because it is uh, it's a blind situation. You approach that um, 100% blind. So. And it's as far as you can get away from the pits as well. At the it top is. Of the corkscrew. It truly is. I'm just looking at this beautiful Manchester City, well, sky blue, I should say. But uh, that's how I, I, I always call it the Manchester City blue because it's that sky blue, that robin's egg blue, that number 48 in the pit lane, that MGB. They call it just blue, but I like to give it a bit more. Yeah, that is a, I like the combo, too, with the yeah. white and the red stripes, stripes going well, down. Yeah. I miss the, the the rally ball sticker, the rally ball numbers. You know, that was so common yeah, back in that point, era. Yeah, true good point. Where it was, you know, like a, a lottery ball, if you will, almost, yep. uh, for the for the numbers. So I, I kind of miss that, that font. That's the number 99 Lotus 26R. And now we're inside it with Tony. He's inside. He's, he's in the passenger seat. He didn't know he was going to get a passenger, but he got one. <laughs> got the hoosier tires we were looking at the tires i tell you what what a job to have looking after the tires on this lot. fascinating isn't it i mean you got you're looking at when you look at our list of cars you're talking we're, we're looking at eras from from the 1911 all the way up until modern era and you think about all these cars none of them they would all be rendered useless pieces of equipment unless they had four key pieces of rubber to hit the ground correct and so yeah i, I look forward to catching up and seeing uh, how that happens throughout the weekend. I know that we're working on a feature to get that done and, and to show off exactly and, and to inform you at home because I am sure you're just as interested as yeah, we yeah. are. Yeah, and, uh, and, and it's so essential. It's fascinating. Well, it looks as though they've got the hurry up going because away they go again and that roar of the sound of these beautiful engines hits out again. There's our 61 to 66 head back out of the pits. They've cleared up the incident at the corkscrew and away they go again. Let the sound rip into the air around the Monterey Hills. What a beautiful cacophony of noise. And 
this celebration of the history of the car and the history of American motorsport. It doesn't matter how old these cars are, they all sound brand new. Right, yeah, they're crisp, you know, they're, they're so finely tuned. The, the mechanics, when you walk around, as we did, John, at lunch, you just, you, you've got an eye for that talent. You can just see uh, these these are the, the cream of the crop when it comes to, you know, mechanical knowledge, when it comes to people that are spinning the wrenches on these things. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's phenomenal to see. And, and then the product, the end product, like you said, the, we're, we're talking, this is carbureted era. This is carburetors. Uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, tuning multiple carburetors on, on a single engine, that is a really monumental task. Yeah. And the, like you said, every one of these cars ripped off of here in pit lane perfectly tuned. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I mean, that's music to our ears. I mean, you brought up a really interesting point uh, from an interview that Kev did uh, earlier, which is what happens to the next generation of mechanics? Are they training people to look after these cars? Because these guys can't last forever. No, they can't. I mean, and sorry, these mechanics, the no. cars will last longer than yeah. the mechanics. The, I mean, be, being a mechanic at any point, uh, if you've ever, I mean, anyone that's listening has worked on cars, you know that working on a car is not the easiest thing on the human body. It, it, it takes a toll. Oh, gotcha. Just like anything else, you're leaning in awkward positions and putting a lot of torque on your body to turn around, you know, to, to a lot of hours too. Yeah. To bust the nut and bolt off. So there, there's just so much to that. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of times can be taken for granted. It's a lot of times a thankless job. And, and so that's why maybe the, we, we need to really, you know, put a lot of emphasis on the next generation. I totally agree, uh, with any kind of apprenticeship. I, I want to see, cause the interest is there. I see it, you know, we see it, the youth, Anytime we're racing, you know, the, the younger you are, the more enthusiastic you are about the sport. Uh, most of them are enthusiastic and want to be drivers, but, you know, and what you come to find out is driving's not 100% for everybody, but there's a lot to do with the sport. Right, if you yeah. really love it, there's plenty to, plenty to be. That's some great, uh, great careers to be had, too. For sure. We've been looking at that 1967 Porsche 911S. There's the 14. That's uh, a beautiful blue on Another that. Another 911. Yeah. So we've said 50, 61 to 66, but there's a few 67s. Yeah, maybe so pepper in a few a of there. 69. Jeff hey. Lewis maybe might have fibbed on the paperwork nah. a little bit. Did not either. But now yeah, that's Jeff Lewis hustling around. The Mother Tech race we're here at Laguna Seca. Let's go with that red stripe. There's a little red accent on that blue. Mm -hmm. Turn five. They're on approach to six to go up the Ray Hall straight to the course crew. Now it's a fast course. Course. Yeah, it's very fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you approach it, coming off that hill, it dips down. You get great compression. The BMW 1800 Tisa. You know, I've always loved those older, boxier BMWs. Me I, just, too. I don't know why. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, but they just look great. I remember when, when you know, my first job was valet parking in Indianapolis when I was, you know, 16 years old. And there was a uh, one of the the guys that played music at the restaurant that I valet parked at. He drove a 2002. You there know, you go. BMW yeah, yeah. 2002. Yeah. And I would just marvel at. I mean. At the little simple engineering, yeah. you know, you know, for example, just the little winglet it had on on the windshield wiper to keep the windshield wiper planted to the windshield at Autobot speeds. I mean, just some of the and, and again the styling of it, I it, it almost looked like it was trying to lunge forward, like the whole car was leaning forward. So I agree with you wholeheartedly on that, Jonathan. I love those little era of the BMWs. How about this, the Alva Curia, an old English white. I love the I love the paint scheme uh, names. They really, they've really gone into the detail here. It's yeah. not just white; it's old English white, and that's—it's true. It's kind of got a, like a creamy kind of white feel to it, and uh, that's a cracking car too. It is. It, I mean, again, perfectly cared for. You know, it's the only Elva I believe we have in this group. I'm trying to—I'm trying to, in my back of my mind, jot up the numbers. But if you've got 400 cars here, and every one of them is probably a six-figure. 
plus. Yeah, you're. I mean, I I would estimate. You know, Dorsey, Dorsey Schrader and I were just sitting there chit chatting as a couple of racers, and I just threw out a billion dollars for the cars. And, yeah. And he didn't blink. He said, "Yeah, I'm pretty sure that we're pretty close." It's about to right. So. Um, Plus, they're still doing auctions down in Monterey this weekend right, as well. Right. So then you've got priceless cars that will be auctioned off. And I say priceless to somebody who's going to pay for it. But right, uh, there's a price there's on There's a it. price somewhere. <laughs> there's the Alfa Romeo GTV in grey. Grey's not an often used color, but it seems no. to work, doesn't it? The Vincent Colonna. Yep. He's hustling that thing. He's going to die down to the Whoa. inside. I, 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 again, the respect. I left them room. The BMW, you know, the, the, the BMW there of Jim Huff left plenty of room, saw in the mirror that we might have a possible dive bomb down the inside. It didn't happen. It wasn't part of it, but it was, you know, the respect that you see. You just got to really appreciate the give and the take. Cause they're just, ha they're having fun. You know, those, those two will probably sit at the hotel bar later and, and just enjoy a drink over and, and talk about the, the session that they had this afternoon here. At WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca. That's the TZ. Yep. Another Alpha, but very different. Very different Alpha with a fastback. Yep, 1964. They did not want you to mistake the number seven on that car. <laughs> they wanted to make sure that that car got timed and scored, right? Yep. No matter what, when it went by, you knew the number seven went by. Lots of straightaway speed. Yeah. Fast car. <laughs> you get to see a sense of the speed with the drone as well. You really do. You, you absolutely really do. I mean, it's the, the footage has been fantastic there. Well, this is our Italian cameraman, Logano. We shrink him down <laughs> every morning, put him in a little bottle, and then shake it up, and then we put him in the drone. And, uh, yeah, you watch. By the end of this weekend, he'll be following each and every car. Just a couple of minutes left on our 2B group. Full afternoon of racing. Clock ticking down and starting to get a little racier now as they get dialed in. This is the raciest group I think we've seen all day. Um, you know, the only other group I saw that this was, uh, was this racy uh, was that uh, historic Trans Am group earlier that was really running and, and doing a lot more side-by-side -side business. But uh, this group seems to be taking the cake. It's like they were sitting there watching throughout the, uh, throughout the morning and just chopping at the bit to go get their chance out there. With less than a minute to go, they're making sure that uh, the cars are running the way they need to be running continue the rest of the weekend. An MGB that blew with Dennis Adair is behind the wheel. That's yeah, got to be a fun car to, to just hunk down the, the court screw, I would think, you know. Just approach that with everything you got and just give it the hunk of the wheel and let it rip. Yeah, Dennis is another stalwart of the historics. Been around many a year doing this kind of racing, this form of racing. And I've learned over the years just how good these guys are. You no, know, they don't have the notoriety of your big name, Mario, Andretti's, etc., etc. But these guys, what they do with these historic cars um, and how skillful they are, uh, there's many a really good modern-day race driver who's had quite a wide-awake moment when they've got into an old car thinking, oh, it's just an historic weekend, I won't need to push. And then suddenly they realize they've got a handful. Uh, 100. Yeah, you, I mean, you can't you can't dispute that at all. I mean, these, these are still race cars. They still take. My dad always said that anything that has an engine or a motor deserves our respect. Correct. Uh, it can hurt you, and it won't it won't ask questions. You know, and, <laughs> yeah, and it, it won't say sorry. Yeah, whether it be a blender, a lawnmower, <laughs> a race car, it doesn't matter if it if it is powered by something else. Yeah, it deserves our respect, and, and that's something that you see. And I've said it a lot, you know, already today is, is the level of respect that each one of these individuals has, not only for their own piece of equipment, for the equipment that's around them, and, and honestly, what they're here to do. How many of you heard, they all say it's about, the, about us having the fun. So we're at the finish of our 2B first session for them. 
cars from 1961. Well, to 69, to be fair. We said 66, but uh, there's, a, there's the odd 67 and 69 in there. There's a Porsche 9, uh, 69 Porsche for a 911 out there. Uh, Rand Smalley driving that. But there's that beautiful white, old English white, they say, Elva Courier coming out to finish his session. So, as we finish our to be, to be or not to be, let's head down to the paddock and join Kev one more time for the latest stand in the paddock. Thanks, Johnny. Well, we're down here in the paddock once again, and for this next little uh, snippet, we've gone European, and we're taking you all the way back to 1976 and uh, the European Touring Car Championship, and the car just away to my right here was indeed the championship-winning car in that season, clocking up five wins, and it did so well in 76. It came back in 77, and, well, it picked up the runner-up spot too as well. And I'm pleased to say the current custodian and driver of it, Steve Walker, is stood next to me. Steve, hands down, one of the prettiest BMWs here at Monterey this weekend. You're a lucky man to own. It. I'm very fortunate to be the custodian of this car and it is a beauty. It, it really is. Just tell us a little about the history of it here because I think I got it right. Originally uh, it was Belgian drivers that were on this one. Well, am I right in saying these were called the, the Black Bats from Belgium? That's correct. Luigi Cimarosti was an Italian that moved to Belgium after World War II, set up a shop and began racing. He did very, very well and uh, especially with BMWs. He won the 24-hour spa race in 1970 in 1974 and so the factory rewarded him by giving him two chassis to then compete in the in the European Touring Car Championship in 76. That's absolutely fantastic great story and uh, just give us a heads up on this what's it like to drive and uh, I mean how have you brought it to Laguna Seca before or is this the first time? No it's been here um, every year since 2014 um, we've run it here and it's 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 a lot of fun to drive. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of rubber on the ground. Uh, the steering is the old original worm and ball steering, so okay. it's, it's a lot of work to drive. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's especially around this circuit where grip is uh, pretty much non-existent, keeps your arms in check. But just tell us how you came by it as well and what you had to do to get it back into race-ready spec. I was uh, looking for a, BM, a CSL with history. Yeah. Uh, I had a CSL that I was racing at the time, but it really didn't have history. I became aware of this car uh, in Italy. Uh, a couple of other collectors were after it. And so we went over and looked at it and verified that it was the car, the, the 76 championship car, and uh, bought it out from under them. And I made two collectors not very happy, but <laughs> made me very happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it did. And once you got your hands on it, was there much you had to do in the shop to get it ready to go back to the track? Uh, yes, we did. It was um, had been converted to a Group 5 car with the box flares and had been repainted with the, the motorsport livery, the white with the motorsport stripes. And I wanted to take it back to its championship winning livery. Yeah. So we, we basically had to strip everything off. Um, but the, the good thing about that was underneath the, the fiberglass panels, we found the old original paint, uh, oh, no. the, the red and white UFO stripes from 77, okay. the black and the red and the green, we found all of those colors under there, so we, we knew for sure then that we had the right car. Yeah. Uh, we rebuilt the motor and transmission and all the other running pieces and uh, had it on track actually within 90 days of its arrival in uh, the United States. So it was quick turnaround. So you just had three months to do all that work and get it ready to go? Yes, that's correct. Did that's, you, correct. That, that's fantastic. Did you have a race in mind? You thought we've got to get it ready for this one? Uh, we wanted to uh, get it into the uh, charity challenge okay. uh, at up at Sonoma. That was kind of our target race, and, and we made it. Oh, well, well done to you, sir. And just tell us how excited you are this weekend to be here at Laguna Seca and getting back behind the wheel of it. It's wonderful. It, we missed last year. Yeah. We really did miss last year, so it's really great to be back here this year. And I uh, haven't driven this car for a couple of years because of that, um, so it's, it's fun to get back behind the wheel of, of this boy. Yeah, I bet it is. As we glance just away to the right, you got another one there, uh, the blue one just the right. Tell us about that one because that's yours as well, the next one in the line. You're going to go out on that too? Yes, sir. That That's uh, that's not your grandma's 2002. Right. <laughs> this one is a full-on Group 5 car. It raced in the DRM series in Germany in 75 and 76. And it has a Formula 2 M12 engine underneath the hood. So it, it scoots along pretty good. Yeah, I bet that does scoot along pretty good. And uh, just, uh, you know, 
when you're taking it here around Laguna Seca, what's going through your mind? What sort of emotions are you feeling when you get behind the wheel and things? Does it take you right back to the 70s? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Reliving my youth. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, because we said this, in 1976, I was just one years old. I think you said you just got married. Is that right? Yeah, or just left I, school? Yeah, you got married in 74. So. <laughs> so these are the cars that you were looking at then from back in the day. And it must be a wonderful position to reach a point in your life where you think, I remember that car. Now I can get my hands on it. Yeah, it, it is. And I, you know, I was able uh, to meet Hans Stuck that drove this car oh, wow. at the Nurburgring uh, at Amelia Island a couple of years ago when he was the honored driver. They yeah. invited my car down to be, participate in that night. So I got to got to meet him. He's such a gentleman. I got him to sign the dashboard. So it was wow. that was a very special moment because you know I watched him race and I yeah. thought he was just you know he was one of my heroes. So it was really <laughs> great to meet him. Well, Steve, listen, thanks so much, so much for talking to us. Very best of luck for the weekend. I'm sure we'll catch up with you over the next two or three days, but we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks to you for watching wherever you are right now. Don't forget, we are live across the whole of the weekend, but right now we're going to take a short break. So we'll see you in Relapsing two. Relapsing polychondritis, known as RP, is an autoimmune disease where the body's immune system attacks its own cartilage and connective tissue. If you think about where in your body you have connective tissue, it's everywhere. It's a fatal disease. People are dying. We need to do more research and we need to do it faster. One in five Americans have an autoimmune disease. That's about 50 million people. Joining our campaign can help them. One in five, just keep that number in mind. Welcome back to Laguna Seca here in the heart of the Monterey Peninsula. We are about 10 miles away from the California coastline, about an hour and a half south of San Francisco at the mighty Laguna Seca. Without doubt, one of the most iconic circuits in North America as we turn our attention to what we're calling 3B. But basically, these are, well, they're cars of yesteryear without a doubt. And this is all about racing design and development. And it really is a look at the workmanship defined as what we call vintage period. Vehicles eligible racing and sports cars with competition history established before 1951. And those include the likes of Alfa Romeo, La Gonda, Packard, Delahaye and Ford. And yeah, you are looking at the history of the motor car here. There is a Ford. And uh, what a cracker too. Look at that. The Miller Ford. How much fun would that be, Adam? This is, so, Piero Taruffi. Uh, yep. Piero Taruffi was the first one ever to write a book on driving a car, right? Yep. Driving a racing car. And this is the era that he was in. So, when you, when you, when you read his book or when you read his theory about separation of controls, breaking in a straight line and, and all that, it makes sense, right? You have almost no tire to work with. The brakes almost have nothing. And it's a bit, and it's a heavy And it's car. a heavy it's piece a of heavy, metal, heavy yeah. Piece of machinery. So the Tarufi theory, it's, which still holds strong to this day. Yep. Uh, well, separation it's a, it's of those physics. controls. It's <laughs> physics. And, uh, but this right here, I can't help but, but think about Piero Taruffi. Think about when my dad first put his book in, in my lap to read. Uh, it was this era. It was these cars he was talking about. And that's all I know about this era. Are my heroes like Taruffi and, and, and Tazio Nubilari. And, yeah, yeah. And these are the guys that wrestled these machines around and, and I love it's just fun to watch the modern day human that we have here doing the same thing. Yeah, and some absolutely magnificent cars. I mean, really, truly beautiful and so beautifully prepared. Leather straps keeping the hoods on. Uh, just absolutely magnificent. And massive cars, too. Masses of pieces of metal, as I said. You've got some smaller cars out there, but there's some big old monsters out there, and I love it. And when you see pictures, when you see promotional pictures yeah. of the historics here, you know, of the Monterey Motorsports Reunion, you know, the Rolex Reunion, this is what you see. You see them taking pictures of these cars down the court screw yeah. because this speaks to everyone about the history of our, of our sport. Yeah, no question. And and it's only when you go this far back that you start to begin to see how racing was de developing and how unwieldy it was and how it started off, uh, including two-seater racing because yeah. the first Indy 500, uh, let's face it, uh, you know, had a passenger seat. 
because they had no merit. Well, and I love, look at the body English. He's, <laughs> he's little, leading he's it. Leading in, in the he's corner. changing the weight to change. Yeah. Yeah, it actually makes a difference in the in these things. Look how narrow this car is. What, which one is that that's coming at us here? Tell you in a minute when it turns yeah, sideways. <laughs> Give a number on it. There we go. 32. That's a Ford. Miller Show that's the Miller Showfield Ford. Ford, yeah. Triple A big car. I, I love the car models in these. You know, and you can read down the list. Seven Special, the uh, Light Sport Tour, the PB Special, the Seven Nippy. There's got to <laughs> be a story behind the Seven Nippy. Like, I would not want to drop five floors, 59 feet in what one a, of these. Oh. Right when it compresses there. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> yeah, I think you'd have a smile on your face for sure. I mean, you know, take yourself back, John Kerr, to 1932. You're behind the wheel, and you are hustling that thing down the court screw here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. Well, you know, you think about the era. You're talking, what, mid-30s, late 30s? Yeah. So you're talking before World War II. So you're talking about engines. A lot of these cars were sort of almost developed from airplane engines because they knew those were the most powerful. And so, you know, you're, you're getting bigger and bigger. I mean, this is the first muscle, original muscle cars, if you like. <laughs> big old engines and big old cars, too. Now, is that the Austin 7 Special? Could be. Is that what that is? Yeah, blue. I believe that is. That's our Austin 7 Special, possibly. Or is that still the Miller Showfield? No, nope, no, nope, that's it. That yeah, that's the Austin 7 Special. Mark saying. Yeah, much smaller, yeah. That is like a, <laughs> that's a go-kart. Yep, 1935. That's Think about that. Getting a woe down there for the Andretti hairpin. Nice, nice corner. He's got a good little arc through there. He can keep it tighter because he's a little car. No need to use up too much racetrack because unnecessary. Yeah, it's nice from the drone. You get to see the racing lines sure. and where you, where, you, where you should be on track. And it doesn't matter whether you're in a period 35 car or a, a 2021 car. The line is very similar here throughout that uh, Andretti curve and through Laguna full stop. This one of the most corners, important corners coming up here at Laguna Seca. Yeah, turn five. Turn five, because that is the first corner that starts leading up or starting to go uphill. And if you get good drive out of there, racing-wise, um, that could be the most important corner you do all day. I mean, that's one of those in a modern race car where you have, like, predictive lap timer, yeah. where it tells you what your predictive is going to be at the end if you keep your pace that you're doing. That's one of those. If you miss turn five, you watch that timer go the wrong way all the way to turn six. And there's a Bugatti for you. you got to love the Bugattis. Uh, I mean, I have to be – I mean, I told you about my uh, placemats uh, when I was a kid. Well, that, that Bugatti was one of them. Nathaniel Green. Again, the body English. 35, yeah. I, I, I love the body. And part of that body English is coming from there's no seats in those. Yeah. You know, they, they have to lean into the corner because they don't have the any support yeah. to hold them the other side. The, the, just, belts, are, the belts are holding. Yeah. yeah, there's no Willens belts yeah. in there. <laughs> you know, my dad, they they um, they would take a pony cake <laughs> and they would cut it. And that was the seat. And then oh. they, would wrap, they would wrap half of the pony cake, cut, the pony cake cut in half. They'd wrap it in upholstery and padding. And that was their seat. Ah, and that's that cool? clever. That's yeah. clever. That would just hold them in too. Yeah, yeah sure. it gave them their, they gave them that side, yeah. that side hold. A bit like carting. Yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah. That is wild. So we're looking at these beautiful vintage cars. We've got ERAs. We've got the old Lagonda. We saw the Austin 7 special. And uh, there's a Studebaker out there as well. Haven't seen that yet. Yeah, the Studebaker IndyCar. Yeah. Uh, James Clear is supposed to be wheeling around out there. That'd be, that'd be good to see. There's the Ford Sprint car in that blue and orange. Max Jameson at the wheel. That's a neat machine, too. That, that's something that, you know, you, you think about that. It's on a road course out here. But that, that's a, I call that a sprint car. Yeah. Um, you know, that that probably hit the dirt tracks yeah. of America here in, in its day. And, and it's out here running the business around this road course, one of the most famous road courses in the world here. So... It's just kind of just so special to see. My, my Uncle Mario got his first ever win on a road course in a midget. Yes. At Lime Rock. So this is uh, to see a sprint car go around here of that era is not out of the question. Yeah. You, you don't think you don't think of sort of midgets as ever being road course cars, but I suppose they were. Yeah. yeah he, uh, can be. Yeah. You just had to had to put square tires on them, right? You, didn't, you couldn't have stagger. You wanted to put. Yeah. Make sure that the tires were the same diameter on each side, and then you could go road racing. And have a lot of Conan. Oh, yeah. Well, you had to have a lot of those. <laughs> I, today, I mean, 
the, the men and women that are strapping themselves in these things today, yes. I think, are incredibly brave as well. So uh, my hat's off to them. They're out here, again, putting these cars through the paces. And it's a, it's a testament. I'll, I'll say it again. I'll say it numerous times. But it is a testament to the mechanical skill level of the mechanics that are in this paddock here. Uh, looking at these, every one of these cars is, is either from the 20s or the 30s. I know that this, this class goes all the way up to 1951. But we don't have a single car outside of that era, the 20s and 30s, and these things are running flawless. Yeah, we have not Absolutely. seen one mechanical yeah. issue out there. We, we've There's seen more group. mechanicals than the more modern cars right, today. Right, right. Yeah. This is incredible testament to to the job that these men and women are down there doing, working the wrenches on these cars. Just saw a quick glimpse of the one of the ERAs. Two out there at the moment. And there's a, the Lagonda is a V12. Uh, uh, that's amazing. It's a big old car. Yeah. 1939, uh, putting out a 12 cylinder, like you said, airplane engine yeah. technology. You know, that had to be what that was, I would imagine, an engine that big. And this is a time where it really truly was a privilege to own a car, never mind race one. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. it was a rarity. Exactly. So, you know, it was, there was people coming off the production line, I mean, besides Ford. Uh, but, you know, basically, the mere mortals didn't drive. <laughs> what a great point. I mean, it wasn't like you were living in excess of the automobile right, right there. You, yeah. It, you, you, know, it, you weren't passing these <laughs> on the motorway. You were lucky if you saw one. Yeah. That's an incredible point that you make here in this era because it, it, it truly... If you got a ride in a car back in the late 30s, that was a, that was a, that was a privilege. Right. <laughs> That's a, a, what's that, a right, a rail, a railton, or is that how you pronounce that, a railton? Where are you? The number, ni the number 16, 1935 railton, uh, light Yeah, a railton, yeah, a light sport tour, yeah. Yeah, so Ivan Zaremba, and then look at this number. That's the Lagonda, yeah, the yeah, V12. Yeah, that's, that's the V12, look at that thing. That's a cracker, isn't it? How look beautiful at, is that? I mean, beautiful shape to that. Look the at the way that it, the it. fender wells off the back, and. Oh, that's just, that's just, again, you look at that, something's ahead of its time. Something slowed, sadly, as we look above, and that's not a good sight. No, that's rather peculiar area, too. That's blind. You know, yeah, so that's just over. coming into the Andretti curve, and it's not a good place to stop. Oh, well, and the PA announcer saying exactly the same thing, just after me, saying, yeah, that's not in a good place. But the Lagonda plows on. Up the hill. I bet that's an effort. <laughs> <laughs> he's tugging all 12 of those cylinders up yep. there. And then he's got to pull on the anchors. <laughs> right, yeah. This this is the perfect track for that, though, too, right? You have a nice mix of uphill and downhill braking. Yeah. And, and then what, just, I mean, with these big wheels, you get a chance to see the movement and the arms and the hands. Just, if you can, just watch the hands on, on these big, big cars. And how, how they how they actually use the steering wheel uh, far more than regular steering. They're they're adjusting all the time. Uh, it's, it is a sight to see, isn't it? it it's you're, they're working. They're actually yep. working uh, working the car. And there's no power steering. No, uh, I mean, <laughs> no. Power see, steering is in the biceps of the uh, of, of these cats yeah. out there grabbing hold of the wheel. Next time Rafa, your teammate, complains about his power steering, put him in one of these and say, "Yeah, hey, you don't need power steering." Right. <laughs> uh, my dad, you know, as an 81 year old man, my uncle Mario too, as an 81 year old man, have forearms on him like Popeye still from I'll wrestling bet. sprint cars in the 60s yeah. with, with with no power steering. Yep. And uh, you know, you're right. I. It, Men were men back then, and Adrian <laughs> Newey said it too. Mario was the toughest guy I ever worked with, and and uh, he said the only guy he's worked with that's come close. He said Max Verstappen's a pretty tough kid. I'll bet. You know, he's, he's a pretty tough, hard-nosed kid. So you know, I think Max holds a lot of that old-school racer to him. Yeah, and uh, I think that's why he's entertaining to watch too. Yeah, it was interesting. They did a they did a trivia game with the modern Formula One drivers recently about could they name Formula One world champions? Guess who won and Max. guess who named them all? No, Max was second. Uh, Max was second. Sebastian Vettel got oh, every, Vettel, yeah. everyone yeah, from that, Phil Hill yeah. to Fangio, you name it, he, he named everyone. Yeah, Vettel is a historian of yeah. the sport, yeah. Now, when he's bored, we can get him to join us in the booth because he'd love an event like this. He would be fantastic to have, for sure. Trouble is, he'd be asked to drive every car. <laughs> <laughs> We'd never get him out of the paddock. 
Yeah, he, right. he, he seems like a fun. One of my favorite comments of his was when uh, when Kimi left and they brought Charles Leclerc in. Sorry. They said, what are you going to miss most about Kimi as a teammate? He said, the peace and quiet. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good line. You almost got to love anyone who's going <laughs> to come out with that. So well, that's, that's, that ERA, uh, that's one of the ERAs from 1934, the R2A, the dark green. And there's a dark blue and a dark green out there. And Padding Dowling, uh, pa um, Padding Dowling is, is driving that. Now, he is probably one of the most revered historic drivers. I actually saw him at the Monaco Historic a couple of years ago, uh, working with Greenlight again. And uh, a fantastic event, I may add, if you ever get a chance. Oh, it's got to be fantastic. Uh, oh. I mean, it just... Monaco, the history, yeah. I mean, it, can, it explains itself. That's yeah, what, it, it, it tells place. you everything. And there's the 33. Plymouth, PC. What do you think of that? Cream green. Yeah, that, that is a cool looking car, too. I mean, that's just so unique. It's just so unique to see. It's... Where, tiny where, wheels on yeah. that. Though. Where else do you see this stuff? I mean, uh, these are cars that literally I didn't know existed in, in so many ways. And then here they are, and, and you're in awe of it. You're in awe of, of, of the representation of them. You're in awe of the fact that they're out there going to the paces, how well they've been kept. It's just, ah, and there's the French truck, Safti. <laughs> 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 le, le truck safety <laughs> et voila rescue <laughs> to the rescue <laughs> I hope it doesn't have the French siren on it no gosh no <laughs> oh is that the most infuriating thing whenever you're in France you're like just leak to ah oh, it's just go away hey ha hey, 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 hey. but it, it reminds me of the film Le Mans because whatever whenever you hear that yeah. you're like uh oh that's that's trouble. Or the short film rendezvous. Yes. Yeah. Because you, ha you catch it a few times in the short film rendezvous. <laughs> yeah. What a beautiful sight. The mountains of Monterey, the hillside of Monterey in the background, and these beautiful period cars from the 30s. There's a cracker. That Plymouth PC going through its paces here, down the corkscrew, through the rainy curve, and down towards turn 10 here at Laguna Seca. A classic track, a classic event. And some of the most priceless and beautiful, most beautiful cars you'd ever want to see. Now there is something for everyone here. I, 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 I gouge you, I go, I gouge you to say that there isn't one that you don't like. Even oh, if you don't like cars. No way. There, there's no way. I mean, I, I'm a person, person that I love the latest and greatest of anything that's coming out. And that has it for me, right? I could go down to that Ford booth and I can look at the Mustang Mach-E. Yep. And that's the latest and greatest that I can get as far as technology. And, and that's usually right up my alley. But I got to tell you, as I walk down through that paddock, it's it's these ragtime racers. Yeah, yeah. And it's these 20s and 30s era cars that have just absolutely captured my imagination. And by the way, did you see the speedometer there at the top? Just yeah. The, no, no, 87 no, no. miles an hour, that car was just going. That's the uh, 118. That's the Studebaker. Yeah, that's the Indy car. Yeah. They're not letting the grass grow under their feet here, are they? I wonder if Michael would have gone well in one of those. <laughs> and Freddy Autosport. Now we're going to give you a Studebaker. What are you going to do with that? <laughs> we'll make it work. Yeah, we'll put yeah. Marco in that. <laughs> we'll make that work. <laughs> Blue's coming off with the sunlight, too, with James Cleary behind the wheel of that Indy car. Even if we made a bunch of replicas of these, because you'd have to. I'd yeah. love to see modern day indie drivers like New Garden and like Pato Award and whatever put them in these cars and let them race. It'd be interesting, wouldn't but it? But not the originals. Yeah, <laughs> no, you can't do that to the originals, but certainly do like a little spec series replica. Yeah, replica series, why not? I don't think anybody would be upset by that. There's the Ford Sprint car. I mean, look at how narrow this thing is. I mean, these things... I mean, you've got to wonder how like good the suspension technology was back then. So how much of a rough ride would it have been? Well, the leaf spring. Yeah. So just in that alone. Yeah. You know, just think about the, that's like riding in the back of a pickup truck. All yeah, around. basically. And uh, so as I believe you were the one that made the observation when we were down there looking, that's a wagon with an engine. Yeah, basically. basically. That's what we're looking at. Here. Basically. <laughs> so I'm not imagining that the ride is something that keeps the coffee steady in the cup holder. Nah, 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 you need a weather, weather tech cup holder for that. Ah, nice plug. You like yeah. that? You see yeah, how I, I slot right that in, in there? He's, yeah. He's hit the, the MD's here. The O'Neill's are so to, happy with yeah, you. Yeah, right I know. Now. I'm trying. <laughs> 
Hey, we're at the WeatherTech Circuit. You got to give them a plug oh, now. Oh, for again. sure. And, and a great, great American company too, right? Right out of Chicago and. Uh, no kidding. Product. The CEO yeah. is racing this yes. weekend. Yeah, that is no kidding. Or else they'd be here. You know, Cooper would be here, and and all those guys, all those guys would definitely be here to be a part of this event. Special shout out too to all the all the corner workers and safety yeah. workers we have. You know, that's that's one of those thankless jobs. You know, they they volunteer their time to be out here. They sit out there and and make sure that they got sunscreen on themselves. Yeah, and, no kidding. Uh, you know, they a lot of times work a lot of hours without. So, and they do this because they love it. It's not because they're being held to do it. They absolutely are here on a volunteer basis and want to be here. But it is up to us as the fans and the competitors to really show our appreciation to those men and women that sacrifice there. It is a thankless job, and believe me, it's a dangerous job. There, there's no uh, no joke about that, you know. And um, so we, we, we love the fact that they're out here because without them, again, uh, it's like I mentioned the tires. Without four tires in these things, you go nowhere. They don't go anywhere. Without the corner workers uh, securing our safety, there's not an insurance company out there that would that would sit there and let us do what we do. So God bless you, the corner workers. We love you and thank you. Yeah, and if you're in the California vicinity, if you're either in, uh, let's say, L.A. or San Francisco or San Jose, come on down. It's a heck of a it's a heck of a weekend down here, and it's not just here at the track. This carries on into various concourses and uh, rideouts, and you know, I mean, you can't—you can sit in a cafe or a Starbucks even somewhere and just hang out and watch these cracking cars go by. Oh, and you can, yeah. I mean, it's like people watching with cars. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like you said, something for everybody, and there's something that's going to capture your eye, your imagination. There's going to be a color combo that you're really into, like the the BMWs that that Kev was just with. Um, that Castrol livery was just, I mean, I'm, I'm up here and Jonathan had to get me a Kleenex because I think I was drooling over, <laughs> over how beautiful that car was yeah. and how it was striking me. Now that's not going to strike everybody the same way it hit me, but I'm sure that someone's looking at the two cars right now and it's just, it's again, it's, it's filling them up with so, with a minute and a half left to go, these two are just battling Side like, side. like there's prize money and we gotta love this as they drag race up here. What a what a fun! I mean, I just I can't get enough of just the spirit of what we're out here doing. Yep. High above the Laguna circuit, and uh, we're really getting some fantastic angles at the moment. That drone shot of the Andretti hairpin has just crack it in. It's changed it, hasn't it? It's just been money. Yeah, I mean it. Because any at-level shot of the hairpin, it makes the cars look almost stopped. Yeah. But from that overhead, you can really see the momentum yeah. that even these period cars are carrying through there. It's, and it's no joke. And an onboard would show you different characteristics, like the off-camber mid part of that corner, plus the off-camber exit there. So that there's a lot of tricky sort of nuances about that hairpin that uh, can catch you out. You can go too wide, but you can get hung out to dry. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting corner, but... It's, it's interesting seeing it from the drone angle, which I haven't seen at a live race before. Me neither. Me neither. It's, it's, it's been my, my new favorite shot that we have here this weekend, that's for sure. But that Bugatti looks so cool as it comes through. As he pulls the handbrake, you see that? Yep, tight 35. He reached out the pole on the handbrake. And my dad would tell me in the sprint car they had a weight jacker that was in the same thing. And one time he went to go release the weight jacker about ripped him out of the seat because it was bound up. So I mean, you think about what, what these men really had to handle uh, at the time. Checkered flag is out for Group 3B. What a fantastic session. Yeah, really lovely. I mean, uh, I mean you, this, you talk about historic racing. This is uh, as good as it gets. And look at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do that. You heard him giggle. I yeah, swear you can, I just yes. heard him giggle right then. He was doing the body English uh -huh. into that. That's for sure. No, I, uh, I'm in, I, I'm smiling ear to ear. I mean, I just, uh, the, the enjoyment I know that these individuals are having, and I, I honestly, I want to take tire temps as they come off track. Yeah, these guys were hustling it. So the Bugatti comes around the last corner here at Laguna to finish off. Let's see the Bugatti straight away here. So we're doing that Bugatti was at 70 miles an hour. On this front yeah, but he's slowing and down. He slowed down, yeah. 
Yeah, there he goes. Hand out. About the only thing that's modern there is the helmet and the overalls. And, and thank God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank God he's not wearing a leather helmet. No. I'd have to go have a talk with him. Yeah, if he's leather helmet and goggles. Helmets, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is that... Um, a lot of these cars, when they raced, they did long races. They did four-hour races. Yeah. yeah, they did. Maximum flight altitude reached. So as they wind down and come back into the pits, this is 1920 to 1951 race cars. We'll see more of them later in the weekend. But now let's head down to Kev Harris, who's down in the paddock, to find out what he's up to. Thanks, Johnny. And there's a car for you that I know you absolutely love. If you're watching IMSA GT racing in the early 90s, well, then you'll know exactly what this one is all about. Uh, Nissan factory car, then 240SX, uh, multiple championship winning car. And I'm stood alongside the man that has now owned it for some 10 years and has done, I don't know how many laps around Laguna Seca in it, uh, Phil Mendelovitz. Phil, thanks ever so much for taking the time to talk to us. What a great car to own. Just, just give us a heads up on this one. Okay, well, this car raced in the IMSA series. Uh, it raced five years and uh, raced in over 80 events. Yeah. That's a big track record. And I think it podium, I think, 70 times or 77 times. It was a very dominant car. And then, like a lot of cars, the rules change, and the cars, they actually get sold to South America, and yeah. people race down there. And then um, it sat in a garage. The, the driver that... the family that bought it his son raced Le Mans yeah he was a Porsche driver and it you know there was nowhere to race this so it sat in his garage and languished and uh, I heard about it and I was the fortunate one that made the first phone call it's a great story that Phil because you were just telling me that it came online you happened to be looking and you know within moments of seeing it pop up for sale you're like hang on I know that car I want that car and, <laughs> and you managed to get it yeah that's the thing I I uh, didn't know what condition it was in, and uh, it was in Puerto Rico, and so you know a lot of humidity could have been very rusted, and so uh, I had to put in a container and bought the whole team and brought it over here, and it took uh, three or four years to get it all sorted out. You have to get everything crack checked and tested. I think every piece on the car was cracked. <laughs> But the thing is with this car, you obviously knew exactly what it was all about. You were watching this, you know, uh, in those days of the championship when Leitzinger was winning in it, and uh, you obviously knew what it was, and so when it came up for so, you had your eyes on it straight away. That's true. Plus, it's good looking, you know. It was, it was a Nissan factory car. I know Nissan was very dominant. So, yeah, I, I uh, feel grateful every time I get a chance to drive it. And incredible reliability. We're talking about a car that was originally built for endurance, 24-hour races. We're obviously running what is a sprint race here this weekend, but amazing reliability, amazing design. I think you said to me a moment or two ago that the guy that designed it the year before it won the championship actually won a sort of award for his design of the vehicle under the bonnet. Yeah, so his name was Carson Baird, and he was the uh, team principal, yeah. you know, head mechanic, and uh, IMSA gave him this award the year that this car was built because it was dominant and very well built obviously yeah. Yeah. It, it won uh, its first one of the first races at Seaway which is a very demanding uh, course very bumpy and, and uh, puts a big a lot of stress on the car and it did very well really built to last under there we, we were lucky enough just a second or two ago uh, phil got the hood off for us we saw what was going under the bonnet and if we come back to phil later in the weekend if we chat to you in a couple of days time we'll probably get you to take the hood off again so we can see under the hood but wow we there's some noise down here in the paddock isn't there phil struggling to hear you think but i mean you've been to so many of these heritage events and we had we were just saying that that one of the great things about events like this is just the noise, the smell, and the sounds. We're hearing the engines from back in the day, and they really sound good, don't they? It's one thing to see uh, a Porsche at the museum in Stuttgart. Yeah. It's another thing to hear it in anger on the track, yeah. you know, and, and driven. And to, like, this car, for example, was a very well high performer. Mm -hmm. So on the track, I can race against 962 Porsches and things like that. And, 
it does really well, and people can hear what the engine sounds like yeah. at full scream on the straightaway. I'm really looking forward to hearing you go out. Uh, how long till you going out? Have you? Let me see. Tomorrow now. Tomorrow. Yeah, just checking my schedule. So, yeah, we're going to catch up with you after tomorrow for sure. But I said to you earlier, you know, how many laps you done around Laguna Seca, and you did some maths on that, and I couldn't care to mention how many laps you reckon you done around here. Uh, oh, numbers of laps. Yeah. Wow. No, don't even try to do the math. Maybe a thousand. You, maybe a thousand. <laughs> you've done a ton of events over the last few years. And one thing, one of the things that we, we talk to everyone about is the corkscrew, obviously, because when you're coming into the corkscrew, you're looking at the sky. But in a, in a vehicle like this that you're so low down, you've really yeah. got, you've got to trust your line. You, that's what it is. You just, you know, some people say you aim for the, aim for the second oak tree. Yeah. But really, you just kind of learn your bearings from your surroundings yeah <laughs> and you just it's a leap of faith it's a leap of faith it's a leap of faith that phil explained to me as he said you can't win the race going through the corkscrew but you can certainly lose the race going through the corkscrew and uh, hopefully that won't happen to you uh, this weekend i'm sure it won't you be in safe hounds like you say sprint racing format here you guys are going to be out for about 20 minutes but these things were designed to go for 24 hours right right so you know this car is uh a little heavy they were built a little bit stronger for obviously to hold up for a very long endurance race and if i was there are sprint cars that are faster yeah but this in the end this is the turtle that wins <laughs> the turtle that wins is a great analogy and uh i mean i said to you as well like because when you look in this folks if you do get a chance you know if you're down here this weekend do come and see phil have a look inside we'll chat more i think in the next couple of days but all i would say is that you know, you are squeezing yourself into a really serious bit of kit, and you can only do that because, you know, you've raced other cars before. You can't you can't make this your first historic no, racer, no, can you? No. In fact, if it was your first race, they probably wouldn't invite you to race. <laughs> they really wouldn't. Well, listen, Phil, thank you ever so much for talking to us. Like I said, we'll hopefully catch up with you in a day or two, perhaps after you've been out on it. You can give us your feelings on it this year here at Laguna Seca. But thank you ever so much for joining us. Absolutely. All right, so thanks to you for joining us wherever you are in the world right now. Uh, do you know, Johnny and Adam, I've almost forgotten what's out on the track next, so I'm going to let you guys explain it, but I'm sure it's going to be something great. Take it, Kev, it's rag time! <laughs> rag time, racer time! Now, this is something quite different and uh, quite special, actually. I've really enjoyed seeing these guys. They're an exhibition group. Um, effectively, they don't race. Uh, they exhibit at all the American circuits, and I think the oldest car here is from 1920. 1920, <laughs> 1920 Ford Model T, and one of them they name it as a take apart T. Right. Uh, you know, so one of those has got Borgard Speedwell, and the other one has Mark Hart in it. But after that, I mean, the the closest to that is a 1917 Paul Scott Model M. You know, this was everything here is almost like a, a model something, Model T, Model D, Model M. But this really is the beginnings of American motorsport um, and car. Well, not just cars, cars and racing of cars. I mean, they pretty much go synonymous. As soon as we got the engine going, we raced them. Exactly, <laughs> and and we're. It's almost like watching history repeat itself, right? Yeah. These, yeah. When when we look at the electric car evolution that we're seeing now, how how many new electric car manufacturers have we seen just pop up? You know, a dozen or sure. so. Yep. And how many are actually going to survive? Who knows? Yep. And this is what we're looking at here, right? Ford survived this, but you got Packard, Hudson, National. You know, National. The, and so these are these are some brands that just you know honestly didn't make it, right? But Bugatti is still around. Ford obviously is still around. Fiat uh, still around. Fiat still around. So this is a uh, Marmon, not so much. Not so much, Marmon. <laughs> You know, I mean, no love for the people that brought us the rearview mirror. There you go. We're going to talk about that in a moment, yes, because that's a great story, uh, one we both know well. Here they come. Uh, and I've been around these guys a few times. I saw them at Sonoma, and, in fact, I was lucky enough to go around Sonoma in the number 16 car that we'll see out there, which is one of the Packards, a Model 30. 
But we're, like we said, these are what's called the ragtime races. They are exhibitions of speed. They don't race each other. They just put, there is, there's the number 16 pack on I told you about. But their race exhibit group formed in 2018 for 1920 and earlier. And they're literally a traveling show. They go to all the U.S., um, you know, historic events. And they really have, well, over a dozen uh, cars of era. And instead of putting them in museums and collections, they go out and race them and in fact we've got a uh, a version not the original but a version of the first ever winner of the Indy 500 there's that Packard going out there with a passenger there you see that the lucky person on the right is getting the ride I got because a lot of these cars are two-seaters and there's a reason why they're two-seaters and Adam will explain well, a couple of reasons, right? You had to have a ride-along mechanic to, if you had a breakdown out there. And, and obviously, also, too, these things burned oil. So they, a ride-along mechanic was adding Putting oil. oil. Adding oil the whole but time. But also, they were the, they they were were the, the first, they were the day of, well, they were the, of the age spotted. They were the eyes. They were the yeah. eyes for that driver behind. And that's why there was a lot of protest to the Mormon wasp because it didn't need a mechanic. Uh, they had, I believe it was, um, you know, an early oil subsystem that they didn't that they didn't go through the oil, and they also had a rearview mirror that that Ray Harun uh, created, and so that's why they have a single seat. It was a single seat. So even back then, the racers knew that okay, you're saving the weight of a full human being out there, so you're not going to sure. burn as much fuel. You're going to have more speed and more power, and, um, and and you know, Ray Harun took advantage of everything he could right then, and and came out on top and set history. For for all of us to enjoy. Yep, Ray Haroon, the, the winner of the first ever Indy 500, and he did it with the first ever rear view mirror. So he didn't need that spotted that you speak of, and he didn't need uh, to look from side to side. They would tap them on the shoulder with the passenger and tell him where the, where the competition were if they were catching. And uh, again, you can see that spare seat there, no, no passenger there, but uh, beautiful, beautiful cars as we watch the number 18, that's the Romano Studevant. And the ragtime race, one of the neatest displays here in the paddock. They have a beautiful representation, the cars are set up in an old time like garage yep. setting with a great display in the back that kind of takes you back in time as it is. Each one of the cars has a little takeaway card that you can take with it that has a picture of the car, some history of the car on the back, who currently owns the car. It's just, they have probably, like I said, one of the, one of the best displays here. Well, like you said, I've got one of those cars right in front of me. 1916 Romano Sturt Avant Special V8 Aluminium, 555 cubic inches, supercharged. World War One aircraft engine. There you go. There's there your aircraft is. engines. Uh, transmission was a brown and lit three speed, and the chassis a 1916 Auburn chassis. Uh, and again, aircraft wood and fabric with aluminium cowl used. The wheels and brakes were wire wheels with mechanical brakes, and built by E. J. Romano, who built three aircraft engined race cars from 1913 to 1924, one of which was won the first ever Pikes Peak Hill Climb of 1916. Can you imagine going up Pikes Peak in 1916? Not one of those. Not one of those, because, I mean, again, you're running out of oxygen, so you're running out of power. This is Brian... Uh, this is Brian Blaine behind the wheel of the Blaine Motorsports Foundation, and this is uh, this is a car that they own, their foundation owns. And then you got the 16 right behind them. That's a Packard Model 30. Yep. You got uh, Payette Hildago back there behind as they come down the front straightaway here. Always well aware of who they have around. Taking a closer look at the Packard. And his passenger. Beautiful car. 2,882 pounds, the weight of that car. Oh, it's not that heavy, actually. It was expected to be heavier. Four cylinder. 40 brake horsepower. Three speed again. Mechanical drum brakes. Now, explain, if you can, the difference between a drum and a disc brake. So the, the drum brake is a, is a fully enclosed system. You know, it's not a caliper around a disc, yep. you know, like we have with our disc brakes. So, you know, the best way to think think of, you know, like a drum of fuel, or if you will, it's, it's a round cylinder. And then what you have is shoes inside there on springs. 
and when you press the mechanical mechanism, it's going to push those shoes up against that drum, and it's, that, that's what's going to actually you slow down. So, again, it's not <laughs> pumping that thing up, getting some oil to it, getting some fuel to it. So just explain, he's literally pumping oil into it, and you can see it puffing out. You know, I'm you know, trying to keep it going. <laughs> this thing, uh, I think they're having a bit of an issue right now. That's why they're pulling off, of course. I can't help but hear those magnificent men in their flying <laughs> in my head. But that's just me. So I don't know what the solution here is. Uh, you know, this is way <laughs> before well, my the era. Right thing. <laughs> they pull and, off. Um, but it looked to me like, because the way it was pumping out black smoke, like maybe he was pumping oil, you know, in this era you might have had kind of a two-stroke type of fuel burn, if you yep. will, where you burn the oil to get the power that they needed. There's that Packard again. Spare wheel on the back. Got a they make it up the hill from 6 to the corpse for that amazing. Yeah. And here we go. Down the corkscrew. <laughs> That's a frightening moment. So like he grabbed the gear to do that too. Good for him. <laughs> and that's a national indie racer, that 20. National indie racer, model 40. Yep. From 1911, I may add. I know. It's incredible, really, it when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, that is over. Oh, yeah. Come on. Just for the medal alone to survive over 100 years. years. Just for the medal alone to survive that long. Correct. And to have people care about it enough to keep it alive. Uh, it deserves to be out here. It's earned every right to be out here and being able to show it's, it's right. Tony Stewart would be proud to drive that number 20, I can tell you that. The smoke. The smoke. When you see him in the number 20, that would be interesting. Congratulations to him, by the way. He put on a great series. Uh, Marco and Reddy involved with that. Here they go. <laughs> He's like, come on, catch me up. I want to race. <laughs> that, was really, that was really quite clever. Jumping up and down, yep. enjoying every moment. Yeah, Brian and Frank out there having fun. You know, like, like I said, all all these individuals. There's so much camaraderie out here. This is this is a lot about just getting together with friends that have the common interest, the common interest of, of beautiful automobiles, uh, of racing history, and and bringing it to life for for us fans of it. Ah, now there's the number four. That's the Ford Racer Model T. It's got Ed Archer behind the wheel of it. Don't know who the brave passenger is. I would love to see a list of our passengers. That are. Then uh, one of the... Here you go. How about this? Mechanical expanding master brakes and Perlman artillery wood wheels. Oh, wow. It, that is getting to some depth. And one of them's got a little bit of a vibration in the wheel, I can see. The left rear has got a little bit of a wiggle in it. Nice eye. Nice yeah. eye. The body is the 4T racing body, a car found uh, in Long Beach in the 1950s as a race car and restored as authentic 1915, and the current owner is Ed and Karen Archer. Yep. Well, thank you, Ed and Karen, for sharing. I bet you Karen's a passenger. The brave there you go. And that machine, I bet you, is Karen. Because it takes the, yeah, it's braver to be the passenger than the driver. Oh, absolutely. Look at that. Now nah, watch that wheel. <laughs> the intensity. I love it. Hang on. How much fun is that? And look how thin those wheels are. There's nothing to it. Like, literally, they, they detach the horse, they put an engine yeah. in it, and a steering wheel said, let's go. Um, a little bit of toe in. <laughs> 1915 is the era of that car, if you're curious of the year. Yep. Known as the 1950 Ford T Racer. Absolutely beautiful. The first time a rear view mirror was ever used on a race or passenger car. And just to leave here in the PA announcing, talk exactly about the Ray Haroon car yet. We haven't seen it uh, quite yet, but we will. Down the mighty corkscrew they come. Very intimidating to head down that hill as fast as it is. It's a runaway hill if you get it wrong. Oh, most certainly. Absolutely, most certainly. And then thank goodness you don't deal with rain in yeah. of this area because I couldn't imagine approaching the corkscrew in a real no, beautiful yeah, 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 You don't want to do that. 
and intentionally weathered there you go, look at that. That's a beautiful car. Beauty. Number that is nine. I'm going to go with that's a local mobile. That's the, and that's the 1912 Franklin Model D. Love the rear end, too. Look at that. Hey, Christ. Locomotive. That's the 19... Well, no, that's... Uh, excuse me, I'm looking now. Uh, there you go. Thumbs up. Cross the line. I think they're having a bit of fun out there. Look at, that. Look at the leather straps across the front as well. A lot, really large, quite a large one there, too. And, and that was another thing I saw when we were walking down there. Most of these were... were uh, they were cranked, right? They didn't have electric start. No, yeah, you had to crank them up. And so they had a leather strap holding the crank in position so that the crank didn't flip around while they were out there. Well, that was the other reason, of course, for the, for the passenger as well. If it stalled, yeah. you, can't, you, you can't start it on your own. You, no, you, you need two people to start yeah. it. <laughs> Absolutely glorious. What a machine. To shape that metal back then. Oh, 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 hey. oh, <laughs> he had a quick look. A little bit of a runoff there. You don't want to spend not too much time doing that. You might need some Cooper tires at that yeah. point. And, uh, yeah, there's not too much options on how to drive. Yeah, and it really is a balance of weight, isn't it, between the two drivers, or the two, two, um, the driver and the passenger. You need to have a good passenger, don't you? Yeah. You need to have someone that understands physics. Well, it's, yeah, it's like motorcycle sidecar yeah. racing, isn't it? Yeah. Look, look, lean, everybody lean. Hold the car down on that famous number nine. Metal shaping, you know, the metal shape that back That's there. That's beautiful, yeah. Too. I mean, you're talking old English wheel. And... Ah, I just saw the wasp. Yeah. So special to see, even though, even if it is a replica. It is so special to see that uh, that livery and, and, and a replica of that vehicle go around here. Yeah, and, and, and as I said, if you're interested in looking at these, look up look up the uh, ragtimeracecars.com, and you can have a look at uh, some beautiful photographs and a beautiful website uh, they've dedicated to these cars, and you can learn a little bit more, and you can even sign up to get the newsletter and so on. Uh, but if you love looking at how history of racing began and where the real beginnings were, then you're looking at them right now. And isn't it amazing that we can still do this? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, could you imagine, I don't know, skis or, or sewing machines from the early day and then saying, ah, oh, my ski, my old wooden skis from 1932, they're not working. Can I get them repaired? It's like, no. <laughs> yeah. We don't have that technology. Yeah, exactly. It's like it, it would be like throwing, um, it would be like throwing the, the sneakers on that, yeah. you know, that Julius Irving wore, you know, throwing them on LeBron James and saying, "Let's go watch you play basketball." Yeah. Have you, you got any, Yeah. Have you? I've got these clogs yeah. from from yeah. 1909. Can you give me some laces for exactly. them? Exactly. It's <laughs> no. It's, it's it's insane to think. Or Chuck Taylors, right? So yeah. yeah it's, it's it's insane to think of that. But uh, that's what I love about our sport. No other sport can do what we are doing. Uh, go dive into the history and watch the history repeat itself and this this is what you're watching now is the 1911 national 40 it's called uh the speedway roadster and again a two-man mobile so to speak uh and it's coming from your part of the world from indianapolis indiana and it's uh, the wheelbase 124 inches 56 inch gauge and just over three thousand pounds in weight and a three-speed transmitter, non-synchro and reverse. Carburetor, a Schiebler 2.4, two-inch bore, and brakes, 14-inch mechanical drum, rear only. Wow, yeah. Again, the wheels, wood artillery, and the tires, BF Goodrich. I mean, you can't tell me BF Goodrich produced these tires still. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've got, I've got this like 1911 National outside. Yeah. You haven't got, I've got, I think I've got a nail in one of the tires. You could, yeah. Do you have, the, do you have the mold still hanging around yeah. in the warehouse somewhere that you can bust off that tread pattern for me? I tell you what, you'd be there all day. The mechanics have stopped work. Yeah, and by the way, if you are coming to the event, definitely go down to the Ragtime Garage and, and have a look because they, the, the, the setup is beautiful. You feel like you are in the early 1900s down there. Everybody's dressed in period and the garage is all dressed the same. And very, very nice. Beautifully done. It truly is. I, I, I was blown away. I honestly thought the display... Uh, when I first saw the wrap around the, the hauler trailer that they had, the 53-foot trailer that they have there, 
Um, it almost looked like a, like a Firestone, um, like an old Firestone picture of Firestone tires, you know, that you see those old shots of, you know, Harvey Firestone and Louis Chevrolet and all of those. How'd you like the gear shift? Isn't that cool? On the outside. Yeah. Love it. So that, that car there, that's the 1911 Franklin Special. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly what the car looked like after it finished and completed the Cactus Derby in 1911. So it's a time capsule. Yeah. It's captured really as a time capsule when you look at that. When you get up closer, it looks like it's got bullet holes in the side of yeah, it. Yeah, I know. We went out. There's, a, there's a, a strange pedal. I asked you what it was, and I think it's the clutch, but it's between Who knows? the accelerator and the brake. Yeah. <laughs> it's not where you would not normally have your, your clutch situation. But, but Capture that, a 5.4 liter four-cylinder. <laughs> How big are those pistons? they got to be as big as, as our head. the house, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Franklin, of course, gone that, sadly. Yeah, they were out of Syracuse, New York. Again, wooden spokes and mechanical brakes. Checker flag is out for this session. And down you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of, yeah. Just kind of want to lean into it and just hope you get down there. That would be quite an experience. Look at that fuel tank on the back. And now we're talking about an era when no one had a car. <laughs> very, very few people. Adam's heading down to the paddock, the lucky man. We'll let him go and we'll continue to talk about these magnificent cars as they come into the pit and paddock. Still plenty more to come from today's racing. And this is only day one, remember, folks. And the RV's starting to fill up here, and the crowd will be in, I'm sure. That's a nice shot. Coming out of the sun haze. And there is the first winner of the Indy 500. And see the mirror? There it is, the first ever mirror used in a motor race. Raya Haroon, therefore not needing a passenger, lightening his load by some 70 pounds. And actually, I had a look at that car this morning. It's a replica, mind you. The actual original is in the museum at Indianapolis. But, uh, yep, the first winner of the Indy 500. And, uh, yeah, I, I was looking at the mirror and seeing how historic it was. And then just underneath, they've got the most modern GoPro. So it was quite a juxtaposition of, of technology. <laughs> But I said earlier, you know, uh, motor racing, what's it all about? Well, it's about innovation and it's about putting the innovations that racing creates that you eventually trickle down. So the mirror, that's where it started, right there on that car. And that's why you have your rear view mirror and your side mirrors now. I'd love to put that by the latest IMSA car with the digital mirrors and digital displays. Show how far technology's gone. What a beautiful day to see these. The Marmon Wasp. Yeah, not a lot to uh, stop you down that may. Yeah, it's, that, no, that's the mirror. Not a windshield. I've just been asked if that was the windshield. That's the mirror. That's the first original mirror. There it is. And I suppose it does act as a minor windshield. I guess that was the first windshield, too. Can you imagine that on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Wow. Brave men. Brave, brave men. 